telling us five seconds they were alive. Telling us through Ryan, who's got an earpiece. KJ Howe has an earpiece too. I don't. All right, I hear our producer, Jeff Bears. We are live. John Sanford's going to join us for the pregame show. Okay, we are live for the pregame show. John Sanford will be here momentarily. There he is. John hey, Sanford is here for the pregame show. John, I'm going to talk to you in a second. But first, well, we're all going to talk to you in a second. But first, what I want to do is set up the entire day ahead and tell people what they are about to see. Is that okay, John? That's fine with me. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hear you you good. Not only do we hear you, we're so excited that you're with us. Uh, so what you are watching here, streaming all over the internet, we're on uh, YouTube, we're on several Facebook pages. Uh, we're on Facebook pages of some of your favorite bookstores, which we thank you all for uh, live streaming with us. We'll name them all throughout the program, right, guys? One I'll name now, uh, Jason Russo, no, Russo Books, Russo Books, and my friend Jason Frost, who's a fan of a lot of the authors they'll be talking to. They're in Bakersfield Books. Their Facebook page is live streaming. So if you get tired of watching us on YouTube, go to their Facebook page. Go to the Simon & Schuster Facebook page. There are countless faces. Go to ITW Facebook page. All right, so... Here's the program that you're about to see. It's Night of a Thousand Authors. We have an unprecedented amount, 50 plus authors, six plus hours, ready to be interviewed. These are all big name bestsellers from the mystery, thriller, and suspense category. Uh, the people on the screen will be the ones who are bringing it to you. I'll introduce you to them one by one really quickly, and then we'll get to John Sanford because we have an important person here, and I do not want to keep him waiting. Okay, first, uh, hosting. Uh, his name, uh, he does not need an introduction, but should he have one, he's got plenty of names. Ryan the Rapologist, the real book spy. His name is Ryan Steck. Hello, Ryan. David, thank you for, uh, for having me for this. Oh, thank you for doing this, and you're doing it with your partner in crime, K.J. Howe, who's an author herself, Kimberly Howe. Uh, Kim, hello. Great to be with you tonight. It is uh, it's so exciting that this is happening. Now, Ryan and Kim, this is kind of a soft launch, but although it's a pretty <laughs> monumental launch of their uh, soon-to-be podcast, Thriller Talk. So uh, uh, subscribe to Thriller Talk on YouTube. They're about to drop episodes with Dean Koontz. They have an episode with CJ Box coming. Why couldn't you get those guys for this show? <laughs> we, have back. we have to. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then also, who will be pitching in for some interviews throughout the six hours, are two of the three amigos from the Crew Reviews podcast. The Crew Reviews podcast is one of the preeminent uh, podcasts on the internet. This is their second season. Uh, they were created at last year's Thriller Fest. Uh, one is uh, Sean Cameron. Hello, Sean. Hello. Thrilled to be here tonight. We are thrilled to have you. We're thrilled to be doing this. And Mike Outs. Hey, big honor. Thank you so much. Mike Outs is a uh, doctor. So if anything goes wrong on uh, the medical front, uh, Mike is here to help us out. Okay. <laughs> now, without further ado, this is the pregame show. We, this is the pregame show when we have John Sanford. Imagine what we're about to have in the six plus hours. John Sanford, uh, you are prolific. Welcome to the pregame show of Night of a Thousand Authors. How are you? I'm fine. You are, you are currently in Minnesota, yes. Oh, I'm currently in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You are in Santa Fe, New Mexico. All right. So uh, uh, tell me this, sir. First of all, have you ever been a part of anything like this before? I've done a few Zoom things with uh, the Poison Pen out, out in Scottsdale. But have you ever been, this is kind of like uh, Jerry Lewis, telethon, right? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Are you so, raising uh, money? We, we are not raising money, but we are raising awareness for all the great authors out there. Yeah. Uh, but we are, we are honored that you are uh, the first to pop up. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Hey, Ryan? John, big, big fan here. I know a lot of readers were uh, a little bummed out. There's no Virgil Flowers book uh, this fall. I'm told he is back with Lucas Davenport next year in Ocean Prey. Can you just give us a little tease about that? Yeah, I am just, uh, I just finished the first draft of Ocean Prey and, and Virgil takes up maybe almost half a book. Uh, so, so he has got large sections of the book to himself. It's a very complicated book I just finished. I don't know if I can do this. Can I? This is the book. 
It's on a music <laughs> sample. And, oh, and I, I copy it. I've got a tip <laughs> for all new writers, which is don't write something in pages and then import it into Word because they're not compatible anymore because those guys keep updating their software. So now every apostrophe is now attached to the wrong word. Oh. Every oh. final apostrophe. So if you have a possessive, it goes to the right word and you can't correct it. It drives you nuts trying to correct it. You got to write a new sentence. So there are only like a thousand of those in this manuscript. Maybe Good thing it's only a thousand of them. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Many times people use possessives and uh, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's driving me crazy. Oh. Hey, hey, John, would you hold that back up for a second? I was almost done with that first page. Then I'm going to ask you to turn the page. <laughs> There you go, right there. There's there a there. Sneak right peek. There. All right, thank you for the sneak peek. That's a it's a great opening. So John, as I get the pleasure of seeing John every year at Thriller Fest, and it's, it's always so much fun. And he's very um, caring with respect to nurturing newer authors. And I wonder, John, you know, you've, you're so prolific. You've written so many books. With with the start of each novel, how do you challenge yourself to stay interested and push yourself to a you know even higher level? Well, you know. Uh, the fact is that it's getting harder and uh, because I've now done more than 50 of them. But, but the thing is, is that uh, I think that a lot of new authors, one of their problems is, is that they, is that they think they've got to come up with something incredibly unique, uh, incredibly different, incredibly clever. And really all you have to do is read the newspaper. Just, you know, you, you just pick something up and you start and, and, and you write it. Uh, there's a new uh, book out by the, uh, by the by, the guy who runs the band Wilco. It's called How to Write One Song, and it's sort of a bestseller, I guess. I just started reading it, and um, uh, it's a really a good book for writers because one of his points is you just start, and 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 then and then you just work, and that's what I do. I mean, you know, I'll be kind of mulling things over because I know I'm going to write another book, so I'll mull them over, and uh, I'll think of stuff, and then you don't try to get it all done in one day. And then you'll mull it over the next day. And eventually you have enough stuff to start. And then when you're actually in the process of writing, more stuff just kind of falls into your head. So, so for me, there isn't any big, uh, there, there isn't any big emotional, tough walk to try to find something that's better than Shakespeare. It's work. And, and that's, uh, that's the point that the Wilco guys makes, is work. And, and uh, I think if more new writers committed themselves to work, they find it's not as hard as I think it's going to be. John, I, I love Virgil Flowers as well, but Lucas is to me one of the great characters of popular fiction. And, and the reason for I feel that way is because his evolution as a man and as a character is extremely authentic. It's, it's, it's exactly how I would expect a man to grow over that period of time. But I'm wondering, does his growth parallel yours or are you and Lucas just so far off as far as in your... Uh, your belief system that it really doesn't have any impact. Um, he's sort of parallel to me in some ways, but in others not because he's a cop. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I covered cops for a long time as a newspaper reporter. I mean, I was a general assignment reporter for most of my newspaper career, which was lasted for twenty five years. I knew a lot of, and and that meant that I did a little bit of everything. But some of that I did a lot of was cops, and cops and reporters are very different. They tend to come from the same social group, but, but, but they're very different. Uh, I think that reporters are a little bit further out there. Cops tend to be very kind of constrained in a lot of ways. Uh, people who say that cops and criminals are similar are very wrong. Cops are very tight. Uh, they, they've got all the insurance they could possibly buy. Uh, you know, they're, 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 they're tight guys. Uh, so Davenport is a lot different than I am. He's a lot harsher for one thing. And um, I've, you know, with this, election going on and Trump and some of the things that Trump has said and some of the things that the people opposing him have said, uh, especially in the discussion about cops, uh, I find that I'm kind of standing aside from all of that because the understanding of most people about cops is very different than mine. Uh, most cops are very human. Uh, most cops are very frightened of some of the things that happen to them on the street. They're scared a lot of the time. Um, and, and that's very different uh, from say, like a reporter's observer platform. So, so Davenport's different than me, but I've known enough cops that I can piece him together. And, and uh, I think that Michael Connolly uh, 
probably has the most cop-like cop in popular fiction right now. And I think that uh, Lee Child probably has kind of a, a popular, a really good popular fiction, has probably got the least, most fantasy-like character in, in Reacher. Uh, I'm someplace in between there. I'm like halfway between. My Davenport doesn't do paperwork, uh, you know, but, but uh, Connolly's characters have to do paperwork and they have to go in at night and they have to work in their office and all that kind of stuff. Davenport doesn't do that. But Reacher doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a house, you know. He doesn't have any. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have anything, and and so so uh, so so there's like a range of things in there, and and uh, I kind of lost track of what I was talking about. <laughs> but, but 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 Lucas doesn't really parallel me, but I can kind of see him from where I am. Hey, uh, John, uh, great to talk to a fellow Cedar Rapids, Iowa boy. Um, <laughs> What's going on? Uh, you know, I was born at Memorial Hospital, but we took off by the time I was in grade school. Um, okay. qu question for you. Um, the motivations for writing that very first novel as a younger man and, and now what's, what, what's driving you now in terms of your motivations versus what drove you and, and you were trying to achieve in that very first novel? Well, you know, uh, uh, honestly, uh, one of the big motivators for me was money. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm not joking about that. And I think that can be important because I was, I mean, two years before I really started pressing on this novel, I want a Pulitzer for journalism. So I've got the Pulitzer and I'm still thinking of leaving journalism because I had two kids ready to go to college and my wife at the time uh, also wanted to go back to school. And so I was looking at, you know, $60,000 worth of, of cost on a $60,000 salary. Uh, you know, it just wasn't gonna fit. So money was important, but I've always been interested in writing fiction. Actually, my first book, first two books that I wrote and published uh, were not fiction, they were nonfiction. And uh, one of them was on plastic surgery and the other one was on an artist. Um, but I always wanted to write fiction, right from, right from the time that I was in, in high school. So, and, and, and so, you know, I, I didn't publish the first book I wrote either. It's, it's a very embarrassing book. Uh, it's called The Chip Wazoo. Uh, my son still has a copy of it around someplace that he takes out and laughs at every once in a while. Uh, my agent was horrified. And, uh, and, uh, and, and she had a rather harsh little talk with me about what I could do and what I couldn't do. Uh, and what I couldn't do, she said, was you can't take a socially aware novel that deals with the problems of the American public and write them as a thriller. Because the, the problem with that is, is that uh, the people who want thrills are bored by the social part and the social people are appalled by the thriller part. And so everybody hates the book. Uh, you either got, you got to decide what you want to do. And, and you can put social commentary, which I do sometimes, you know, I have troubled criminals and that kind of stuff. But, but you can't get into heavy kind of social commentary in a thriller. It just doesn't work very well. Right. You have it in writing somewhere where that book will never be published because a lot can happen after, you know. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what. Uh, if I published that book, I'd be into my career. People, <laughs> I, I'd, be, I'd be stoned in the streets. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's really a bad book. It's a bad, <laughs> if you have any question about that, you can call up my son and ask him. <laughs> Next time we're going to have your son on, we're going to ask him about it. John. Thank yeah. you so much for being here and warming up with us. I'm told Jan Ivanovich is in the building. So we're going to go ahead and get our show started. And All right. uh, this is exciting. Off, this is thank exciting. you so much for coming on. Say hello to Janet for me. I love her books. And thank you a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, John. Uh, so the show is about to begin. Uh, the pregame show is about to end. I'll be back at the end to clean things up or, or wrap things up, depending on how the proceeding happens. But we're all excited for John. I'm going to take uh, Sean and Mike away with me. I'm going to go watch this on any of the many places where it is available to watch. I am as excited as everybody else for this program. Knock them dead, Ryan and KJ Howe and Sean Cameron and Mike Houts. Uh, can't wait to see Janet. Uh, Might of a Thousand Authors begins soon. Go get them, girl, guys. Not for nothing, but David is our emergency host. So if you do see him before the end, something went terribly wrong between now and then. So this is Night of a Thousand Authors with Kim. Janet Ivanovich is coming in uh, right now. Janet, hi, how are you? Hi there, I'm great. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you for coming on. Uh, first and foremost, happy pub day. New books out uh, today. 
Stephanie Plum, number 27. Uh, can you tell readers a little bit about it? Um, yeah, it's basically an adventure story. You know, it's about Stephanie and the gang again. Uh, there's a lot of ranger in this one. I thought he was do some real quality time with Stephanie. And um, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of Grandma Mazer. She's in big trouble. Uh, they think she has a treasure and they're out to get her. And Stephanie has to uh, protect her. So it's fun. And I'm excited. It's, it's pub day. Yay. <laughs> Congratulations, Janet. Lovely to have you with us. Um, is there a story behind your backdrop? It's absolutely stunning and really interesting. Yes. Do you like that? It's all, all of the authors. Uh, actually, my, my daughter does that for me. She's my, my techie. I'm, I'm nothing without Alex, without my daughter. I, I can't do anything. I can, I can barely type. So it looks great. It's a great, and it's a great teaser for tonight, uh, by the way. Pretty much everyone you see there is coming on at some point between now and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Absolutely. Yeah. So Janet, I didn't find myself there, though. I don't know where I am. <laughs> we have you front and center. I mean, that was the whole point of this. We wanted to kick off with, with, with you. Um, uh, thank you again for, for being here. I know, Janet, you are a big comic book fan. What titles hold your interest and why? Um, well, I'm, I'm really a big Uncle Scrooge fan. I, I still get uh, Uncle Scrooge comic books. I have ever since I was a kid. And I think that's the reason why I'm a writer, why I write basically adventure stories, because um, Scrooge and his nephews, you know, Huey, Dewey and Louie and Donald, they were always going on adventures. They were going to the Yukon and the moon and everything. And um, when I was a kid, I was not a big reader. I was... Um, I read the Black Stallion series and I read Uncle Scrooge and that that was about it. And so I haven't progressed much from there. Well, Jen, I'm a longtime fan of your books and humor is very hard to write, especially in suspense. Do you believe that people are born with a voice or do they hone one? And do you feel like your voice has changed over the years? Um, I don't know if my voice has changed over the years. I think you know, I started out writing romance and it took me a while to find my voice, but um, I'm not sure if it's changed a lot. It, it changes a little bit with each new project. Um, you know, when I'm doing a co-author book or when I'm on vacation from Stephanie and I'm in the head of some other new woman, um, probably it changes, but uh, for the most part. And, you know, the humor for me, that, that's the easy part. I have a hard time with the serious part. I, I have a hard time with the mechanics of it and the plot line. I, I actually really suck at plot, which probably most of my readers know about, but I think I'm pretty good at character. And, uh, and, I, and I think you know humor is important these days because uh, there's a lot to be depressed about sometimes. So uh, I try to do my share. For the record, I would think most of your readers do not think that you suck at plot. Um, I, I think they would be shocked to hear that. Uh, no, listen, I, it, you're one of the most beloved writers. My wife, Melissa, you are her favorite author. As, as you know, uh, she's watching to see you kick this off. Uh, just got the book today. You reference that you are writing so many different things. You are in so many different uh, characters' heads. How do you keep that straight? Um, I, well, I don't actually. I, I, can, I can only do one thing at a time. And so um, when I finish a book, I, I like dump it. You know, it's like it's gone. It's not, it's not in my head anymore. And people want, it, want me to talk about the book and they ask about the characters and I can't remember anybody's names. Uh, and I just, you know, I go into the new project and the new book and, um, you know, and, and then I'm, I'm there. You know, like Joe Morelli in the Stephanie Plum series, he had a scar on his eyebrow and I, I kept moving the scar around and I, you know, I never, I never realized it, but my fans uh, caught on and they, you know, they would write in and say, you know, how come it's on his left eyebrow in this book? And so. And so do you have a Bible or a way of keeping track of these details? Yeah, I keep a, I keep a steno pad for every book and I have a list of characters and where they live and what they look like and uh, basic personality traits. I, um, I have a very sketchy kind of outline. When I go to bed at night, I go to bed with my steno pad and I kind of uh, think about where I'm gonna go for the next couple of days. And um, so, you know, that is kind of my Bible. And, and I have these steno pads for, you know, like a hundred years worth of books now. I have a big stack of steno pads. Jane, out of all those things that you have written, is 
was, is there any book like that stands out in your mind that was especially hard to write? Um, I don't know if one stands out as being hard to write. Some were more fun than others. Um, I did a series with Diesel uh, and a group of characters that I called Unmentionables. And that was always fun. That was um, always the most fun for me to write. I like writing Stephanie because I like the characters and it's like, you know, coming home. I'm doing a, a book right now about a new character, Gabrielle Rose. Um, and I'm finding it actually pretty difficult because it's very global. Most of my books are local books um, and they, they're about sort of small heroes. And this book takes place um, it's a huge adventure story. And right now I'm in Peru. And since I've never been to Peru, I'm doing a lot of research. And, uh, you know, it makes it a little bit more complicated. Well, speaking of traveling and research, we're going to bring in a guy who knows a lot about traveling and research. I'm told Brad Thor is ready to come in as well, which you can see picture right behind Janet. Uh Up towards the bar. But I brought this with me. I'm loving it. I'm halfway through. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, how does it feel? You two are doing an event together soon too. We yeah. are. Is it tomorrow or Thursday, I think? Is it Thursday? What do I know? Yeah. It, it's one of the next two days. I'm gonna post it all over social, but I've been loving it. So congratulations on your uh, pub day. I'm halfway, halfway through. Thanks, you, get, you have all your questions ready for me? You're, you're my moderator. You know what? I took questions from fans. And you have some diehard fans, Janet. People love you. They said not only is she one of the nicest authors they've ever met, but they love how you write your characters. And I'm I'm actually stunned with the, the depth of knowledge on firearms and martial arts. And you must be an expert researcher. Uh, you know, I did a lot of research when I started the series, and I haven't done an awful lot lately. So, you know, be careful how, how much you believe what I write. <laughs> it may or may not be true. But you do develop kind of a base, don't you? That uh, if you're using the same firearms, uh, Glock doesn't necessarily change from year to year and investigative techniques and skip tracing and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that, and that's true. And, but, you know, mostly my books are um, about character and the evolution of the character and the little romance in it and, um, and family, you know, community, that kind of stuff. Um, and so, um, but, I, but I think, you know, the, the firepower adds something to it. It's, uh, <laughs> she is a bounty hunter. So, and yeah. in the beginning, I hung out with a bunch of bounty hunters and with a bunch of bail bondsmen and a bunch of cops. So I still have that, uh, you know, kind of sort of behind me. The bail bondsmen are an inter, bail bondsmen and women are interesting folks, aren't they? Yeah, I was really surprised when I first started going around with them that they're actually pretty normal, you know, and a lot of these, they're, they're little mom and pop agencies, they're family, um, you know, run. And, um, but, you know, they do have these skills that they're, they're not all dog the bounty hunter. I, I didn't, I never met any that wore black leather and <laughs> had long blonde hair. Others. And, <laughs> and they, you know, they didn't necessarily go break down doors at two in the morning. They yeah. kind of, you know, sidled up to people and said, you know, hi, are you Jim Brown? And he'd say, yeah, and they'd clap the cuffs on him and that would be the end of that. You know what I dealt with for my novel, Act of War, I wanted to have a bail bondsman uh, subplot in it. And I reached out to one of the big ones here in Nashville and they could not have been nicer folks. They're like, what do you need? We'll tell you everything. Come on down. I mean, just super, super people. I really enjoyed that, that part of researching my book. Yeah, I found that to be true as well. Um, they were very generous um, with their knowledge and their time and um, you know, just uh, nice, nice people to be with. Although, uh, when I was doing the research, there's one lady in Texas that was known for, you know, really going after the guys. And she was in an airport one time, and she saw a skip walk by, and actually tackled him. And I, I think she was like in her seventies, you know, or something. Oh my like god! That. Yeah. Well, Jana, wow. we have to keep uh, keep the show moving. Thank you so much for for kicking things off for us and for being here on Pub Day. Um, everyone else, make sure you run out. Get the new book in stores today. Brad's got it too. Janet, thanks for being here. Thank you. It's been fun, guys. I know. Now, Brad, you mentioned that um, that Janet's got a lot of you know intense fans. Uh, you certainly do as well. Uh, you and I spoke, God, last uh, over the summer, this past summer, yeah. when uh, mm -hmm. when when Near Dark came out. I've got that one too. 
Uh, ah, this is Brad Glass got hard math book, just phenomenal. I don't know how you do it. You get better every year. It's just, it's not fair. <laughs> um, you just get better every time. So we talked you know, when this one came out and you said, you know, you're kicking around all these different, um, different ideas for different books and whatnot. Your fans want to know, is Scott Harvath coming back in 2021? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm very deep into it now. So he is back big time. That's awesome and, news. I think a lot of people are going to be thrilled with that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And Brad, also, I'm a huge fan, and I love the fact that you feature strong women front and center in Athena Project and in Near Dark. Um, what kind of research do you do uh, with women on the cutting edge of conflict? I'm really intrigued by this. It's a great question, and thank you. It's a very nice compliment, and one I take to heart, because women are never uh, sex objects or set dressing in my novels. I'm, I'm surrounded by brilliant, very talented women. Uh, my editor, my agent, my wife, all of these people around me are incredible. And I have a daughter and I want to create characters that my daughter can aspire to as she becomes, uh, she's a young adult now, but as she, she gets older. And there are a lot of women out there that are doing some of this nation's most dangerous business. So uh, what you find is, is that they tend to be the ones that are really out there uh, handling the, the most troublesome conflicts are very aggressive and very competitive, just like their male counterparts. So uh, Delta, when I did the Athena Project, I talked about how Delta Force in real life had been haunting high-end female athletic events uh, or high-end athletic events where there were female participants, female competitors. So like uh, an Ironman kind of triathlon situation, things like that. So I know some really, really intense uh, female athletes, uh, whether that's Ronda Rousey or I've got... Uh, I've got an old friend from high school that is a big martial, another martial artist and uh, some people that do triathlons, some women I know who do triathlons. So when I mix those in with people at the FBI or the CIA or doing things in the military, you look for certain components that they have in common and they have a lot of things in common with the men. So there's that kind of graveyard sense of humor, uh, you know, even in the midst of danger, they're cracking jokes and all this kind of stuff. And it's a uh, just like the men, uh, they're human beings. They, uh, they get they get scared. That old line that courage is holding out one second longer than fear. But they really demand a lot from themselves. They demand excellence. And so that's something I can relate to, even though these are women and I'm a man. I appreciate that perfectionism and that commitment to a goal, to see it through no matter what. And they leave it all on the field, just like their male counterparts do. So uh, it actually isn't as hard to write those characters as one might think, because I'm so enamored of those qualities and those characteristics. Uh, so the same things I see in the SEALs and the Delta Force, uh, the, the men there, I also find in the female characters uh, or the real life people that my female characters are based on. Well, and I just wanted to say too, like I did a lot of research into female snipers and in the Battle of Stalingrad, there were many very effective snipers that were female and they made all the difference in that battle. So it, it's a, it goes back in history. Yeah, and there's also some things that, that men and women are equal, but they are different. So there are different skill sets that women can bring than men can't necessarily bring. And one of the areas that I always thought was funny, and I got told this by female spies, is that when you put a beautiful woman next to a man, the blood supply instantly drops from his brain. It goes south of his belt buckle. Uh, all guys, if they see a beautiful woman, woman very few of them uh, can actually not think sexual thoughts and things like this. And so there's a lot of stuff that women can turn to their advantage and they do, and I'm glad. I want our female spies not necessarily sleeping with guys, but if they can flirt with a guy and the guy's willing to give up a piece of information that's helpful to us or reveal something they shouldn't, uh, I, I'm all for it. I think that kind of stuff is terrific. Uh, Brad, I'm told we have the other Brad ready to join us too. Brad Meltzer is gonna come on in. Hey, nice. um, now as we do that, I wanna ask you, so, Near Dark was number 19, right? That was number 19 in the Harvath series. Correct. Brad Meltzer, hey, thanks for coming on in. How you doing, Brad? This is the brother Brad. I love the brother, the two Brads in one spot. That makes me very happy. Very Brad, nice. Yeah. Look, look at this. Look at all the books behind this guy. I was going to say, I just need to know, your books are super fancy, I'm noticing. My books are all ones I've written. The narcissist, do only, you only sit in front of shelves that you've written. Yeah, you know what? If I tilted this, you'd be able to see more of my books, like my foreign editions. Uh, so I, like, see, I like, see, this is just for show. I like that you have a display even when no one's around. 
these are my these are my leather bound books next to the fireplace in my office. These were, you know, I was a reader before I ever became a writer and I continue to be a reader. I don't think you could be a halfway decent writer without being a voracious reader. So I love to read. I loved collecting these. Um, when I got my first number one, I had it leather bound. I had a set of them leather bound to give to my agent, my editor, I gave one to Glenn Beck as a thank you for all his help. So I've always liked the look of Oh, oh, I have one leather bound. I have one leather bound book that I made of my own. And it's the book that never sold 24 rejection letters still has never sold to this day. But it is leather bound behind me. Wow. <laughs> and there, were literally, so Brad, there, were, there were 20 publishers, I got 24 rejection letters on the book. There's stories like that out there. I, I think of uh, how long was it? Was it Zemeckis that had uh, Back to the Future? and how long that screenplay kicked around, how long John Wick kicked around before it got made. Uh, the entertainment industry is full of stories like that. I think MASH was another one. The book that the TV series uh. was based on got rejected a ton. So did uh, Richard Bach's first book, which I believe was Jonathan, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And that got rejected a kajillion times. I had a list of famous books when I started as an author and how many times they got rejected. So yeah, as I was looking for an agent- that. You yeah. need it. That's the only way to, in, in this industry, for me, that, I, I love the fact that the book that no one will ever see is the only one I've had leather bound. Like that is, I'm like, that's the only one I care about is like, cause you know why? Cause it reminds me every day, like stay humble. I yeah. never want to ever forget that book. I, and I always want to have the hunger I had when I was 24 years old thinking I could do this. I never ever want to think I made it. Cause if I think mm -hmm. I made it, I'm finished. Um, so that to me is, that's my one thing I allow myself is that one now, one thing for that book that, that never lived. Oh, the, that's, background, that's the background game is strong, by the way. I just want to say, Janet had uh, a photo of all the authors joining us tonight, and then you guys each came in and crushed it, too. Uh, we got we got to keep it going, Brad Thor. I'm so sorry. We got to, we got to keep things moving. I got to go uh, vote, so I'm out. The fake, go. Oh, yes, go do right. that. That's good, good, good seeing you, Brad. Uh, good seeing you, Brad. And Kimberly Bye. and Ryan, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it, man. My pleasure. So Brad Meltzer, how you doing? I'm good, brother Ryan. How are you? All good, man. Uh, let me ask you. So you you have so much going on. Um, you you have kid shows, kid books, adult books. Um, you are like uh, the favorite author in my house. I love your stuff. My kids love your stuff. The I am books. My son Ryan Jr. As you know, is a huge fan, especially love. the TV show. How do you keep everything straight with all that you have going on? Um, you know, I truly believe, and you know me well enough and long enough to know this, um, that if you love something, you make time for it. And some stories I, I love, the one thing I write is I just love a good story. And sometimes that story is a fictional thriller. And sometimes that story is a nonfiction thing, like the secret plot to kill Abraham Lincoln or the secret plot to kill George Washington that we did. Sometimes it's the best story is a kid's book for my kids. Sometimes that story is like, you know what? That's going to be better on television. Let's go to the History Channel and talk to them. And sometimes it's a cartoon show like we're doing on PBS um, with Xavier Riddle. But to me, I, I, I guess I could say, oh, my gosh, writing for children is so different than writing for adults. But it's not. Um, to me, I, yes, I use different vocabulary. Metaphors, you know, go down in a kid's book. But you still got to tell a good story. You still need a character and someone that people care about. And when I fall in love with it, I can't not do it. So I just wind up jumping genres all over. Well, you're one of the few writers, I think, so, that so, like parents can share with their children. You know, we can all, we can both be fans of. And I think that's really, there's not a lot of them out there. You know, no, that that's is like, the, you know, it, I love you for it. And listen, you've sent me pictures uh, of your son reading the Ordinary People Change the World books. And that's the gift I never thought I was giving to myself. But to watch... I have families who come to book signings when book signings were still around, but even now they'll see it on Zoom and they'll say, you know, my husband reads your nonfiction books. Um, I read your thrillers. My son and, or daughter reads your kids' books. And we, and we watch the TV show together as a family. And I'm like, that's never, I wish, you know, people are like, how'd you plan a lot? I'm like, there's no plan at all. There's no planning. It just, we were lucky enough that our readers are so kind and so loyal and so generous with their time that they share it. And, um, it's just been one of those things we never planned on happening, but we're just so thankful that it does happen for sure. So Brad, I, I first met you at the very first Thriller Fest in Phoenix. I remember in Arizona. And it was super fun. And there was an auction and I ended up buying the basket that David Morrell donated and Steve Barry. And you were such a gentleman. I don't know if you remember this, but you helped me carry those baskets back to where I needed to take them. 
Oh, and I don't remember that that was you. I remember carrying something, but I didn't know, oh, that was you. I'm glad I wasn't a jerk that day. I'm usually a horrible person. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just like always remember you as a true gentleman. Um, I love the fact that you interact with your fans so well, the Invisible Army. Do you have a, a favorite fan story you can share with uh, everyone today? Ooh, favorite fan story. Um, I'll give you a couple. There's so many that come to mind. So we are, uh, people have done the night. Oh, I have two. Okay. So one, I don't know if I have it behind me. Someone actually um, took one of our books and hollowed it out and got married and put their ring in it. I don't know how they met or something to do with the book, but that was a to be part of someone's wedding. The best one though, is this one. Um, a woman writes to me a year and a half ago. And she says, I just want you to know that your book, I am Albert Einstein, that you wrote for kids uh, was the last book I got to read with my son. He loved the book and he passed away. I'm like, oh my God, what a, you know, the horror of all horrors. So I look up the woman's, she said, but I want to thank you because that's the last great moment I had with my child. So I look up the woman's story. I tracked down her principal in the school where her son lived. He surely did die. And, and we knew she was going back to read I am Robert Einstein to the class. So of course we surprised, we got books sent for the kids and the principal came in, we had this great thing. And, and I thought that was it. You know, we just did something nice for this woman showed her really another son wouldn't be forgotten. And she writes me back uh, about uh, almost a year ago. And she says, I want you to know I got pregnant and we just had the baby and we named the baby after our hero. So two of our heroes. Um, so I want you to meet brand new baby Finn named after the character in Star Wars, but meet Finn Bradley. And my mouth just drops open. And, you know, you, we, all of us, everyone you're listening to today, like we're in the business of, again, telling stories and taking people hopefully to, you know, amazing places where good can beat evil and things can happen. You can get that kind of depth of the human soul. But in my wildest dreams, I never think that anything I'm going to work on is going to be responsible that this, someone's going to name her child after me. You know, I mean, that's just the, these books have been a gift I didn't realize I was giving myself. So that, that just kind of took every fan experience and brought it over the top, but our, our readers are the best. They will literally go across the country in every airport and take our books and put them to the top shelf when they're like spying out or like, they'd be like, I saw you at a bad spot in this store. So we moved you to the top. I'm like, that's alphabetical. You can't do that. You know, and they're just like, but they're so nice and so incredible for 20 plus years now. That is a great story, Brad. I mean, seriously. And I, I have a, my youngest son's name is Mitchell. You'll never guess who he's named. I named know. Right? I know right? the story. Uh, Come on. <laughs> <laughs> my, my baby American assassin who acts the part very well. Ruth Ware is here. She's going to join us now as well. We're bringing Ruth Ware in. Um, but Brad, as we do, uh, what what's your next project? What's the next book that, that people can buy from you? So we just came out literally last week with I do this right. Uh, I am Benjamin Franklin and I am Anne Frank. Those are the new ones. Then we have, I don't even think I've shown you this, Ryan. Um, I actually brought, because I just got the copy. I literally just got the copy. We're doing the paperback uh, 10 years later. They, if you think people wait for paperback, 10 years later, we're doing the 10 greatest conspiracies of all time um, from our decoded TV show. And for God knows what reason they decided, you know what, people have waited 10 years. Now it should be out in paperback. So that's the new one. And then working on the, the, the really most important thing, you know, my favorite thriller I've done is The Escape Artist. And the next one, the next book that will be out will be the sequel to The Escape Artist where, where Nola and Zig are coming back. So the number one New York Times bestselling book, uh, The Escape Artist. Ruth Ware, thank yes. you. Hi, Ruth. hello. How are you? So pleased to be here. Yeah, hey, really Ruth. well. Hi, Brad. How are you? Good to see you. I love your background with all your I was going to say, see, authors are so good. Like Ruth is exactly set up. She has her amazing books right behind her. And I said, that's how you can tell the authors is we know how to self-promote. <laughs> well now I feel like I need more books I feel like my books are. I didn't even write these I just put them up here and pretend I just put my pasted my name on the bottom of them <laughs> I want a wall of books now I'm not going to rest until I've got an entire background completely composed of my books well have fun with these guys about my, my backdrop seeing all, all these authors come on that are just crushing it with with their backgrounds it's, it's been fantastic you know Yours is beautiful, though. Your sunset is lovely. It's very calming, which is what we all need. <laughs> we well, all need which is good because we, we have 50, 10 minute interviews pretty much back to back. So that that calming sunset is probably needed right now. Brad, we got to keep it going. Uh, love we you. Go, but good thank seeing you so all. Much Ruth, great. KJ, so good seeing you. Thank you all. And love you to everyone out there. Stay safe today and go vote, vote, vote. <laughs> thank you, Brad. There, Brad. So Ruth, so thank Ruth, you for, uh, for coming on. 
Oh, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's lovely. We have a wonderful friend in common, Peter James, and uh, he's such a great guy and thanks a lot for joining us. Um, I was just amazed in the Lion game, how well you portrayed boarding school, because I actually attended three of them. Did and you? Well, I haven't attended any, so I should have interviewed you before I wrote the book. <laughs> Not at all, right? This is great. But I just wondered if you could kind of share with us the kind of research you did to make that happen. Well, I, I have never attended boarding school, obviously. Um, and I think I was the kind of person who I grew up reading boarding school books, you know, Enid Blyton and all those kind of children's books that made boarding school seem like this wonderful place and for I think from fairly early on I had this inkling that although I loved the idea of boarding school I was actually probably the kind of kid who would have completely sunk in a boarding school environment you know like lots of writers I'm quite an introvert I need a lot of my own space I don't want to be with people 24-7 um, you know, I love going out and meeting friends and stuff, but I, I need that kind of decompression period. Um, and the thought of being kind of locked up with the girls that I was at school with 24-7 was just, the older I got, the more I realised that I, I would have actually hated it in real life. Um, and then I met, you know, lots of people who actually had gone to boarding school. Um, and they all, they all had such different responses to it. And it seemed to really vary between people who'd gone by choice, often um, when they're a bit older in their teens who had absolutely loved it. And, you know, it was just, because it's what you want to do at that age, isn't it? You just, you know, you just want to escape your parents and spend all your time with your friends. And so an institute where that can happen is just perfect. Um, and then there was another group of people who had, often been sent much younger and who hadn't wanted to do it for whom it had clearly been a completely traumatic experience um and I was just yeah I was just fascinated by the whole thing and by trying to put myself in the shoes of what I what what kind of boarding school student would I have been like if I had been unleashed on institutional education at that age <laughs> well Ruth your new book one by one fantastic by the way uh david baldacci called you the agatha christie of our generation riley sager said it's diabolically clever i want to ask you what is your writing process like are you an outliner are you sort of like a like a pantser do you know the twists and turns especially for this one do you know that ahead of time or does it come to you as you're writing i'm kind of half and half i would say um i always say i don't plot but i think i i do plot more than i admit to myself um, I don't write anything down. That part is completely true. I, I keep it all in my head. I will very, very occasionally have like a paragraph of notes at the end of my manuscript where it will say, you know, important dates or facts that I have to remember or something that I know I want to tackle in the next scene. But by and large, I know the ending for my books. I almost always know who did it and how, because I think for a thriller writer, that's really important. You know, you need to give the readers a chance to guess the solution to the mystery. And you can only do that if you have all of the breadcrumbs in your pocket at the beginning and you can kind of scatter them for your readers. Um, so I, I do know that and I try to be really scrupulously fair with all my readers in terms of kind of, you know, dropping the right clues and making things clear up front. But beyond that, I don't know every twist and turn. Um, I think if I did, I would probably get quite bored. Um, but I did a ton of research for One by One. Um, not on the skiing side of it. For anybody who hasn't read it, it's about a corporate retreat um, set in a ski resort. Um, and I already skied, so that part was easy. I had multiple years of skiing holidays to draw on. I'm not a great skier, but I'm a, you know, I'm a competent skier. I can get from one end of a mountain to another. Um, but the company in question is a tech company, a startup. And that was a world that I just knew nothing about. Um, so I had to do, I read a bunch of books, listened to loads of podcasts, read lots of articles, listened to various news articles. Um, and that was brilliant because research for me anyway, it, it throws up these kind of gems of plot lines or questions or things that you would never have thought about as an outsider to the situation. 
Um, and yeah, that that for me is the joy of research. And there were lots of kind of little nuggets that found their way into the plot, which I yeah, I would I would just never have come across otherwise. Well, you mentioned that you uh, you you were already a skier. I I'm definitely not. I'm more of a fall down the, the mountainside uh, with the ski. Oh, I hope I did. I put you off. <laughs> oh, I, well, no, I wish I could do it. Um, I wish I could. Let's see if our, if our next guest we uh, we have. The great Lisa Jewell ready to join us as well. She's going to be coming in in just a second. As she does, uh, Ruth, do you feel pressure to top yourself with each new book? Um, I did at first when I wrote, um, hi Lisa, when hi, I wrote my first book um, in Adult Dark Wood, it did quite well from the outset. And then when I was writing the follow-up, The Woman in Cabin 10, I felt huge pressure to kind of prove that. I guess like that I wasn't a one trick pony. I wanted to show everybody that I could write another book that was just as exciting and just as thrilling and just as interesting. Um, and I put a huge amount of pressure on myself with that book. But I think since then I've kind of, I've relaxed a little bit. I've learned to trust myself and my readers. I've learned that you can take a breath in between stuff happening and people will stick with you for that. So yeah, I've taken a little bit of the pressure off myself since then. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Ruth, thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. And a pleasure to see you again and keep up the amazing work. Really oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I wish I could hang around and listen to Lisa's talk, but I'm going to go off and watch the YouTube. Now and yeah, we are live everywhere. So, so you can catch us. Speaking of which, uh, we want to say hi to Lisa. Well, real quick, we want to say we are streaming all over YouTube, Facebook, rainydaybooks.com. We want to thank Village Square Books in Bellow Falls, uh, Vermont. We're going to try to uh, thank some of our broadcast partners throughout the show. Lisa, thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you for inviting me. This is all very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> it's big night big night absolutely we had the pleasure of doing a, a very in-depth interview with lisa so on thriller talks if you subscribe we're going to be dropping that one with, within the next couple of weeks and um lisa i wanted to ask you uh your background as an illustrator i feel like gives you um a real visual sense and i see that in your prose do you think that artistic background has an impact on your writing um I, I have never been asked that question before. I'm slightly thrown, actually. It's never even occurred to me, but I suspect it probably does. Absolutely. I think you don't have to be creative to write a, a colourful book um, that, that jumps off the page with imagery, but I don't think it does any harm. And that's certainly the way my mind works. Um, I'm more of a sort of broad strokes kind of writer, so I don't want to spend too long setting up a scene or describing a room. But I know exactly, I think, what tiny flashes of colour and, and, and lines to put in just to bring the thing to life. So, yes, thank you for asking me a question I've never been asked before. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you a question I know you were asked before because we talked yeah. about it uh, when we interviewed you before. But, uh, Lisa, you've written you're, so many things. Your writing has evolved and changed a great deal over the course of your career. Were you ever worried that your your readers or your publisher might not follow you to where you wanted to go next? Oh, 100%, uh, very, very much so, which is why I've done it so, so slowly, which is why I never sat in front of an agent or an editor and said, I wanna start writing completely different books. I've just sort of sat very quietly in a room by myself and just very, very gently sort of tweaked things and pushed things to see how much I could get away with book by book and every time I've delivered a book that's got a little bit more darkness a little bit less relationship um I have that sort of terrible fear that this is going to be the one where, it's, where everyone's going to run 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 out the room with their hands in the air screaming what have you done what have you done uh so I've always been nervous about that and that's what's so great about being at this point in my career where I'm no longer mm -hmm. moving between genres where I've found a genre and I'm in it and now I don't need to worry I don't I don't need to worry about losing readers or upsetting my my publishers just keep doing what I'm doing they seem quite happy and so in your varied and, and you know incredible prolific career um what is the moment you feel most proud of oh gosh that's another really good question I I suppose there, there are creative moments of pride and then there are commercial moments of pride and they're two different things 
Um, I think the book I felt proudest of writing was probably The Truth About Melody Brown, which has not been published in the UK or Canada yet, which comes out in January. I wrote it 10 years ago, but it didn't get published over there. Um, and that was my first, sounds ridiculous, my first grown up book where there was no love story, where it was just all mystery um, and suspense. And it was all told from one person's point of view. It's the only book I've ever written that's only told from one person's point of view. And it was it was quite a brave leap for me to do that, to leave the relationships behind at that point. So and it and I sorry to say this, but I think it's a jolly good book also. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so as, uh, pr uh, creatively, that was the one I was proudest of. I think commercially it has to be Then She Was Gone, which was a book that took me certainly in the US and Canada from a mid-list author to a, a, a much further up the, up the ladder very quickly and brought me a whole new raft of, of readers which is just a gift for any writer at any point in your career to get new readers is always the best thing um then she was gone has brought me so many new readers and they're all wonderful so very grateful for that and very proud also well at least i think last time we talked to you you were doing so many virtual events this this whole no virtual tour because of covid i think you were like in a hotel room or something i mean there were Correct. so many that you had set up how did the virtual tour go uh are you adapting to that you know i mean now that the, the covid thing i think it's here to stay or at least partially here to stay right yeah. yeah um and certainly i think this style of doing things is probably here to stay long after covid goes um, because it works in so many ways. I mean, I'm not saying it's all positive. I think there are definitely some negative aspects to communicating with your readers this way um, and talking to the world this way. I think there's so much to be said for turning up at a bookshop and meeting people face to face and having a picture taken with them and signing their books and chatting with them. And I really, really, really do miss that. And I cannot wait to start doing that again. Um, also meeting other writers. I miss meeting other writers because that's what happens a lot when you're out on the road um, doing events. So I miss that. But on the other hand, this is amazing. Look what I'm doing here tonight. Um, and we're all so slick now. We've all got our little corners set up. We all know exactly how to set the lighting up. I've got a special thing that plugs into my laptop now so I don't have to rely on the Wi-Fi. So I never have to worry that it's going to start lagging. Um, so we're all, we're all really slick and tech now, which is fantastic. I, I, I think we couldn't, have, we couldn't do this event I mean, thanks to COVID, we all have a PhD in Zoom, right? Yeah, I mean, if we absolutely. tried to do this a year ago, I think half the authors we invited or more probably don't, don't know how to get on. Uh, no, but now no, we send the link out and everyone is, everyone's such a pro and, and so ready to, uh, to tackle Zoom. It hasn't been an issue. Yeah, yeah. So now I think hopefully next year when this is all over, we'll have the best of both worlds. We'll be able to do the lovely in the flesh face-to-face -face things. And we'll also be able to do more of these thrilling global things um, from our bedrooms. <laughs> Do you miss travel at all, Lisa? Do I miss travel? travel? Mm -hmm. uh, so weird because I travelled so much last year that I was almost dreading having to do all the travelling this year. And then, ha oh, oh, the irony um, that I yeah haven't obviously done any travelling at all this year. Um, and now I'm starting to miss it again. So maybe it was good timing for me. Maybe I needed a break and it came just at the right time. So now I'm really excited to start again next year. Yeah, I don't blame you. I felt the same way. I was traveling a couple times a month for the last yeah. three years. And I was honestly, ex like, so thrilled just to be home for a little while. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But anyway, over that now, want to move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, sp speaking of moving on, our, our next writer was just a little bit late. We have the Anthony Horowitz, the great uh, writer coming in right now. I'm told he's in the building as well, so we're going to bring well, him on. Well, that's fantastic, because I just got a notification from my computer, having said I'm such a professional, that my battery's running low and I haven't got the charger with me. So that could not be better time. <laughs> I just suddenly thought, oh my God, imagine if I just go dead before Anthony arrives. <laughs> well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us, and we can't wait to talk to you again soon. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to you too either. Thanks so much for having me. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and good luck for tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. How are you today? Can you hear us? Uh, there I you. Can you? Yes, how are you? Are you talking to me, Anthony? Yes, I yes, sure sir. am. Hi, Kimberly, I'm very, very well. How are you? Fantastic. I'm so glad you could join us. And you're just back from Crete, is that correct? I spent the entire summer, nine glorious weeks in Crete, yes. 
uh, in the in the island of uh, just just down the road from Agios Nikolaos, if, if anyone knows that part of the world. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like there? Because I, I haven't been yet, and I but I love the area. Well, the first thing to say is that it's actually where my new book is set. So it's a sort of it's an area which is very very close to my heart, and it is Crete is it's I don't know how can I describe Crete to you? It is hot. The Aegean Sea is utterly beautiful. It is turquoise, it is so clean, and it's the most beautiful sea in the world. You get fantastic skyscapes in Crete. Uh, the ancient Greeks, of course, believed in the gods. They believed in, you know, when dawn came, it was Apollo in his chariot of fire riding across the sky. And uh, if there was a storm, it would be Zeus throwing down the lightning bolts. And when there was a rough sea, it was Poseidon who was causing that. And if you live in Crete and you look at nature, you understand why the Greeks believed in the gods, because the world there is so magical. You get a sense of just the, the, the cosmos of being in control of somebody else. And it's a wonderfully inspiring place to write. I, I, I stay in a house that's on a cliff top with 136 steps that go down to the sea. So I can sit at a desk there in a little office and just walk up when I feel like it. I can leave the computer behind me and walk down into the sea, which I do every day. Uh, the food is wonderful there, very simple. The people are very kind and friendly. The Greeks have a wonderful spirit of, of hospitality and, and, and kindness. It is a perfect country. Was that what you wanted to hear, Kimberly? You know what? I actually think we should send this clip to the tourism. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, my, 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 question, my question was, why the heck did you leave? <laughs> Sean, I ask myself that every single day. It is back to reality, back to London, back to lockdown, back to all sorts of issues. But when I'm out there, I can leave it all behind me. And I sometimes think to myself that really, if I was smart, I would just move in full time. I'm trying to learn Greek, by the way. I'm actually, I have Greek lessons of three times a week out there. And uh, uh, a, a young lady comes to my, to, to, to my, to my, to my, to where I'm staying and, uh, and gives me Greek lessons. And by the end of the summer, I look a bit Greek. I've got so tan that it's, uh, you know, I can get mistaken for one. Why do I come back? I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing, and I'm sure you'll agree with me here. We all need somewhere to escape to. We need a home, we need a place where we work, and we need somewhere very special where we can go to hide and to be away from, you know, in a way, what you're doing with this wonderful, uh, you know, night of a thousand authors you're doing is a sort of a miniature escape. And that to me is what, what Crete is too. I couldn't agree with you more. And obviously we're here because books are a huge escape and we love to escape into books and new worlds. I want to talk about Moonfla Moonflower Murders. It takes many of the themes from kind of the classic mystery to the new levels. And I want to know what the literary roots of that novel was, were. Well, I age detective fiction. I mean, I've always loved Agatha Christie, of course, Dorothy L. Sayers, Ellery Queen, uh, Nagayo Marsh, uh, Josephine Tay. I love the sort of the world that they represent. You know, I think that the, 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 the topic of this conversation is escape. And there is nothing that is a greater escape, in my view, than a golden age detective uh, murder mystery. I always think it's a little bit like solving a crossword because it absolutely consumes you. You know, solving a cryptic crossword, which incidentally is one of my great loves, while I'm doing it, the entire rest of the world is forgotten as I just struggle with two down and how can this clue possibly make sense? I think you get the same sort of magic in a detective story. And it, you know, it's interesting, but during the last um, nine months in the UK, um, fiction has sold up pretty well. You know, books have not seen a collapse in the market, but the most popular type of book has been murder mystery. Go figure, there's something that is so I don't know, so warming and, 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 and reassuring about it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the murder mystery, and I always say this, it's a one genre where you always arrive at the truth. And in a world in which the truth is, is increasingly a, something that is difficult to gauge, you know, the world of, of 24 hour news, of fake news, a world in which you have to question everything you're told all the time. Isn't it wonderfully comforting to read a book that just simply dots every eye, crushes every T and leaves you no doubt that by the time a detective leaves the community, everything has been sorted out. If only the world were as simple. Amen. Yeah. So um, this is a sad week with Sean Connery passing. And I know you've written the Bond book. Did you ever have a chance to meet Sean or? I will tell you a story if I have about five or six minutes left in which to do it about meeting Sean Connery. I was invited to a restaurant when I was in my very early thirties by an actor. And I knew that this actor was going to ask me to write a script for him. And I didn't know that this actor was actually a very powerful and well-connected man. 
So I sat down in the restaurant with him and I was a little bit cocky. I'm sort of, you know, hey, nice to see you. I'm glad to be here. Now, what are we going to talk about? And he said, Anthony, I've got a real problem. I'm really sorry. I know this is an important lunch for us to talk, but a friend of mine is in town. He's only here for one day. He asked if he could have lunch. We do mind if he joins us. Hey, I said, that's cool. That's no problem. Sean Connery sat down at the table. <laughs> and in that moment, I went from that big to that big. I shrank to six inches tall. And I'll tell you the rest of the story. We then began to, to eat and to have the meal together. I'm absolutely in awe. Sean Connery was magnificent. I mean, what a beautiful man, really. I mean, so magnetic. And he was very nice to me and very friendly, even though he could see that I was a little, you know, shrimpy writer. Anyway, the waiter comes over and he says to my actor friend, he says, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but look, there's a guy sitting on his own at the other side of the restaurant and um, he uh, would like to join you because he's on his own and he saw you and he knows you. Would, and the guy said to me, Anthony, do you mind if we, if we make it a forced line? By this time, I'm this big. I say, well, yeah, okay, okay. So I've got Sean Connery opposite me, my actor on the right. <laughs> Alec Guinness takes the table, seat on the left. Oh my goodness. And all I can tell you about that lunch is that I became insensibly, comprehensively, and completely drunk because I was so shocked to sit next to two of the greatest actors in the world. And it just reminded me for future reference, never get cocky because there's always somebody who is gonna take you down a peg or two if you are. It was an amazing experience. And meeting Connery, I wrote to our Robin of Sherwood for our, his son, Jason Connery acted as Robin of Sherwood. So I had a connection with the family there too, but he was my childhood. I mean, you know, I grew up with Bond um, I remember still seeing age 10, Dr. No, uh, Connery and Ursula Andress, that bikini worn by her, not him, uh, and, uh, and, and the tropical beach and everything about it. You know, it, it was a definition of my life. And at his passing, could 2020 get any worse? Every time you ask the question, 20, 20 answers, we sure can. So um, maybe Anthony, before you head off, can you please help us welcome your good friend, Ragnar? And what is some one interesting thing you can tell us about Ragnar that you know may not you know be forthcoming about? Well, I had the most wonderful evening with Ragnar at the opera. So I will tell you the little secret of his is that he is a big opera fan, and maybe you can talk to him about oh, that. Right. But um, he's also a wonderful writer. I mean, a true heir to Agatha Christie. And ask him if you like about the little secret plan that he and I are hatching together. The secret plan. Now that sounds interesting. Uh, any, any clues you can drop? I'm going to say nothing. I shall leave it to Ragnar to dodge the question or to answer as he sees fit. I was going to be seeing him in Iceland quite soon. We had the, uh, you know, the Iceland Noir Festival should have taken place around now, actually. And it's, of course, you know, so, so sad. They, there he is, I think. Is that him there? Yeah, he's managed to get a haircut and he's managed to get himself a giant piano, which I haven't seen before. Uh, so he's, there you go, there's the opera thing. Maybe ask him to play you some Verdi. We will. And Anthony, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. I hope us. you all have a great day and a great night. And thank you for everybody. Well, thank you very much. It was very nice speaking with you. Bye. A, a real pleasure. You take care of yourself. Okay. Okay. So there we go. Ragnar, it's lovely to see you. Okay. Yeah, you too. <laughs> so Ragnar's uh, all the way from Iceland. I'm speaking to you from Reykjavik. Huh? Now we just had a good friend, Anthony Horowitz on, and he said that you had a secret to share about the two of you and your plans. Yes, uh, actually last time I met Anthony, we, uh, because you know, I, I heard you were speaking of, of James Bond and Sean Connery, last time we, we almost had dinner with, uh, with George Lazenby, another Connery, another Bond actor. Uh, he was, we met him, he was having dinner at the same restaurant as we were, and we had a really nice chat. So. Um, so that you know that discussion brought me back to to London, and I haven't been able to go back since because of all the things that's uh, that's been going on. But uh, we are uh, yeah we have been planning to to write uh, a play together, and I don't know what, what how much I, I am at liberty to say, but it's at very uh, uh, very early stage, and uh, and we have uh, you know we've thrown uh, around a few ideas. Uh, but I, I mean, I heard also what Anthony said about the, the murder mystery and the escape of the Golden Age type of, of books. And I think that's the type of play uh, we, we will write eventually. And, and, but the problem is there, are, there aren't very many uh, mystery plays 
because it's uh, it's hard to make that si type of thing work. I have to say that you have the cutest Zoom bomber. <laughs> we're thrilled. This is fun. This is when the fun really starts. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Ragnar, I have a question about your work because uh, that's what we're here to talk about. Most of it is in a very isolated, desolate, claustrophobic location. And I'm wondering, are there pros and cons to writing about those locations? Um, yes, I mean, I, I'm blessed with having Iceland as a, as a location to work with. And we have all these wonderful isolated places. Uh, so, so that's really, that sort of, you know, uh, is something that just happens when you ride in Iceland. You, you, you tend to look out and find these lost villages or these uh, faraway fjords where you have uh, uh, 24 hour darkness almost in winter. And I mean, I enjoy writing about them. And uh, for me, uh, I mean, I love these old golden age detective stories as well. And, and for me, I mean, I just hope I can use Iceland as like a, as a setting for uh, or a framework for a, for a good, good puzzle. And Ragnar, I always love hearing um, how writers started their career, where they get the first call. And we've never had a chance to talk about that before. So can you kindly share that experience? Oh, I can, absolutely. Uh, it is actually a, a, a nice story because uh, I started writing my first book around 10 years ago. And, uh, and I, you know, I, it was just in my computer and I had no immediate plans to send it to a publisher in Iceland. But what then happened was that the uh, a publisher in Iceland, I, they had a competition. They were looking for the next, uh, or for the Icelandic Dan mm -hmm. Brown. And, uh, you know, I, I think I write quite different books from Dan, but I, I still, I thought I'd use this opportunity because this was the only crime writing competition in Iceland for, uh, for a number of years. So I used that to finish my manuscript and sent in the story. And in the end, um, they didn't find uh, they didn't find the Icelandic Dan Brown. There was no winner, and of course there can only be one Dan Brown. Um, but they picked up on the story uh, regardless and, and published it. And uh, uh, so I think, in a way, I have Dan to thank for uh, for eventually like finding a publisher and uh and i managed to tell him that story even and, and thank him even though he had no idea that's really lovely actually and it's funny how so many talented experienced authors paved the path for new authors and that's what i love most about this community and um i would love for Ragnar, if you wouldn't mind to help us welcome our next guest uh john Connolly. i think i'm sure you know each other Do you know John Renner? Uh, no, not, not a lot, but uh, of course I read his work, yes. absolutely. Fantastic, okay. Well, Renner, thank you so much for joining us tonight and tell your Zoom mom or she's adorable, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Star of the show. So much fun. Thank you, thank you, take thank care. You. I thank look you. forward very much to your next book. Thank you, thank you for having me. Of course. John, welcome to the show. We're very happy to have you here. How are you doing tonight? I'm okay. I just feel less culturally significant than Ragnar, who has a piano and books <laughs> behind him, you know, short of having a symphony orchestra, whereas I just have a kitchen wall and, and I have the football on in the next room, so I don't feel I'm quite in the same league. Not at all. It's beautiful. Actually, I quite like that wall. Is there a history behind it? No, actually, it's a fake wall. Like so much of my life, it's, it's in posture. <laughs> it's, it's actually, we tried digging through the kitchen wall when we were doing it, but it's an old 19th century house and we might as well have been trying to, to mine diamonds. So we actually just took a fake wall on top of it and, and now it looks really impressive. It certainly does. And I just want to give a quick shout out before we start the questions um, to Print Bookstore in Portland, where much of the Charlie Parker series um, takes place because they're streaming this whole um, evening live as well. Oh, God bless them. Lovely bookstore. Nice. Anyways, go ahead, Sean. Oh, okay. Well, so the Dirty South is, is an origin story a bit. Um, we, we know a lot about Charlie Parker from things that he said in all your, what is it, uh, 18 books? Of, well done. You know? I'm, I'm really impressed. Yeah, yes, it is. 18 and a half, just to knit 18. it. 
Okay. But now we get to see a lot more of, of what makes him tick now. Um, was, was there any, was there a challenge of going back into the recesses of your mind to like, when you create this character to, to dig up all these old bones? The challenge is if you write a book like this, you have to go back and read your first book. And this may not be the greatest I've ever from my first. I'm, you know, I'm quite proud of every damn thing. I was a very young writer. I started it when I was in my mid twenties and it was published when I was 30. But no writer wants to go back and read something that he or she wrote yeah. 21 years ago. It's like some kind of Freudian nightmare, you know? Um, but I had to check it to make sure that everything matched up. And what struck me was that my style had changed. Um, when I was, and I think this is common for a lot of writers, I was so enthralled to my models at that young age. I was so enthralled to James Lee Burke, to Ross MacDonald. And it feels, the style sometimes felt very mannered to me. And it took me, I think it took me 15 years to even begin to find my own voice, to start to shake off some of those influences. Now, not that James Lee Burke is an influence that anybody should be shaking off, you know? <laughs> I think that's a pretty good thing. But that was what struck me most, that it, it was actually trying, to, the styles were never going to mesh because I had changed so much as a writer. And maybe that's not such a bad thing because, you know, it's a very different Parker. It's a younger, angrier, grief-stricken Parker. So it's probably appropriate that the stylism doesn't quite match up, perhaps. So, uh, uh, John, your novel, he brings some of the great characters of the Golden Age um, from Hollywood to life. Can you tell us a little bit about your research behind it? Yeah, I was fascinated. I'd always been fascinated by Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. I'd grown up with them, watching them on TV on Saturday mornings or when, you know, on the BBC would show them when the racing was cancelled from Haydock Park because of rain. And I was staying with a bookseller called Shelley MacArthur, who uh, used to run the Mysterious Bookstore in Los Angeles. And he, used, he was an early internet adopter, so his house was full of junk, quite frankly, that he was <laughs> flogging to people. And I said, is there anything that you wouldn't want to sell? And he said, no, at that point, you become, you become a hoarder. But he said, the only thing I regret losing was a hat that Stan Laurel had given me. And I, I think I literally had to sit down because it never, I couldn't conceive of somebody having met Stan Laurel because to me, Oliver Hardy and Stan Laurel existed in a black and white time. If you saw them walking down the street, they would be in black and white. I couldn't imagine that somebody would have met them. But as Shelley pointed out that when he was growing up, Stan Laurel lived in a little apartment down the road from him in Santa Monica. And he kept his name in the telephone book, which is almost unimaginable. I live in Dublin. I don't keep my name in the telephone book. I don't want randomers calling me up, coming around for tea. But Stan Laurel really wanted that. And so I wondered what he had been doing. This, he, he outlived Oliver Hardy by eight years. And I wondered what he had been doing and what he had been doing was living in his little apartment, writing sketches for Oliver Hardy that would never be performed. Because I think he wanted to hear his voice in his head. Again, he wanted that man in his presence. And so it became a way of writing about male friendship, a kind of male love. Um, yeah, and, and to return to people that, that I had loved and an era that fascinated me. That's beautiful. Well, when we first meet uh, Charlie Parker or uh, come across him in um, The Dirty South, it's altogether kind of fitting that he's reading a Louis L'Amour book. And the reason I feel that way is because it's essentially a Western, isn't it? I mean, oh, it, it's very it's much essentially Western. a Western. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it, it has even has a posse in it. It is, it is all the tropes of a Western. And that was very conscious. What I was amazed, I, I think it was the, the book he's reading is uh, Confessions or Memoirs of a Wandering Man. I may have the title yeah. wrong. Um, and I remember reading that and thinking, Louis the Moore is the most amazing man. Uh, you know, he was self-educated. Mm -hmm. And yet he was more widely read than just about anybody I'd come across. It was, it was just amazing. And so sometimes in the books, and I think writers, are, we all have this in common, we will come across a piece of music that we love or a book that we love. And in some ways you try and nudge readers towards it. You put a little thing, you know, I, I'm a huge John Sanford fan. John Sanford was one of the influences on me when I began writing, because I think he has a wonderful command of humor and he writes action very well. I think he's a hugely underrated writer. I agree. And I remember about two books ago, he had a character reading, I think Virgil Flowers encounters a policeman reading every dead thing. And it was such a beautiful and hugely kind nod. And also it convinced my mother that I might have a future as a writer. Because <laughs> she actually prefers, she prefers John Sanford and Michael Connolly to me. When, when Michael Connolly signs books for my mother, he changes the spelling of his name to match. You know, I think, you know, Michael Connolly is the son my mother never had. 
And so, um, and so when John Sanford did that, my mother thought, well, maybe you don't have to go window cleaning or driving a bus or something. That there may actually be a future in this if John Sanford rates you. So John, uh, I'm actually, you're from Dublin and um, I'm writing a book right now where the lead character is from Belfast. What can you tell me about Belfast that I could insert into the book for a little fun? Whenever you go into a coffee shop, a woman who looks like your idealized auntie or grandmother will call you love and give you a cup of tea. Uh, and it, they, the people are very, they're very kind up there and they're incredibly friendly. I, I love going up to Belfast. So yeah, they will always, they always call you love or dear, you know, or dad. They, they just have this lovely thing about them, um, which, which we've lost. In, and I think maybe in part because for a long time, because of the troubles, there wasn't tourism. There weren't visitors. And I think people up in Belfast don't take it for granted that people will come and visit their city because for such a long time, people were genuinely afraid to go. So there is a real, I think there's a real solicitude towards people. There's a real kindness up there, which is sometimes missed in the history of all the violence. I love that. And I just want to put a plug in there for that book, Say Nothing, which I thought was absolutely spectacular. And I just wanted to say that Kyle Mills seems to be in the house. So John, why don't you help us welcome Kyle in? Welcome, Kyle. Have a, have a good evening, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, John, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Anything we can do, we'd love to have you back for a longer chat sometime. And I really appreciate all your help and advice. Continued success to both of you folks. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. And Kyle Mills is live with us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, writer now took over for Vince Flynn, writing the Mitch Rat books. Kyle, how are you doing? I am doing good. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Nothing else to do today. I, well, listen, hey, look, let's let's jump into this. Your last few books, including this one right here, Total Power, they just have this uh, way of sort of coming true. You, you Two books ago, you did Lethal Agent, book, uh, well, it's a bio threat. Your new book has government shutdowns and all kinds of stuff. Can you just write me winning the lottery in your next book and let's just see if we can keep the the, the, the plot's coming true alive. That would be great. Absolutely. It's the, consider it done. Will you, will you share it? Uh, I w yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. You put it in the book and it happens. Uh, I will I'm pretty, I think I'm on record saying that if I ever win the lottery, I'm just going to pay you to write me little daily Mitch rap short stories, uh, to hang out and, and, uh, you know, get my Mitch rap filled. but thank you for being here. Why don't you tell us just a little bit, can you tease the next book for us? Uh, yeah, so I'm about, I don't know, about halfway through the first draft of that book, and it was kind of one of those decisions now, uh, whether you wanted to continue it really kind of as a political thriller and talk about politics in the United States, or whether I wanted to draw back and bring something out of Michigan. Kyle's having technical difficulties, but I don't know anything about the book. What I can tell you is after so many fantastic Mitch Rat books, uh, if it's a Mitch Rat book and it's got Kyle's name on it, it is worth buying. Not yet available for pre-order, but supposed to come out sometime next fall. We're going to kind of hang out, wait, see if we can get him back. Um, but definitely be on the lookout for uh, for that one. Okay, here's Kyle. We got him back. Uh, so, well, I actually opened the door. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's... Uh, don't you know, I, I was just telling people to, to buy the book no matter what it's about, but we would love to hear a little bit about it. Yes, let's try this again. Yeah, so it was, it's, uh, I'm going to stick with the kind of the theme of what's going on in politics today uh, in the United States and kind of the changes that have, we've been going through and the partisanship and how that's going to affect our position in the world. And, you know, uh, Mitch has always had these great presidents to work for. And I thought it'd be fun to see if he had a president he couldn't stand uh, and tried to have, try to work for him. So we'll see how it goes. It sounds incredible, Kyle. Now, I understand that your father was an FBI agent, am I correct? Yeah, and he was an FBI agent. He was the director of Interpol and the legal attaché to the United Kingdom. So he got around the government. That's quite a resume. Now, do you feel that you growing up in that world kind of gave you a passion for thrillers, international intrigue? I'd love to hear how it influenced you. Yeah, you know, I grew up really enjoying thrillers. Um, 
but it, you know, just knowing all those people, you know, that was always the friends of the family. You know, it was always MI6 or CIA guys or FBI or operators. So when I decided I was going to write my first book, I, it wasn't really a shoe in that I would do thrillers because um, I like all kinds of different books. Um, but I, it was a, a little bit of laziness maybe on my part that I thought, well, this is before the internet. And I thought, well, I know all these guys. So if I ever have any problems or if I, you know, I have all these interesting stories I can tell about them, um, maybe that'd be go. And truth be told, I never really thought the book would get published. So it was mostly <laughs> just a fun project. Well, Kyle, um, let me ask you this. I'm almost afraid to ask because like we're nearing the end of 2020, but we're not quite done with 2020. Um, the book you just wrote, Total Power, is about the power grid going down in America. How plausible is that really? And all the research you did to write the book, and it, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the United States could not sustain any kind of sophisticated attack on its power grid. It's pretty much undefended. So, I mean, I could take out a big chunk of the power grid if I felt like it. Um, so we kind of live on the, you know, the goodwill of our enemies. I suppose. Um, I think I think I, I brought it bring up in the book that, you know, the entire U.S. economy going offline and, the, and America going offline would probably not be good for anybody, even our enemies. So uh, I, I think it'd be something, you know, the Chinese would think twice about bringing down America's power grid uh, because they'd have a whole lot of stuff that they couldn't sell. Um, and that's how they sustain their economy. So. Fingers crossed that, you know, a group of terrorists who just are bent on total destruction. Uh, and Kyle, you've had a long and varied career. Um, I hope, are you still there? Okay, because you froze for a second. Yeah. I wondered, you know, what are some of the proudest moments you've had, like from, you know, personal standpoint and professional standpoint in your career? Um. Let's see. You know, the proudest point in my life, I was in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, and I went into a gas station bathroom and there was an ad for my first book above the urinal. I felt like I had really made it at that point. Um, getting on the New York Times bestseller list is also, <laughs> also good, but th there's something about that that ad over the urinal that was, that was just a great moment. You take a picture of it? <laughs> That was before cell phones. So I didn't have a camera with me. I tried to get my wife to come in and look at it, but she wouldn't. <laughs> I am sure uh, Kim Mills would, would have loved that. Uh, Kyle, I know you're coming off a lengthy virtual tour. Everyone's doing the virtual tours now. We are one hour in to our marathon session. Any tips uh, for us as we got to keep going for the next five plus hours? You know, probably I'd uh, start kicking into the alcohol with two hours to go. <laughs> Hey, at least if the show goes off the rails and everyone's drunk, it will be fun. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. I, 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 I felt like as the virtual tour got kept going, pretty much at the alcohol kept getting more and more on everybody's part, the interviewers, the authors, but it seemed to work out. Oh, that's great. We are told Joe Rosenberg's in the building. We're going to bring him on now. Do you know Joe? You just, you just blurbed his book, right? His new one? Yeah. So I got, I've never met him face to face, but I got to read his book before it came out, which is always fun. Well, I'm told uh, from our producer, Jeff Ferris, he's coming in right now, live from Israel, Joe Rosenberg. Hey, Joe. Joe, thank you so much for being here. Joe, can you hear us? Well, we're waiting. We're going to get him. He's got a great backdrop, by the way. Everyone's got impressive backdrops tonight. He's got a long, a lot farther to transmit. <laughs> Joe, can you hear us? No, we're waiting. We'll get him. <clears throat> can you hear us now, Joe? I think he's working to, uh, to get volume mm -hmm. on us. In the meantime, Kyle, I have to tell you, uh, after reading Total Power, knowing the power grid goes down, you are right. To your point, it just started getting cold up here in Michigan. We had to uh, finally kick the furnace on. And the night before we did, I was so cold. I thought, how 
on earth did Mitch Rapp and uh, and all his buddies survive the frigid cold right around Christmas time when the grid went down in total power? So um, yeah, I think I can speak for most Americans. We're not we're not ready for that. Joe, are you with us now? Can you hear us? I am. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you live from Israel. Hey, man, thanks for coming on. My pleasure, Ryan. Great to be with you, Kimberly, uh, Kyle. Great to see you. Wow, this is a, a fun night. I've been enjoying this. We were uh, we were just talking about your book, which Kyle and I both read. Here's my big copy. Yeah, he read it. He endorsed it. I'm very grateful. I think the copy you have doesn't have his endorsement on the cover, but Kyle, thank you. I just couldn't be more grateful. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for sending the book. It's always uh, it's always fun to get them before everybody else. Amen. <laughs> Kyle, we got to keep the show going, so we're sad to see you go, but thank you so much for coming on, and we'll talk to you soon. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to see you, man. And Joe, welcome. Hey, great to be with you guys. Welcome from uh, ground zero of, uh, you know, where you want to write political thrillers from. Yeah, right. <laughs> for sure. Now, 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 are you in, like, a bomb shelter right now? I don't know. Um, right now, we have three new peace treaties in the region, so we're feeling good. <laughs> there's always the Ron to remind us that somebody wants to annihilate us. So, you know, there's always that. So, uh, well, I remember you know, I this living, been... oh, living in the gift that keeps on giving if you're going to write about Middle East uh, radical Islamist uh, threats, right? But it wasn't that long ago. I feel like you were finishing up a book and posting that you were. In, in a bunker of some sort in your home or something and, and actually finishing a book from there, which has to be chilling when you're writing about this stuff. So listen, I mean, you've been called a, a modern day Nostradamus. Um, I'm almost scared to ask because you're always so right on the money. Your books just come true. You and Kyle Mills have the same problem. We just talked to him. Um, now look, I've read it, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna comment too much yet, uh, Beirut Protocol. Can you tell readers what it's about? Because there's a good chance this is what 2021 or 2022 could look like down the road. Well, I hope not. I, I was just uh, thinking uh, your uh, Anthony was mentioning that could the could 2020 get any worse? And then we lost uh, Sean Connery. And it's like it, it, among many movies, I remember him in uh, Hunt for Red October. And he's like, careful, Ryan. There's things in there that don't react well to Butch. <laughs> and uh, no, it's such a, it's such a loss. But look, uh, so my hero is uh, Marcus Riker, uh, Marine, served in combat duties in Afghanistan, in Iraq, goes on to work for the United States Secret Service, eventually on the presidential uh, protective detail. Uh, through a series of events, uh, tragic events in his own life, he, he leaves government, but he gets pulled, pulled back in to uh, working up eventually for the Central Intelligence Agency in this new book, the one that's coming, uh, the Beirut Protocol, uh, he's doing an advanced trip uh, with some other colleagues up on the Israeli-Lebanon border because the U.S. Secretary of State is coming as part of the peace process uh, between Israel and the Arab states. All that to say, things go badly. Uh, Hezbollah, the uh, radical Islamist terror uh, network in Lebanon that is funded, fueled, armed, trained, Supplied by Iran, one of their uh, one of their cells attacks uh, this convoy. Riker is in it, and for the first time in the in this now the, will be the fourth book. Uh, but in the first time in his life, he is not on offense. Uh, he's very much on defense. He's pulled. He's captured and pulled deep behind enemy lines, and so basically have knocked out all his his skill sets. And he's got to figure out what to do next. I can't wait to dive into that, Joel. Now, American uh, presidents and other world leaders read your novels. Now, does that influence when you're writing that they're sort of sitting on your shoulder and you know they're going to read? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, you know, I, when I, I got into novel writing because I, I am a failed political consultant. Okay, you have to understand, I, I worked for a number of U.S. and Israeli political uh, leaders, none of whom won their elections. I have a hundred percent failure rate, and uh, and that's why I went into making things up for a living, uh, writing political thrillers. Um, there may not be a bigger political thrill ride than what we're living through, good or bad, in the United States right now. But um, I didn't write. I didn't start writing these novels 
for leaders. I, I wrote them. I wrote them for myself, to be honest, I, because who knew if anyone would would buy them, would read them. Um, but over time, it has been stunning to find out that uh, kings and crown princes, uh, presidents, prime ministers, yeah, have been reading them, current and former, CIA directors. And that does change the way you think about what you're doing, because now you're thinking, well, how do I hold the attention, not just of my, my friend or my, you know, my buddy across the country, how do I hold the, the vice president of the United States, his attention? Why should he spend two or three days reading a political thriller? I mean, he, you know, he, he's read in on all the intelligence, former president uh, George W. Bush, uh, King Abdullah of Jordan. So you think, how do you, how do you do that? They know more than you do. So how do you make it realistic enough that it's worth their time? And they're not like, come on, because they, they will toss a book faster than your average person. Time. Well, Joel, you can say that you you make stuff up for a living. At at minimum, it's like prophetic fiction. It, it always seems to come true. We have our next guest, uh, Andrews and Wilson, the talented duo writing team, who, by the way, uh, recently signed a deal to with Tyndale, which is uh, yeah. your, your publisher as well. So we're gonna get I them on in here. Day. Welcome side. aboard. We're glad to have them. Yeah, Tyndale's uh, beefing up uh, the the thriller lineup. I suppose here. I told they're coming in now. Indeed. Hey, guys. Well, we got one of them, at least. Uh, looks like uh, Brian's here. We have Jeff Wall. You got us, both. Oh, there they are. There's <laughs> Jeff. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey. hey. man. How are you? Good to see you, brother. Good, fellas. Thanks for coming on. We have Joe Rosenberg. We're just talking about you guys yeah, are now sort we're of just listening. thriller <laughs> writers at Tyndale. You guys share a publisher now. That's right. That's right. Indeed. Great to have you guys with us. Thank you for your support for my books. And I'm excited about where you guys are going. Um, and I think Tyndale needs to be doing a lot more, though. Let's not expand the pool too much. Let's, you know, we want to <laughs> monopoly on the, on the, on the franchise. <laughs> yeah, Joel, I got to tell you, man, the opportunity to read the Beirut Protocol. I've been a fan of your work from the beginning. This, and and I, it gets old saying this is your best book ever, but this is really good, man. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thanks for the opportunity to read it. Well, I'm super grateful, Jeff. And, and Brian, you know, you guys have been – so supportive and encouraging and i uh, i'm grateful Our where in the world are you today what's that where are you today joe um i'm at home i'm in jerusalem uh, our country is not a hundred percent in lockdown but but nearly so the doors are closed no one's allowed into the country unless you're a citizen um which we are so here here i am and you still had to do the quarantine going in right isn't that what you said you had to do like two weeks going in that's right. So I've been back to the States to do speaking and uh, research for new novels and things. And so I've, I've gone through three quarantines, six weeks of 2020. I have been I've been in quarantine. But I will tell you, well, first, it's weird because you're like a cat, right? Your wife just dropped off bowls of food in front of the door. But, you know, nobody can see you and nobody can have any contact. So that's weird. But on the other hand... Uh, and I just say this not because, I mean, there's tremendous sadness, there's real loss, there's real heartache going on there. So I don't mean to make light of it. I'm just saying for an author who's healthy, being in quarantine is sort of like your regular own life. You, you barely notice that you haven't seen anybody. People are like, oh, it must be really difficult. You're like, I, yeah, I guess, it's, I guess it's been two weeks. Are, am I out? <laughs> so, I've been very productive. Um, I'm writing for the first time in the many years. I'm writing a second book in the same year. So, uh, yeah, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been so bad. Good. Now, Joel, is that second book, are you able to say, is that another Marcus Riker book? Will that series continue? It, the, 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 the series will, well, you know, sure. Thanks, Ryan. So somehow somebody lives, uh, you know, <laughs> if you broke Bayer Protocol. But yes, it's, uh, so yes, uh, uh, Marcus Riker will continue. But I'm not writing that book right now. Uh, that'll start January 1. I'm actually writing the first nonfiction book that I've written for in, in eight years. And this is um, this will come out in September of next year for the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Mm. Um, and the book really will look the first, you know, nonfiction will look at where are we in our battle with radical Islamism 20 years in uh, the book's divided into three sections. The first section is who are the bad guys at this point? How have we done with Al-Qaeda? How have we done with ISIS? 
and other uh, of, the, uh, of the radical Islamists. But, but where are we with Iran? Why is Iran building the dangerous alliance with Russia and Turkey, Turkey being a, a NATO ally? So that's part one. Part two, so after the bad guys, is who are the good guys or at least the opportunities for peace, for a, a better strategic relationship? This is really our relationship with the Arab uh, states. And I've had this unique opportunity to come and sit with five meetings with uh, President el-Sisi in Egypt, uh, five meetings with King Abdullah in Jordan, uh, first time before he, when he invited me because he read my novel, which was about people trying to kill him and blow up his power. Hey, like, so he could have banned me from the kingdom forever. <laughs> Instead, he invited my wife and me to come and get to know him. So that was, and he didn't arrest us. So that was good. Uh, meetings with uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates and others. And so it, that's the largest section of this book is where are we going? And why is there a U.S., Israeli, Sunni Arab alliance emerging against the Russian, Iranian, Turkish alliance? And the last section deals with some of the religious freedom issues in the region. You know, we've dealt with genocide against Christians and other uh, minorities. Uh, I'm an evangelical from a Jewish background. So it's interesting to see uh, the, the real trauma that Christians and others, Muslims most of all, in this part of the world have faced, but where are we now and where are we going? So that's been a great diversion to me because I think in terms of nonfiction, uh, Ryan knows we've talked about it. I actually did not grow up reading a lot of fiction. I know that sounds funny. I was a film major. Uh, I, I, I loved James Bond was the first one, but uh, I didn't read a lot of fiction. I, I, I watched it. And so my the way I think is not really as a novelist, you guys are all probably thinking, yeah, we've read that stuff, and uh, we know. But uh, I, as, a, as a screenwriter, really, and how would it play out visually? Well, Joe, we could talk to you for the rest of the five hours. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. You truly helped oh, make you. tonight international uh, by coming up from Israel. we got to <laughs> keep it going. So we'll say well, goodbye here. Well, you in England yeah, and Scotland, so yeah. But I love um, you guys. Have a great night. Yes, talk okay, to you good. soon. See you, Joe. See you, Joe. Thank you. Andrews and Wilson. Mm. What's up, guys? Hey, man. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Mike. What's up? What's up, boys? Good to see you guys. Yeah, you too. Now, how did we get stuck with Mike and everyone else gets the lovely Kimberly? I don't understand. I don't know. And Ryan nope. just popped off, so it looks like... No offense, brother. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we have some little history together. Right. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of stuff going on right now. And uh, me personally, one of the things that you're taking on is probably one of the biggest projects that I can think of is the WEB uh, series. I mean, I grew up reading this. This was, this was my, I can't wait for the next one kind of book coming out when I was a younger man. So what, did, what is it taking for you guys to research and to pick up uh, that series, which really kind of set the tone for a lot of, a lot of writing back in the day? Yeah, I mean, the research, obviously, it, it helps that like you, I grew up and I know Brian grew up reading his the core series and some of those iconic, you know, Webb Griffin, uh, historical military historical fiction. Uh, so that helps. That's the research enough, like just having lived a life of being a reader and reading his stuff. Um, and of course, we read this series to get caught up. But I will tell you, more important than the research was the support of the estate and the support of Tom Colgan at, at Putnam, um, you know, getting invited into this, but having it uh, happen in a way that they're like, look, we are looking for you to bring your voice. We're looking for you to write as you. Nobody can write as Webb Griffin. That's not the goal. That took like this enormous weight off. What do you say, Brian? Like when, when we were at that dinner and, and Tom said, we're not expecting you to write like Webb Griffin. You're like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you say like that was the biggest thing? Yeah, I think that with, you know, and, and, and Ryan, you probably know this from talking to, you know, Kyle and Mark and other legacy uh, authors that the, the most uh, nerve wracking part is just the weight of this whole legend, you know, these legendary characters that you have to pick up and carry on your back and you don't want to disappoint the fans. And, and so you know, that's always something that, I mean, that's something that Jeff and I spent a long time talking about, you know, are we up for this? Do we really want to take on this, this challenge? But I think if you're a fan first, which we, we both were, you're a fan of, of the genre, 
you know, you want to see these, these legends continue on. So that was important to us. That, that ultimately sort of paved our decision. But definitely well, I apologize. Uh, my, my, my Wi-Fi dropped out for a sec. I got to tell you guys, <laughs> we did a contest and someone got to come in, talk with anyone they wanted, the whole list of, of writers. And uh, the person who won requested to ask you guys a question. Her <laughs> name is uh, Sarah. She's going to join us now. We're going to okay. bring her in. She's got a question for you guys. And yep, I'm told she's coming in now. Sarah uh, Walton. Hey, Sarah. Hi, Sarah Walton. How are you? Sarah, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Hey, hey. Sarah. Hi. Hello. Sarah, hey, thank you for joining us. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you won the contest. Got to ask any writers you wanted uh, a question. Why did you pick these guys? Uh, no, I'm why, just kidding. They're a, great <laughs> They're a great choice, but why did wh wh you pick them and what do you want to ask them? Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, this I love the series. I love Grimes. I love Dempsey. Um, it's just it's it's been a real run of, of a ride just reading the series. Oh, thank you so oh, much. Thanks. Glad. That glad means you. a lot. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, so my question is: so Dempsey, um, is he like a lot of authors kind of have these? Their characters are like a combination of people. Is Dempsey? Is he like? Is he like one of you guys or a mixture of you guys or somebody else? He's a mixture of people way better than us. So I would, I think that um, the neat thing about Dempsey is that, you know, as you know, cause you follow us, um, Brian and I have both served in the Navy. We've served in communities that are involved in covert operations. I was in special warfare. When I think of Dempsey, I see little bits and pieces of a dozen different people that I served with. And that makes him really fun to write because it makes him really visceral for us. He's very, very real to us for that reason, I think. You agree with that, Brian? Yeah, I agree. And I think that one of the things about him is uh, of all the characters that we write, uh, he really took on a life of his own the fastest. I mean, his personality and his ethos, um, it just almost sort of transcends the page and it, it just feels weird, but he almost feels like he's like one of our buds. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for uh, for coming on to ask these guys a question. I'm just kidding. I'm giving them a hard time. They're they're great <laughs> to ask. We should we should make the next trivia question. Who are the four publishers that they're currently writing books for right now? Um, and, and, and we only got these guys for another minute because again, they're writing like four four books a year now. What's you can do five. What's one more at this point, right? We only have um, them to give you because we both have to get back to work. <laughs> I, I know it. I know it. Uh, so we'll say goodbye to them in a second. Sarah, thank you for coming on. We appreciate thank you, it. Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, guys. See you later. <laughs> I am told our next guest is ready to go. Alex Segura is going to be coming in. You guys know Alex? Yeah, I think we met at Thriller Fest before, maybe. He'll probably say, no, we don't know. This. I don't know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> And he's connecting up now, it looks like. Audio. Alex, can you hear us? I can. I can hear Thanks. me. There he yeah, is. Yeah, we got you, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Welcome. I'm happy, happy to be here. Thanks, guys. So we're Alex, just talking do you know, do you know Brian and Jeff? Yeah. Yes. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Good, good to man. See you. How are you? It's not, it's not quite as cool as having a drink in New York, is it? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but uh, not many people are doing that now. But thanks yeah. for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, well, we apologize that you have to follow these two guys. That we want to say that right up front. So you were, yeah, we were really funny and entertaining. So good luck, Alex. <laughs> oh no, I no, think uh, I think what he meant was all the viewers are gone because we were. Oh, oh that, that can be too. <laughs> I, I will stick to my uh, solidly boring routine and, and just kind of carry on. <laughs> well, at least you're consistent. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, well, Ryan. Hey, Mike. Hey, how are you? Um, I'm okay. So we we, we want to ask right up front. You write an incredible breadth of work from sci-fi to true noir to Archie meets the B-52s. Uh, yeah. Is there some hidden commonality between these projects that draws you to them? Or do you have to flip your brain 180 degrees every month or so? Yeah, I mean, it's, I like it because it keeps me on my toes. It, you know, I love changing not only genre, but kind of medium, you know, whether it's graphic novels or podcasts or prose. Um, you know, I, I think, yeah, I'm not a theme writer. I don't go into something saying, this is what I'm going to write about. These are the topics I want to hit. But, you know, looking back, most of my stuff, even the things that 
aren't characters that I create, like stuff with the Archie characters or something like Poe Dameron. It's about overcoming, you know, your adversity, overcoming your struggles and, and either achieving your destiny or or trying to reach some kind of goal that you never thought possible. So there's a lot of, of that, especially with the Pete books, the Pete Fernandez PI series where, you know, he's dealing with his own demons, his own recovery and alcoholism and overcoming that to, to kind of finalize that origin story, that PI origin story that I, I didn't really think I saw much as a fan. So it was, that was really part of the reason why I wrote it because I wanted to tell that story. Well, nice. Alex, speaking of uh, hopping around genres, let's let Brian and Jeff go. Uh, guys, thank you so much, fellas, for stopping by. We'll talk to you soon. Good to see you, Alex. You. you have, like, too many books to plug last second, by the way. There's a whole bunch of them, but we'll, uh, we'll mention them later. You guys got so much, the, the Web Griffin stuff, new stuff with Tyndale. Of course, you still have the Dempsey stuff. Come on, you have something new with Blackstone, but we'll get to all that later. I promise we'll go ahead and plug that. I think almost everything's available for pre-order, by the way. Yeah, yep. I think so. Thanks, guys. And, and I saw Jeff sipping a pretty cool Andrews and Wilson mug, so there might be some merch coming along. Oh, it didn't you, I, can't, you didn't miss anything? Wow, I'm, I'm Where has that not kind been? of upset I don't have one yet, but hey, yeah. you know, listen, we're, we're, could, could have been drinking mailbox. out of it instead of promoting Yeti tonight, but uh, <laughs> that's on you guys. I mean, we'll talk about that later. Hey, have fun, Alex. Good to see you, man. Take care, guys. Good to see you. <laughs> have a good night, guys. Hey, boys. Um, Alex, let me ask you about your writing process. It's always fascinating sure. to me. Do you outline? Uh, are you more of a pantser? Do you just kind of, you know, sit down? Can you bang out uh, a manuscript just, just on a whim? What is your process like? And do you always know the twists and turns ahead of time? That's a great question. I think my process has evolved. I think most, you know, I think a lot of writers are part of what I call like this silent majority where we don't, you know, we don't outline a thousand percent and we don't just go in blind a thousand percent. It's this kind of middle ground or planters, I guess, is what people call it. Hmm. Um, so I usually just start writing to kind of get a, tone, a feel for the vibe and the tone of what I'm trying to do, especially with something like a Pete book or, or my standalone that I'm finishing up now. Um, I just want to get a sense for the characters, for the world and what's happening around them. And then I'll start to outline um, you know, my outlines have gotten a lot more uh, detailed as I, as I write more. And so, you know, with Poe Dameron, obviously it's IP work. So you're writing for Lucasfilm, you're writing for Star Wars. So they want an outline. And so when I did that, it really opened the doors, opened my eyes to the process because I started to outline more heavily. I did it with Secret Identity, the book I'm working on now. Hmm. And so I have a pretty detailed chapter by chapter breakdown. But the trick is for me, at least, is to keep it loose enough that if a character starts doing their own thing or veering off, the course you've set, you still have the structure to kind of ride along with them and you're not going to lose any of the infrastructure, but it definitely makes revision a lot smoother and um, it lets you zoom out while still getting into the nitty gritty of it while you're writing. Huh. Uh, let me ask you, your crossover comics, uh, Kiss, the B-52s, Ramones, you know, some pretty compelling ideas. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a, a bit of a behind the scenes look at how that project even comes together? Yeah, uh, it's each one is very different. I mean, so the way it worked is Gene Simmons reached out to John Goldwater, who's the CEO of Archie and said, you know, we, we want to do a Kiss comic. Can we have them cross over with Archie? And I had just started working there. I think I'd been there for maybe a couple months and they knew I wanted to write. So I threw my hat in the ring and they very foolishly said yes. And that kind of showed them I could put together a story and I could, you know, deal with not only our own intellectual property, but something as complicated as a real living and breathing music artist. And so each one has been a little different. Something like the Ramones is different because, yeah. you know, none of the original members are around. So you're dealing with estates and it's much more about what they want. You know, obviously when the artists are gone, the, the estates want them to be represented a certain way, but it was pretty smooth. It was fun. And um, it's just been so cool to interact with even, you know, like Gene Simmons or the B-52s and, um, some other bands we've had like Blondie or the Monkees or even more modern acts like Churches and uh, Tegan and Sarah. So it, it's just a matter of like, what's the hook? How would they fit in with these characters and how can you make it feel like a real story without it seeming a little too shoehorned, you know? Yeah, right. Well, Alex, I'm told uh, our next guest, Alifair Burke, is here ready to come in as well. Uh, oh, do you good. know Alifair? I do. Yeah, she's one of the best. Oh, she is, man. I'm such a huge fan. I, I've actually never talked to her, so I'm pretty stoked to uh, finally get her in here. Cool. This is fun. Thanks hey, for doing this. Okay. Yeah. Good to you, Alex. I'm glad I jumped on to say hi. Yeah, it's good to see you. Hey, Alifair. Hi, Alifair. So, okay, audio. She'll get it. No worries. Yeah, she's uh, getting there. Yeah, she'll get it. 
this is the fun of Zoom. We've had one Zoom bomber tonight. We're just hoping for a few more. Oh, cool. Yeah. We'll rack, rack them up today. I think we got her back. Hi. Can you hear us now? Hi. Of course. I It took me half a second. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Hey, Kim. Oh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm such Great. a huge fan of yours. I just want to tell you right off the bat. I'm so pumped <laughs> to, uh, to finally like talk and connect with you. I'm a huge fan. Um, so thank you for coming on. And thank you. I think you've been um, plugging it pretty hard online. So thanks. I appreciate it. It seems like there's lots of posts about it. Thanks. For, and thanks um, for you guys for organizing this. And are you in it? Like, are you, do you guys stay on all night long? You're like the master of ceremonies of the <laughs> telethon. <laughs> Only our producer, Jeff Ayers, uh, who's in our ear oh, okay. right now. He's the only one. No, thankfully, we are all kind of subbing in and out, okay. um, taking a little breather here and there. But, okay. um, yeah. yeah. Jeff, so Jeff far, is an okay. MVP. But Jeff is like the DJ for the night. Thank you. Hero. <laughs> he is the, Hero. He's the one that we were all sending vitamins ahead of the show, making sure like, yeah, yeah. the show could go on if any of the hosts got sick. There was like right. three to cover. But if Jeff went down, we were all in big trouble. So, yeah, we may, yeah. Need, may need to send him like soup and provisions. Right? <laughs> we pretty much tucked him in last night. Wanted him to get like a full 12 C hours. CBD uh, and caffeine. Like, yes, yeah. very, Rotate very it. much so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, Alex, thank you so much for stopping by. We got to keep it going. But uh, yeah, no. we'll talk to you again soon, man. Yeah, thanks good everybody. To see you, good Alex. to see you, Alex. Take care. Congratulations Thanks. on all your recent good news. It's great. Oh, you too. Yeah, hopefully we can catch up soon. Yeah. Talk to you later. Bye. So, Alifair, it we recently talked while we were doing a wonderful uh, panel together. I know. It was super fun. And uh, if you want, actually, in that uh, Thriller Fest, um, we have a lot of very, very interesting business-related panels for anyone who out there who might... Uh, you know, kind of pursuing a career in publishing to one day be on these uh, kind of shows. And Alifer, I wanted to ask you, um, it's quite a privilege to be a screenwriter for your own work. Can you walk us through how that happened? <laughs> and the differences between writing books and screenplays? Uh, yeah, is it a privilege or is it punishment? <laughs> I will say, <laughs> so I think what you're referring to is um, when my book, The Wife, uh, sold rights to Amazon Studios for a feature film. They did also hire me to, to write the screenplay. And, um, you know, I, the nice thing about, you know, when you're a writer and those kinds of, when you, you tweet out some good news, you get to hear from all these people saying, congratulations, excited, happy for you. But um, one of my writer friends who probably does more screenplay work now than actually writing novels, he's like, are you crazy? <laughs> He's like, what are you thinking? Why would you agree to do that? I was like, oh no, like, what did I do? Um, and I, you realize how fitting a book into two hours on screen really does require you to cut. Like you, you've got to really dig through your work and ask deeply, like, what is this really about? Um, and which parts have to stay in, which parts can go on the cutting room floor, which is painful, and then which parts need to be blown up to be even bigger. So it's it's almost rewriting your work from scratch for a different medium. So it it is kind of painful. So I did my best job with it. It's, it's now with them, um, but I do think it was kind of nice to learn how to do it um, for a major studio that had faith in me instead of you know just trying to learn on my own how to do it. But um, it it is a, a big difference. I've been working on TV projects um, as as well and the TV adaptation is so different. So if you watch any television shows based on TV shows, it adds to the world, right? Instead of having to cut as many things, you can actually kind of play up elements of the characters' backstories that may have not made the final draft of your book and you can include them um, in a TV series. So it's been interesting to really think about the adaptation of that work. So we'll see what happens, but back to back to writing novels for the time being <laughs> speaking of which speaking of which by the way writing novels i fair your your next book uh find me was announced for i believe it's august 2021 is that correct yeah i'm dying to know about it what can you tell us about it um it's uh i never know how to i'm not good at the elevator pitch but um <laughs> the main character is a woman who um suffered a terrible car accident 15 years ago and had amnesia that she's never recovered from. So she, she has started her life all over again. Um, and she's, you know, she's kind of accepted that reality and is living her normal life when very unexpected things happen to her 
that she suspects might have to do with her her former self. Um, and then also on the page in that book is um, I write a series of books about Detective Ellie Hatcher, who's an NYPD detective, and I haven't written about her for a little while. So um, the main characters, um, her name is Hope. Um, Hope's uh, the the things that happen to her in real time that are very mysterious to her. Um, Ellie Hatcher winds up helping her through. So it's a hybrid book. It's a standalone with a, a little dash of Ellie Hatcher for people who like her. <laughs> I think I, I I figured out how to make next year's book the most impossible book to ever write because there are things about a standalone that are challenging. And there are things about a series book that are challenging. And I decided to throw them all into one book, which was probably a stupid <laughs> thing to do, but I'm excited about it. But we can't wait to read it. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, but that's not till August. Next, uh, in two weeks, I have a new book out, uh, co-authored with Mary Higgins Clark, um, called Peace of My Heart. So that, that's just around the corner. So I'll, I'll be yet another author who's releasing a book uh, while we're all locked inside <laughs> for the most part. So no book tour, but I'll be doing some virtual events. I'm, I'm excited about that. It was, most people probably know that Mary um, Higgins Clark passed away in January um, earlier this year, but we were, I was glad we were able to finish the book. So it's nice to be able to get that out um, to readers. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, 2020 didn't, didn't start off so well with you know, a great loss like that to the thriller community and defense community. She was incredible. Can you tell us about your relationship with her? You know, how you work together? Yeah, so um, I was very, I still kind of have to pinch myself that I co-authored six books with, you know, literally the queen of suspense, Mary Higgins Clark, but um, she had an idea for a series of books. But, you know, once you write a series, you're committed to doing that once a year, or at least initially, um, but wanted to keep doing standalones. So was interested in collaborating with someone who had written a series before successfully, uh, who she might be able to work with. And so it's, it's a bizarre thing when you get a phone call and says, oh, are you interested in having lunch with Mary Agnes Clark to talk about writing a book together? Like, that's a very easy yes to accept for a lunch invitation. Um, so we initially just decided to write a couple of sample chapters to see if we could blend our voices and uh, whether we thought we could work together. And um, after doing that, we got really excited. You can't really write two sample chapters without kind of coming up with a story idea. So by the time we were done experimenting with it, we really, I think we could both envision the book. So we decided we would write that one book and see what happened. And um, we wound up writing six books together. Yeah, it's a great joy and a privilege. We understand um, a partner in crime of yours might have just entered the building. So let's welcome, you know. In I saw who was following me. I'm like, I'm a <laughs> ding dong. <laughs> okay, we know we're in trouble now. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> the party's officially begun, y'all. <laughs> y'all. Right? Y'all. Y'all. Hi, Karen. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Am I here? You are. Yeah. All right. What's going on? You guys been having fun without me? Well, Alifair's been telling us all about your latest exploits. Oh, which was that? <laughs> <laughs> just narrow off it the down. record. <laughs> She's just kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have somebody else here. Hi, Mike. How are you? Hey, hey. How are you guys? It's Hello. Like we're kind of, uh, you know, bumping in and out tonight. Just, you know, kind of covering each other off. And um, so how did you two first meet? Let's hear that before Alifair has to head off. Oh shit! How was that, Alifair? I know. I'm trying to remember which which year was that in... Miss America pageant that we were in. <laughs> <laughs> um, did we meet in Florida? Or did we meet in LA? Yes. I know. <laughs> I mean, it goes back. Well, you know, I when I met when I met Lisa Unger and Jeff. Like for years afterward, I said it was Lisa Gardner and told a really naughty story about her husband. <laughs> that I, I promised Lisa Unger I wouldn't repeat. And Lisa Gardner was like, why do you keep telling people this horrible story about my husband? And I'm like, oh, it's Lisa Unger. So, okay, so just, I already knew my name can't then. be trusted. I can't be trusted. We met in, we met in LA. I'm, okay. I'm going with that at the LA <gasps> Book Festival and then at the Mystery Bookstore after that. Yes, with uh, Carol Burnett. No, that we already knew each other by then. Oh, seriously? I knew you well enough by 
we met before that. But okay. We met a long time ago. I think we met when, so Ocean Unger is now like 16. We met when Ocean was like two. So yeah. I think we've known each other like 14 years. Oh, okay. That's my story. I scared the shit out of Carol Burnett though. That was hilarious. That's my story. She's like holding her purse. Cause I oh, was yeah. nuts. I went, wow. Straight up, straight up stalker. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Do you have any advice? I, ha I, have, the, I have the pictures to prove it. <laughs> so, Elephant, before you head off, any advice on how to, you know, interact with Karen? To, to, oh, no, Karen will just talk right over you. Don't even pretend. Like, she's just going to make fun of you, basically, for the next seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you, know, you don't know which Karen's going to show up. <laughs> Elephant, thank you. Much for she's going to tell the whole world the most embarrassing thing she knows about you for the next seven minutes. That's what's going to happen. Cool. <laughs> good We're luck. recording, so that's good. Thoughts and prayers. Nice to see you, Karen. <laughs> you too. A pleasure. Okay. I just wanted to nice get to see you all. Uh, thank you, Elifair. Um, before we dive into questions for Karen, I just want to give a shout out to the DeKalb Library Foundation and DeKalb County Public Library. We're also streaming tonight. Karen, yeah, you Kim, it's DeKalb. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Canadian. DeKalb. Yeah, sorry. No, no, don't correct me, please. The cab. Okay. So yes. Where does it come from, Karen? The cab? Oh, I'm sure it was like a Confederate soldier who lost in the the Battle of Atlanta, and they're like, let's name a city after him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <It's> troubles. <laughs> I don't know. I should know, um, but it is the cab. But it, some people do say to call. But it's like um, in uh, Alabama, they have Calliope, Alabama, instead of Calliope, and Mobile instead of Mobile. So. You're not, you're not going to get it right. Lafayette instead of Lafayette. <laughs> you know, we're like, ah, that doesn't sound right. Lafayette. <laughs> you can give me Southern speaking lessons sometime. We'll talk. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, you see, you heard Alifair saying y'all. You're welcome. <laughs> the influence is strong. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, whoop, whoop. I did interrupt you. Yay uh, for DeKalb. Yay. <laughs> My favorite library system. I give as much money as I can to them. Uh, and they're just great. They're doing all kinds of wonderful things for the community. You know, people don't really think about how important libraries are, but they're really the backbone of the community. So they're making sure kids have hotspots uh, so they can get online and do virtual schooling. They're making sure they got laptops, all kinds of things. So I'm a big supporter. Fantastic. So Karen, tell us, is everyone wants to know is will trent returning in 2021 he's returning in god what year is it kim 2022 <laughs> this is like the longest year of my life everybody <laughs> yeah um so yeah 2022 he'll be here with sarah and uh faith and uh it's a little f more focused on faith i, I kind of like to uh, do those sorts of books um but the next book I'm working on now is going to be out next year. And if anybody asks, I am almost finished. Hmm. Well, you spend an awful lot of time uh, thinking about crime, crime detection. So do you think in today's world, outside of maybe pure cyber crime, that it's possible to commit the perfect undetectable crime? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, it doesn't really have to be perfect or undetectable because, you know, uh, a lot of our resources uh, that we think we have, we don't actually have oh. as far as in the police department. And, you know, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation has this really fantastic lab they built like 20 years ago, but no one anticipated how heavy the equipment would be. So it started to sink, <laughs> um, you know. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk about defunding the police, and, but there are smart ways to fund the police that are better than what we're doing. You yeah. know, like, um, you know, maybe not a tank, maybe like some more DNA machines or, but, you know, a lot of people are surprised that most crimes solved by DNAs, at least in the state of Georgia, by DNA are burglaries. It's not rape because rapists use condoms. Uh, and it's really... You know, even in a crime scene where you can have a thousand fingerprints, there might only be one that's usable. And then if that person's not in the system, you're not going to find that person. Right. So yeah. it's not that hard to commit the perfect crime. I mean, you, my biggest advice is like have nothing to do with that person. You don't know them. 
<laughs> um, just like randomly pick somebody out and, and that should be your victim. Oh, <laughs> I'm write that down. <laughs> Great advice from Karen Flotter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't murder anybody you know. <laughs> Woo! Big mistake. The strangers in the train thing. Uh, so with respect to your writing, you do a lot of standalones, you do a series. Do you feel like it's almost like a breath of fresh air to do a standalone so you just go into another world and just have a break from the series? Or how do you feel about that? And in a perfect world, would you do a mix of both? Yeah, I like a mixture, you know, and I'm a love the one you're with kind of writer. So I like really love doing standalones when I'm doing standalones and I love doing series when I'm doing series. Um, you know, and sometimes I'll have like one person who's from the standalone in the series or the other way, you know, because I guess that's like a, a poly autographic uh, on my part. Uh, but I just, uh, I like, I love writing and I love writing the story I'm most passionate about. And that's what really directs me as far as what I'm going to write. Is it going to be a thrill, a standalone? Is it going to be whatever, you know, is it going to be a new series? Maybe, I don't know. We'll just see, we'll get into it. Where do you pick up your, 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 your ideas? I mean, wh where are you kind of pulling in from to make those decisions? Um, mostly I steal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, wow, Kim, how that's a really good idea. Let me see what I can. Nah. Um, you know, we're not as crime writers, we're not going to find a new way to murder someone that hasn't been done before. Yeah. I mean, I would hope not. Cause that means we're probably psychopaths. Um, which, I mean, honestly, we probably do have a couple of those. I mean, Steve Barry. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Liz, whoo. But, um, you know, I, I, it's not really the idea. It's how you implement it. You know, like one, one year Lee Child read my galley before I read his. And he's like, you know what? You're going to think this is hilarious. But we basically wrote about the same thing. Uh, and we did, but, you know, he brought a Reacher perspective to it and I brought a Will Trent perspective to it. So it's not the idea so much as how the idea works out. Hmm. Do you think, do you think, you know, you, you're in Georgia. Do you think if you were living in, say, L.A. or some other centrist kind of crime fiction area, do you think that would have changed the way that you storytell? I mean, where you live now, does that really influence how you tell it? I think so. I mean, anybody writing in LA, Mike Connolly's just going to kick your ass. Yeah. He's so <laughs> angry and violent. I mean, if you've ever seen that temper, he's like, don't even think about LA, which <laughs> is bullshit because he lives in Florida. But anyway, um, you know, I did when I first started writing, nobody was really writing about Atlanta except, um, you know, like Gone with the Wind, right? And so I really felt like I owned Atlanta and it was an opportunity to talk about it in a different way because a lot of people were under the impression that, you know, we were still like cashing out the civil war or, you know, wearing hoop skirts. And, um, you know, I go barefoot a lot, but it's more like um, a lifestyle. Um, but I, I wanted to show uh, the city for what it is. It's very multicultural. Uh, it's very cosmopolitan. I mean, Coca-Cola is headquartered here, as you know, and it we've through them we get a lot of people from Belgium and the Netherlands and you know that part of Europe who come here and they're like, wow, weather is so much better here. You actually can see the sun. I'm going to stay here for a while. <laughs> um, so you know, I wanted to talk about that city. I'm a minority in Atlanta. Um, we're 65% African American. We have the largest African American middle class of any American major American city. And that's because we have historically black colleges and universities who churn out doctors and lawyers and professionals and, you know, they stay here and it's yeah. great because they're, they're a great tax base. Um, but, you know, yeah. that's what I wanted to write about was the city that I saw. That's wonderful, Karen. Um, now, speaking of committing crimes, okay, the next guest is probably going to be able to solve. So maybe you can help us work. Oh, dear God. <laughs> Why do you keep Hello, following nice me, you. Kathy Rikes? How are you? I can hardly hear you. Is that my problem? Yes. Are you, turn your hearing aids up. Can you <laughs> yeah, hear me? Yeah. They don't let you go out and do any events without checking in with me first, right? Oh, the, that's right. Yeah. You're kind of my keeper. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You're I'm my adult up. sponsor. <laughs> How do we do this? We hear you, Kathy. You're good. I'm figuring this out. Yeah. 
Yeah, just hit that volume button for you. Volume, volume. Look on your keyboard, Kathy. There you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're good. We were talking about committing the perfect crime, and Karen thinks it's quite possible as long as you pick a stranger. Um, how do you feel, given your you know incredible background in forensics? Pick a stranger to kill, you mean, or to rob, or to, um, yeah, sure, I whatever. think that's a good way to do it. Yeah, I mean, because when somebody gets murdered, it's always the boyfriend or the family or the husband that they go to first. Mm -hmm. So if you just pick a random stranger, yeah. yeah. And then I'd take them way out in the middle of the ocean and drop them, weight them down and drop them. That's actually why Kathy wanted to meet me, because I'm like, you know, I've never met Kathy Rikes before, but I've got this idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I managed to keep it that way for years. And then somehow we, yeah, yeah. I, couldn't, I yeah. couldn't avoid her. She was there somewhere at Thriller Fest or something, right? Well, I didn't say I was good at murder. I just thought I could come up with a good murder. Um, well, and yeah, that's true. But that's what we do, right? Every book, we come up with a good murder, but not good enough because the bad guy gets caught. Poor girl. Mm. Right. Well, I think you guys should write a book together. That would be very exciting indeed. But listen, Karen, I apologize, but I'm going to have to move along and really appreciate you stopping in and always a joy to see your smiling face and, and, and you always lighten the mood and make me laugh. I love it. Um, right. have a great night and, and we cannot wait for the next novel. Absolutely. And looking forward to Kathy's next one, Dim Bones. Fantastic. It's, oh, dear God in heaven, it is not Dim Bones. She keeps insisting it's going to be called Dim Bones. It's not, ever, ever. That's how you pronounce it, I think, and when you're in the South. Dim Bones? Yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. Only when you go to a rib joint, you know, then you might say, give me an order of Dim Bones. But. Oh, man. It's, it's a joy. I just want to give a quick shout out to our producer tonight, Jeff Ayer, who's dying and laughing in my ear. And I, I love the fact that we're having a, a great time. Oh, Kim's had a little bit of technical difficulty. Uh-oh, somebody froze. Yeah, I know. Kathy, how are you? Good to see you. I am very good. I'm excellent. I did, this is my, I just got off an airplane look, so I'm not. Well, you're, 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 you're doing an excellent job. That security oh. just didn't rough you up enough, apparently. I just flew from Washington, D.C. to Charlotte and landed. I mean, I just got home like 10 minutes ago. So Oof. this is what you guess. So. Well, God bless you for coming on here. Kim, how are you back? Well, thank you. I apologize. You know how it is with uh, technology. And of course, yeah. so anything can happen. It's getting That's right. I apologize. I was asking Kathy about if you could kindly tell us about the bone code. I would love to hear more. What you oh, about. the bone code. Um, yeah, yeah, I think the release date has now been bumped to summer. So it'll be July rather than March. Um, okay. What should I tell you about the bone code? Uh, Tempe's in a much better place <laughs> than she was in the <laughs> of bones. She's all better. And um, it has to do with genome editing. And now I like to look at when we have these technologies, but we don't necessarily have legislation to regulate these technologies. Or even if we do, what if you have some rogue villain who decides to take these technologies and use them for nefarious purposes. Right. So I did a lot of research on human genome editing for this book. And that's right up my alley too. Um, what did you find out from an ethics standpoint when you were doing your research for that? Because you have law, but then you also have ethics. And did you see any differences in those arenas? Yeah, well, a lot of the world, yes. And everything isn't covered, but most scientists in this area of microbiologists, geneticists, whatever, in the world have agreed that there are certain things we're not gonna do. Like we're not going to create designer babies. We're not right. going to, and what gave me the idea for the book are the, chi the scientists in China, three of them, I guess it was, who went ahead and did it anyway, instead mm. of just you know editing genes in order to cure a specific disease in a specific person, but to go ahead and change the genome and that has much more significant re implications because then it's passed on. It's a genetically inherited change. Right. So that affects the gene pool. So um, there are, as you say, there are actually laws varying from country to country to regulate it, but then there are also ethical agreements among scientists. Right, and then you also get the you get the cultural differences. Well, one culture believes that it's the ethics are maybe not up to the same you know, position as another culture. So you're talking about different parts of the world, not, not agreeing on what the ethics should be. 
Well, that's true. And, you know, like in the U.S., we have different parts of the country that don't agree on what ethics in certain areas should be or le legislation. So, right. We well, Pat, um, would love to um, have you help us um, bring on our next guest, who is actually Lisa Unger. And um, I'm sure you guys have connected before because I have a feeling Alifair, Karen, and Lisa all know each other well. And uh, I love it. Look, it's the. Hey. It's the the white background, ladies. It's beautiful. Look at those books in the beautiful kitchen or books. Oh, wow, we almost match. We yeah. have we've gone for the same uh, color tones here. Can you hear us okay? She's just rolling it out there. She's figuring we have out a, there. A glitch. Are we good? Are we? Lisa, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we we're can. good. I can. Yeah. So, so uh, wh when did you and Kathy first meet? Um, we met at Boucher, BoucherCon ah. um, with Alifair and Karen. Um, wow, where was that? It was they all blend in my head. It's I think St. I Louis. <laughs> St. Louis. Is it St. Louis? Did I, go I think there? so. Maybe was it, that question was for me, New right? York? <laughs> New York, maybe. I one of those cities where they have hotels. It was right. There was one a hotel. Of I remember that. It was a bar. Restaurant. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we met um, at a party, and then uh, Alfair and Karen and Kathy and I had. I remember it being a really wonderful dinner, but I honestly do not remember where. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Anyways, Kathy, thank you finally for joining us. Such a, a pleasure. I know you just flew in, so that was very nice of you to take the time to speak with us. Um, extremely excited about the Bone Code and um, hope to have you back on the show when it comes out so we can delve into it deeper. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Good Kathy. See you take all. care. Bye. 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 Do I have to do anything here or do you just shoot me off? You can shoot off yourself. You don't have to wait for us. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure I know how to do that. <laughs> All right, I can figure it out. All right, here we go. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya. Loves doing that. Like Jerry Springer bouncers. Uh, <laughs> go, go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so excited to see that your book, Confessions on the you know, 745, is absolutely tearing up the charts everywhere. And especially in my country, Canada. Love it. Yeah. Did you have something to do with that, Kim? I've been telling <laughs> So can you tell us a bit about the book? Yeah, so um, Confessions on the 745 is kind of loosely based or like loosely inspired by Strangers on a Train, which is the one of my favorite novels by Patricia Highsmith, probably better known as the Al Alfred Hitchcock film. Um, but you know, when we first meet and when we first begin Confessions, we meet Selena Murphy and she's like a working mom, you know, young working mom, and she has had a really bad day, like an awful day. And uh, of course, you know, because she's had this terrible day when she gets on her commuter train home, it stalls, it dies on the tracks. And she is like sort of stuck, like just waiting. And she finds herself next to a beautiful stranger. Mm. And this stranger strikes up a conversation with a confession. And this confession, maybe it's the terrible day that she had or the drink that she shouldn't have had or the dark of the train it leads Selena to share a very dark secret of her own, something she's never told anyone. And so then the train comes back to life and she's headed back into the world and um, she's embarrassed. She thinks, oh my God, why did I share this secret part of myself with this total stranger? And she hopes, hopes that she's never gonna see the woman from the train ever again. But of course she will. Well, of course you have to. Of course. I mean, yeah. yeah, never see her again. Everything's fine. No, that's not a book. It's a novella. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know you have a real interest in, in Carl Jung's uh, teachings and his, you know, his kind of foundation in, in psychology. Um, how did his work, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago influence your writing? Where does he fit into all of that? Well, you know, so I've always been obsessed with Carl Jung and his ideas, and I've done a lot of like sort of just reading all my life, you know, I've always had a very strong interest in psychology. And so, of course, you know, these types of ideas, they, you know, they find their way into to all the work, you know, most especially, maybe in this case, you know, the work of the shadow, you know, Carl Jung, 
you know, his idea is that, you know, the more audaciously, you know, the light is presented in someone that the dark, the darker, the shadow within. And so, of course, you know, there is, that's a, that's a main, that's a major theme in, in most of, in most of my, my novels and most especially in this one, of course, you know, this is like a very, you know, Young was writing, you know, many, many years ago, many, um, you know, decades ago, but his work is, is so relevant because, you know, the, the psyche hasn't changed, hasn't changed that much, right. you know, and so specifically in this book, I think you see kind of like a modern, um, like a sort of a modern exploration of Jungian ideas and that, you know, like Selena is like, she's very good at like presenting this image of herself like in social media you know she even thinks of herself as being instagrammable and so she's presented this very perfect sort of a, you know version of her life for everybody to see and it has um unfortunately in some ways allowed her to like live behind this veneer and allow the sort of the rot and the darkness in her marriage to kind of you know undermine the foundation right and so you know like that's kind of i mean that's sort of like a modern you know sort of a, a modern interpretation of Jungian, of Jungian thought okay i really respect and admire that you know the way you approach the books that way because i always feel when i read yours i learn something and i also feel psychologically provoked which yeah. is, i love because i you know I, I feel like when we read we should experience and entertainment but also grow from it and put the book down and that's why I feel like your books stay with me quite a bit because of that you know oh thank you thank you yeah I mean for me you know character is king and you know, every novel flows from character and you know I very much you know that's like my overriding curiosity right is the psychology of my characters you know every book is like sort of a question answering a question that I have about the human psyche. I mean, the mind, you know, the human mind is the ultimate mystery. You know, we know more about space than we know about our own brains. And so I, you know, there's, there's no end to the, the exploration that you can do, you know, in fiction and in life, you know, when you're talking about the human psyche, what makes us who we are, what makes us tick. These are the things that fascinate me. Nice love- well, to come through for sure. Thank you. So Lisa, um, maybe you can help us welcome the next who happens to be from across the pond, Mr. Oh. Peter James. <laughs> Wait, who, who is it? I didn't hear. Peter James. Oh, hi. Yeah. Did you, have you met Lisa Unger before, Peter? No, hi. Hi. I think, hi. We, met- I think we did meet somewhere. We met somewhere fun. I don't remember where. Fest, I think. Where is it? I think we met on a great panel in Thriller Fest sometime. I think so. I think we did. Nice to see you. You too. I love your glasses. They're very cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I love all your little hats back there. Yes, my I collect I collect uh, police memorabilia. Oh, you. That's cool. Uh, my office is a kind of police museum. Oh wow! I love that. How cool! It's perfect Zoom studio too. You really did a great job with that. Thank you. <laughs> If anyone needs a police hat or anything like that, Peter yeah, should go. Yeah, if you got want to it. borrow a, <laughs> Indian, Russian, uh, Australian, um, Hong Kong, China. That's uh, okay. Chinese ones are very small. Anyway, how's everything in America right now? Well, this is an exciting mm-hmm. night. Oh, um, it's you know, it's a wild, it's a wild ride here in the U.S. You know, we're just sort of, you know, I'm also, I, I also happen to be in Florida. So it's an, you know, extra wild ride down here in Florida. So we're just, you know, um, doing our best and muddling through and, what's you know. What's your prediction, Lisa? Are we, are we not supposed to be talking about this? Yeah, we, we are, we are a politics-free zone. <laughs> okay, right. Good. That's a really good thought. I literally I came about back nothing to else in England for one. five days. And, uh, so let's, I let's, let's, we were supposed no, to have a blowhorn, by the way, just so you guys know. We were actually <laughs> supposed to have a blowhorn. David Brown, who came up with this idea, I thought he was going to send me one. If anyone would talk politics, we were supposed to blow it. And um, <laughs> I'm not going to name names. It's neither one of you. But there was a few people I was kind of hoping if I got that that blowhorn that might just go there. Just so You I were just like waiting. Off. You're like, I am yeah, definitely yeah, yeah, going to yeah. do that. 
Well, why prediction for all things is light and love and healing. So that's Amen. all. I, that's all. That's all I'm going to say. And let's hope that that's true for everybody. I remember I was living in Toronto in Canada in um, 1974 when Trudeau got elected. And I always remember on his election night, he said, "No matter how it, strange it seems to you or I, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should." Absolutely, I that's truly great. believe that. I truly do. I truly do. And Young would say the same. Carl Young would say the same. Everything is happening as, as it should and it's unfolding as it will. And it may be not what you want in your lifetime, but we're all, it's all moving in the right direction. Or in hey, the life, life may not be the party we want, but while we're here, we should dance. And also, it can't get much worse than 2020. Don't ever say don't that. Say don't that. say don't that. Say that. <laughs> Listen, I'll be dancing in the second it hits 2021. So let's just hope. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for, for stopping by. we got to keep the show going. Absolutely. But uh, so lovely to talk with you. Great talking to you guys. Hey, Lisa, I thought we were going to get to talk. Bye. I know. Well, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll get you on Twitter. <laughs> we'll do our own Zoom. So, Bye. Take care. So Peter. Stay, stay. Uh, we yeah. just caught up a couple weeks ago. We shot an episode of Thriller Talk that drops in a few weeks. How the heck are you? I'm really, well, I'm particularly good today because I just had the news about three hours ago that my latest Roy Grace novel in paperback went to number one, making it my 17th uh, Roy Grace number one on the Sunday Times bestseller list. So I'm in a massively happy mood today. Congra what, 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 how many? 17 number ones? 17. Does it get old? Do you just expect yes. it now? Or are you just like, it's going to happen? I mean, it'll hit. No, I, 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 never do, expect, right? I never expect it. I'm always nervous as hell on the day that the chart news is, comes out. And tonight I'm just, I'm just on cloud nine because 17 was my mom's lucky number. And it's oh. my wife's lucky number as well. But I, I, I kind of pinch myself to believe it. So I'm, I'm I think really, I might make it my lucky number too. It seems to be working out for you pretty good. <laughs> No, so really. listen, I got a question for you. A couple of weeks ago, you came on uh, with us. We shot a whole different episode and you told me some of the craziest stories I've ever heard for the purpose of authors doing research, right? Um, you once locked yourself in a coffin. And, and when I say locked yourself in, you literally paid someone to put you in a coffin and screw it shut. So you could experience that for one of your books. You did the James Bond stunt. Uh, what you got lined up for 2021, man? Well, I'm trying to stay alive this time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, I, I the, the, the coffin stump was my first Roy Grace novel, Dead Simple. And the, 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 in the story, um, the book starts with a, a bachelor party and they decide they're gonna pay the groom to be back big time for all the bad pranks he's done and all the others. And they've made this horrible plan where they're going to get him drunk and they're going to drive him out in a van into remote woods where they've dug a grave already. They've got a coffin and they're going to put him in it. And, and this all goes according to plan. They drive him out there. They put him in the coffin. They screw down the lid. They give him a pornographic magazine and a bottle of whiskey and a walkie-talkie, and they drop him in the grave, cover it up, and they're going to come back in two hours' time and dig him back up. And they drive off, and they're taunting him, and they hit a cement truck head-on, and they're all wiped out. And there's one person who wasn't in the van, who should have been, who knows where he is, and has got a very good reason to keep quiet. And for much of the book, this character, Michael Harrison, is inside the coffin. And I, I wanted to know what it really felt like to be in a coffin. Because most of us, you know, we don't get to experience it and then write about it afterwards. And I asked the firm of funeral directors if they would be kind enough to make me a coffin that was my size, and then put me in it and screw the lid down and leave me for 30 minutes. And they thought, okay, strange guy, but okay, we'll do that. And I rocked up there. And I, it was a small family firm, and the only person there was this 90-year-old great-granddad. All the rest of the family, they'd gone out to funerals and to recover bodies. And he said, oh, yes, I forgot you were coming, Mr. James. You want to be put in the coffin, don't you? And the lid screwed down. 
said, are you sure? I said, and I, I checked with a coroner earlier who said that if you're in a well-made coffin with a lid screw down, you've probably got three to four hours of air. So long as you breathe calmly, but if you panic and hyperventilate, you could knock that down to 40 minutes. Yeah, just stay um, real relaxed in the coffin that's screwed shut, sure. Yeah, have you ever, you want to try, I got in this thing, I, was, I don't know why, I thought it would be the size of an elevator, but you know, the sides are pressing in, and then he, he says, you really sure? And I said, I'm sure. He puts the lid down, it's like one inch from my face. No. Nope. Then I hear this, <laughs> he screws the things on. And my first thought is, what if there's a spider in here? <laughs> that was your first <laughs> thought, you were worried about spiders. I, I'm so claustrophobic, I don't want to be in a coffin even when I'm dead. So uh, I can't, my first thought wouldn't be spiders. It would be get out of here. I can't believe you did that. That was my second thought. I thought, what if he goes across the road to Starbucks and gets run over or he drops dead? <laughs> it, was, it was the longest 30 minutes of my life. Peter, yeah. uh, we, we have Greg Hurwitz. He's coming on in. I'm, I can't wait to ask Greg if he's ever hopped in a coffin and had it screwed shut for uh, the purpose of, of research. You probably know Greg pretty well, don't you? Hi, Greg. He's coming and in now. Peter, just before we, uh, uh, you know, welcome Greg, I was just wondering, with respect to you, you said a cough in your size. So do they actually measure you, like your width of your shoulders? I'm intrigued to know how they measure you. Yeah, they took the width of my shoulders, my length. Um, you know, then I get a choice of different woods. <laughs> uh, rosewood, oak, you know, what kind of nail, what kind of screws, what kind of handles, brass, you know, silver. Uh, you can go pretty fancy. You can even have it decorated. I, I, I did think of having something in an Aston Martin shape, but. <laughs> well, welcome yeah. back, Greg, Sorry. by the way, who just joined us. Greg is on. Greg, sorry we are a little late getting to you. Peter was just telling us a story about research that he did for a book where he had himself locked in a casket that was screwed shut. Um, what is the craziest thing you've done in the name of research? I don't, do we have Greg on audio? Can anyone hear him? Got it. So, uh, we got, got me? We got Probably Greg. the weirdest thing I've Greg. done is jump in. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. We, you're good. Mr. Orphan X, here he is. Yeah, so jumping into a Zoom call where what was being discussed was the breadth of Peter James's shoulders, I think is the weirdest thing that's happened to me. I have no <laughs> idea what was going on with you people. Um, probably when I went undercover in a mind control cult uh, for an early book. But I've look, I've done, like Peter, I love that story, by the way, but I'm more claustrophobic. So I don't think I have the, the spine for that one, Peter. But I've gone up and stunt airplanes. I've, I've gone on the demolition ranges with seals to blow up cars to see what they look like. Um, I've been there where they've dismembered um, bodies at hospitals to park them out to different departments. Um, you know, like the heads go to neurology and the joints go to the orthopods. Um, so I like to get rangy. I like to get there up close so that, you know, as, as I'm sure Peter was telling you, if we do it ourselves, we can describe it in a way that has a different ring of verisimilitude, right? And that's what keeps us you know, I did, for instance, I did some mixed martial arts training. I don't mean to imply well, but since I started Orphan X with a guy who would on occasion like put me in a chokehold and there's a different quality of pain when you're being choked unconscious than what you think it might be, right? And if I go through that, I can describe it differently than just say, you know, and then Orphan X saw black, right? That's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the cliches. So I'll go anywhere and do anything. It's a good excuse to get up to some good trouble, you know? No, no, I don't know. I don't do any of that. Peter, we got to keep the show going, man. It's so good to catch up with you. Uh, we'll say bye for now and talk soon with you. Great to see you, Jeff. And lovely to see you again, Greg. Yeah. Okay. Take care, Peter. Yeah. Ciao. So Greg, I love the fact that you're a massive fan of Shakespeare. So I'd love to hear where you got that passion and you know, what, how does that influence your writing in today's world? You know, like most things, it made, it wasn't premeditated. It made no sense moving forward, right? I just went after and studied, and this is something I've always done. I've just studied and, and gone to things that drew me in and that I loved. And then in hindsight, I look back and there's like a beautiful pattern of where those interests and passions have taken me. So I, I really emphasize my academic work was I did Freudian and Jungian analysis of Shakespearean tragedy. That's what I was most interested in. 
And so that's just because I loved it, right? But looking back on it, and I was an English and psychology major in college because I thought, you know, I started writing my first book really young, a really shitty rough draft of my first book when I was like 19. But in hindsight, you know, Freud's case studies are short stories, right? He won the Nobel in 1899 for literature. Like it was an insult almost, right? Because he thought he was a scientist. Um, I mean, Jung only writes about archetypal narrative and myth. And then Shakespeare's tragedies, when you look at them, what are they? They're highly convention bound, narrative driven tales of lust, intrigue and murder, right? Designed to appeal to the broadest possible cross section of society to sell out the Globe Theater. They're straight up thriller templates, right? And so it's funny because moving forward, you know, early on, I'd get all these questions of like, why would you study, you know, why would you study Shakespeare and then write thrillers? And it's all, it's all the same stuff. You know, there's all, that's where a lot of the grounding of it came from, for me and my understanding of narrative and how it works. Greg, I just read, actually, I just wrote the review. It goes up soon, A Prodigal Son, your next Orphan X book, book number six, I believe. That's a January. Better be good, Stack, or I'm going to kill you in the next book again. Listen, listen, okay. I, I sound like such an idiot every year when I have to write your review, because ever since, uh, book two, I'm like, this is Hurwitz's best book. And then you keep topping yourself. Like, I almost wish you'd write a bad one just so I could like, well, this one wasn't quite as good. And then come back the next year and be like, now it's his best book. Um, so here's the thing. A few years ago, you wrote uh, Out of the Dark. And I thought, well, he'll never top this. This is the book Greg Hurwitz will be remembered for. And then you were kind of like, well, watch this. Um, do you feel pressure to top yourself each year? I, yeah, mostly because of you, Stack. So <laughs> basically every year, you know, you write, this is the book, you know, no matter what Hurwitz does for the rest of his <laughs> time on this ball of dirt, this is the only thing he'll be remembered for. And then I'm yeah. like, oh, damn it, right? So now what do I do? Um, no, but you've been, you've been very flattering and very supportive. And I appreciate that a lot. It's a, it's a good thing to have a, a connection with a reader like you, where it seems like you get a lot of what I'm putting down. And that's, that's been cool, you know, cause if you ever don't, you'll certainly tell me and, you know, 20,000 of our closest friends. Yes. But, um, you know, I do feel that I do feel like every time I want to be scared, I want to write, I want to be writing into a space that I don't know that I can pull it off. And I changed the, the sort of structure and the format and the dynamics of the books a lot in ways that I never feel like I'm writing I'm writing into something that's familiar. And I'd say with the Orphan X series, one of the things that's been really amazing for me, and you know, I started those, I, Orphan X was my, I think it was my 16th novel, is I always used to think about, like we were just talking about Shakespeare, right? And how in hindsight, you can see how things make sense. And I used to look back on books and I'd realize a year after I wrote them, what I was dealing with and why I wrote them. And it's kind of, it's clear as day, it would be obvious. With Orphan X, one thing that's very interesting is I feel like I'm kind of catching up to it where more and more in real time, I'm aware that I'm trying to work out certain notions about the world or myself or, you know, what power means, where do we define meaning, right? Where do we find, you know, how, how do we approach things? And it's happening like as I'm writing the books and I'm more, I'm more aware of the things I'm dealing with rather than writing them where it's almost... A separate part of me and then I come out the end and look back at it so it makes it a lot more challenging and in some ways it makes it a lot more threatening because I don't know I don't know a lot of what I'm doing and trying to figure out until it's happening and there's always that fear that I'm not going to figure it out and it'll just be you know a pile of pages that don't go anywhere well you do a great job I mean you really, you really do a terrific job. Orphan X, one of my favorite characters. Again, the new book, which by the way, our producer Jeff Ayers, who, uh, you know, he writes for AP. He's a critic as well. Just told me in my ear, he does get better every year and Prodigal Son is his best yet. So it's not just me. Um, you definitely are getting better, man. I don't know. Listen, I don't know how you top yourself, but I will say this. I tell everyone on Twitter, I'm really honestly done saying he'll never top this book because I look like an idiot every year. So now I'm sort of just like, eh, he'll top it next year for sure. So no pressure uh, as you get going on the next one here, but uh, certainly love the new one, man. Can't wait for readers to get their hands on it. Well, thank you. I need the pressure, Ryan. You can't let the pressure up because then I'm, then I'm going to write something horrible. <laughs> you know? Well, listen, we don't want that. Um, no, I mean, you got to keep your foot on the gas. I don't know. The challenge of getting better each year seems like it would be really daunting. And, and there's so many writers 
doing it now at a high level, even more so than before, you know, you go back to the heyday of some of the, some of the, the guys that sort of paved the way. And I mean, I don't want to name names, but they would sort of kind of lose the magic after a few books. And now there's so many guys that are like 18, 19 books in or even farther. And they're just keep taking it to another level. Um, so I'm excited to see where this series goes. It feels like the new one, by the way, is I don't want to give anything away, but it feels like it's come full circle a little bit. Yeah, it's a different, um, it's a tough one to talk about without spoilers. But it really you know, is. Yeah, it really is. Those of you who read Into the Fire know that it ends with Orphan X, with Evan getting a phone call through his roam zone that's untraceable and he answers it and he says, do you need my help? And the woman says, yes, Evan. It's, and he says, how do you know my name? Who is this? And she says, it's your mother. It's the mother he never thought that he had or we don't know if she in fact is. And so I thought, what I want to do after the sort of scope of out of the dark or the scope of into the fire to start with a story that's um, that's unbelievably intimate and that allows Evan to travel back into his past. We get to see for the first time, you know, where he came from. We get to see that foster home. We get to meet Charles Van Skyver when he was a kid. Right. So there's a lot of pieces that I wanted to show the fabric of what he's made of. That's him tracing his way back into his own history and the pieces that made him who he is in the context of trying to figure out who this woman is, if it's his mom, if she can be trusted, you know, um, and this enormous plot and, and intrigue that he winds up entangled in as he always does. Well, it was so hard to write the review because you can't say anything without giving it away. Uh, it's like the trickiest review to write. Now we wanted to pair you by the way, there's overlap if you know how the format works. Chris Haughty, you are an author and screenwriter. He is a screenwriter and author. Chris Haughty is now with us. Chris, how you doing? Showing off with good, that. Good, good. Yes. Hello. <laughs> hi, 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 everyone. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, how doing you? well. <clears throat> Hello, Greg. <laughs> Who won the World Series, by the way? I don't Bob recall. Cameron. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't know. That's all right. I'll take it off. I know. <laughs> Greg, you're a fan, right? You're a Los Angeles. Oh no, I'm from Northern Cal. So uh, I have, I'm the most hated baseball figure in LA cause I'm from, I'm kind of half from Boston. So I love the Red Sox and I'm from Northern Cal. So I love the Giants and everyone in LA <laughs> seems to be is, is Dodgers or Yankees. But I will say this, Chris, that this year because of my unbelievable love of Mookie Betts yeah, the idiocy of the Red Sox trading them, which is something that only the Red Sox could commit a blunder. That's that. So, so Mookie is the second Dodger I will ever love after Jackie Robinson. I love Jackie Robinson. He's like the second coming of Babe Ruth in more ways than one. I that's mean. right. And so I don't have the same toxicity and venom that's usually reserved for you people. Well, you know, you have. I think you have a few years as a Giants fan to, so to to rebuild and you can become a temporary Dodger fan I think uh, I don't know I don't yeah, yeah with the Red Sox we won enough we I've won enough to just have to be quiet and be grateful in the even, last 10 years even Vin Scully is a, a Giants fan and you know I mean he's he's Mr. Dodger so it, it can work so, welcome to baseball talk uh yeah, we, here we are folks right. ESPN too or it's are radio you guys still here Mike and Sean come on we're Chris here and I are gonna talk we're gonna talk about some preseason trades yeah absolutely <laughs> well especially this last day too hey Greg thanks for coming on pal thank good you both you. Chris, talk to you soon Greg good to see you nice yeah, to meet we'll you later. yeah you guys all take care yeah thanks take care hey Chris how are you hey look the crew I feel this is good. I feel, you know, in familiar territory. It's like back, back in the bosom here. <laughs> back in the oh, bosom. Hey, you know, we're streaming to Warwick's Facebook page. I think yes. that's one of your very. That's, that's how I've been watching. Today. Is that right? Awesome. Yes. Oh, congrats. go Warwick's. So a little hey, you know, Let's get right to it, uh, Chris. Um, you know, your first novel, Deep State, you bring a, a mountain of storytelling experience from a screenwriter standpoint. And so uh, maybe for the audience, you can uh, discuss, you know, what part of the process of writing a novel that was enjoyable to you that might not compare specifically to a screenplay? Uh, well, there's a lot of things. Uh, and most generally, it's the freedom that's involved. Uh, screenwriting is very formulaic and there are many, many cooks in that kitchen. Um, so, I think just out of the gate, what's so great about writing novels is 
you know, you really are your own boss. Uh, you have a great editor who's backstopping you, but you know, you, you run the shop and, and it's up to you uh, to uh, make all those choices. And then creatively, um, there's just so much more going on in a novel than in a screenplay. Not that screenplays aren't, aren't very, very difficult to write and get it correct, but um, uh, you know, the, there's more real estate, you can get inside your, your character's heads, you can play around with time in a way that most studio execs probably aren't gonna appreciate in a screenplay. So, <laughs> you know, really the, the list is, is endless. Yeah. You know, Deep State is a 2020 book, which floors me because we got an advanced copy. So I feel like I've been living with that book for a long time. And yeah. about once a week, I'll see somebody on Twitter say, oh, I have not read that yet, which, you know, like how, how have you missed it? <laughs> um, but you, with, with Deep State, you introduced Haley Chill, which is one of my favorite protagonists that's come along in, in recent years. Um, could you tell our our audience who maybe hasn't read Deep State, both of you out there, um, a little bit about Haley Chill and what where she came from? Well, I, I've told this story many times and, and I'll, I'll try and keep it brief because maybe a lot of the audience has already heard this, but um, the idea, I mean, I, I sort of wrote uh, fan fiction without realizing, or at least a, a sort of a vague sense of fan fiction because the inspiration came from a movie I had seen based on a great book called uh, Winter's Bone. Uh, and that yeah. character uh, played by Jennifer Lawrence um, just seemed like such a great character. And I've been writing at the time, I had been writing a lot of female characters uh, for screenplays. And so it seemed like a natural uh, transition you know, I don't want to. I didn't want to make that transition more difficult than it uh, already could be. I was intimidated by the whole idea of writing a novel, so I I knew I wanted my protagonist to be a female, and I, I think uh, that character uh, from that book and in that movie and Jennifer Lawrence's performance was percolating back there somewhere. Um, so I took aspects of that character. Uh, and then, you know, brought my own uh, uh, thoughts uh, into the mix. Uh, so that was really the beginning of it. Uh, but then, you know, the writing, the characters come out in the writing, the right, you know, as you develop your story and work on the outline and, and think about things that are happening, more and more stuff gets glommed on to that, uh, to that character as you go along. And the process is still continuing. I, I mean, the second book is coming out this January. I've been working on the third book. And I continue to discover more and more things about this uh, really great character. Well, speaking of your next book, you know, you, you have all the, the luxury of, of time with the first book. How did you find the process uh, from book one to book two? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find that time difference? You know, you, you're kind I've of got on one a, too. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder where we got that. You're kind um, of on a time. You're kind of on a, on a shorter leash now. So how you know, did you find it, that? It, it's interesting. I, I, the first one was a lark. I mean, the first book, um, it was it was just a lark. A, a, a scr another screenwriting uh, friend of mine had uh, was talking about writing a, a novel. I had never tried to write a novel before, yeah. and so I said, "What the hell?" And so that really kind of permeated the whole process. It's sort of like, "What the hell? Try anything," um, because I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, with the second book, uh, you know, there's a little bit more pressure uh, on on the process. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it was it was somewhat more difficult in in that I was just more careful. I wasn't so kind of like, you know, uh, yeah. let out of the, you know, let out of the barn in the pasture kicking up my heels. I was kind of <laughs> like, all right, well, this one's got to be pretty good because uh, everyone said the first one was good. And um <laughs> And so it just took more time, uh, but you know I'm really happy the way it came out, and really relieved that you know uh, my wonderful editor uh, Emily Bestler. Uh, one of the first things she said uh, about the manuscript was that uh, that I had uh, that she liked it more than the first, and uh, and that that reaction has kind of you know, it hasn't been read by a lot, of, a whole bunch of people, but more and more people say the same thing that uh, they really feel like this one kicked it up a notch. So um, uh, even more good, pressure man. now to perform. <laughs> for <that book. laughs> well, I don't know how long I can keep this up. Um, I don't know. 
Yeah. I mean, well, one of the things that I've been so intimidating about watching all your other guests today is like all these authors who have 16, 17 and, you know, 18 books and, and, and my one book. So uh, including uh, our, your next guest, another uh -huh. very prolific author, successful author. So I've decided to come up with a new number. I, I wrote one teen. I've, I've written one teen book and I'm working on my two teens. So beautiful. Uh, yeah. Well, everybody's going to love the second one as much as the first one, I think. But Chris, we appreciate your time tonight. Um, best of luck with, with Savage Road and, and beyond. Yeah. And we'll talk to you soon. Hey, thanks very much, guys. And Take care, Chris. Take care. You know. Have a good Welcome, one. Megan. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi. Thanks for being yeah, part of this. Absolutely. Of so um, I want to get right into it because we're, we're so small with time. Um, you write psychological suspense for adults and young authors. Um, or young adults, I should say. Um, what's the delineation between those two genres? What, what in your mind is sort of the point of no return where <laughs> going one way or the other and, and what are the challenges of each? That's actually, a, it's a really good question and something I think about a lot as well because I don't necessarily approach them any differently. Um, the way I think about them is really just in terms of the main character and the story being filtered through their perspective. Um, and that's really the, the only way that I kind of approach each one differently. I write first person. So it's really about, am I, is a story kind of suited for a character who's experiencing something kind of for the first time, um, trying to put all of these events into a context for the first time, figuring out what their relationship is with the world. And, um, and then I think about in the adult perspective, you're sort of filtering these experiences through 10 or 20 or 30 years of lived experience that kind of, I guess, colors their way that they are, they're seeing all these events. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really the main difference. I don't think about content wise being different. It's really just the main character's perspective um, and, and how that, I guess it does feel different in tone because of that, because I'm writing either from what I would imagine a 17 year old experiencing something or a 30 something year old experiencing something. Um, but those are really the main differences. I, there are thrillers in both. Um, I think one of the challenges in maybe the young adult genre is, you know, I'll get notes back from my editors sometimes where it'll say like, well, why don't they call 911 here? Or why don't they call their parent here? And I guess that's kind of a, one of the struggles or, or challenges with young adult is why don't they reach out to a parent or an adult in this given time? And, and so I think one of the things I try and do in that case is, you know, make the adults maybe part of the issue or, you know, you're kind of trying to take away their, that safety net that's there for them. Hmm. Your 2019 novel, The Last House, was a Reese Witherspoon book club pick. Holy crap! What 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 sort of impact did that have on 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 you as a career? Obviously, book sales and all that stuff. What what did you feel and sense and the scene since that happened? Yeah, I mean, that was it was such an incredible experience all around. Um, so I I kind of had like a little bit of a heads up that it was going to be coming, and mm. so I knew I couldn't say anything until that point but I was ready like I knew it was going to be announced and I was ready to like screenshot it and send it to my whole family and everyone I knew and by the time I had done that half my family had already texted me they were like Megan did you see did you see <laughs> with your book? so I was like wow you know so everybody I know is kind of you know, I, I was a huge follower of Reese's book club. I am. So it really, you know, it was so exciting to see, you know, in the comments, everyone was saying, you know, my book club is going to read this book together. And so it really kind of opened up, you know, the readership to all these book clubs. I love visiting with book clubs. So it's such a great experience. I think that's carried over, um, you know, to my next book where all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm able to talk with all these other book clubs. Mm -hmm. um, it's been such an incredible experience all around. And it, yeah, it completely blew my mind. Nice. That's fantastic. And well-deserved. Um, but we, we uh, genuinely appreciate you coming on and talking to us tonight. Um, and what, what's, what's up next for you? So I have a new book coming out next summer, um, another standalone kind of psychological suspense. I don't think I've talked about it before. Oh, so cool. my pitch will probably Exclusive. be really bad right now. <laughs> um, it's called Such a Quiet Place, um, and it comes out next July. And it's set in a small, close-knit 
neighborhood where a crime has occurred um, in the past and it actually begins as the person who was convicted has the conviction overturned and comes back to this neighborhood. Oh, um, nice. oh. So it's, it again kind of focuses, I love the dynamic between like two women at the heart of a story and it's two roommates um, who are at the, that's kind of the, the central part of the story as well. Yeah. Again. Fantastic. Awesome. Best of luck to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Excited. All right. Were we taking over, guys? Oh, I think so. <laughs> Look out, everybody. Oh, we didn't have Kim for a sec. Kim, are you back here? I am so back. I think uh, <laughs> my internet went in and out. It's, it's Canada, remember. Ah. So, no, sorry, Megan, a pleasure. And um, have you ever met Francesca Saratella? I have not, so I'm excited. Ooh. Let's, yeah. let's welcome her before you have to head off. So it'd be great. So Jeff, Hi, who is doing such a great job tonight, shout out to him. <clears throat> there she is. Francesca, welcome. It is so lovely to connect with you tonight. I think her sound is not on yet. Hi there. But there you go. Perfect. That's great. Um, have you met Megan before? I don't think so. Oh, so nice to meet you. Oh, it's lovely to meet you too. We're having a lot of fun tonight with this because pairing people up, you know, to overlap so that we can bring the community together. And I think with 2020 being such a challenging year, it's really nice to, you know, have that community support. And, oh, absolutely. Um, and so Francesca, um, I love the fact that your um, debut novel um, was set in Harvard and you went Harvard. So what is special um, about Harvard that you feature in the novel that maybe like the outsider's view would not know about? I think the weirdest thing about Harvard is that it is a character the moment you set foot on that campus. It is just a place that is deeply imbued with its sense of history. You know, it was founded in 1636, 100 years before our country's founding. And every single building is a walking memorial. There is, you know, to the Widener Library for, uh, you know, Harry Widener who went down on the Titanic and um, memorials to war dead, Civil War dead, Revolutionary War, I mean, it's crazy. There's a colonial cemetery right across from Freshman Yard. So it's this weird juxtaposition of, on the one hand, a normal college like any other, young people thinking about the future, partying with red solo cups, trying to catch the eye of the cute boy or girl in their English section. But it's also this clash of the past and the weighty history and um, and honestly, youth and death and all of these uncomfortable little juxtapositions, it's really a place where time closes in on you. And I wanted to capture that pressure cooker feeling and also those ghostly echoes from many years before. Well, sounds fun. Thank you. I think we're having trouble with Kim's audio again, I Megan. I didn't get a chance to say hi. I'm a big fan of your work too, by the way. Um, I wish we had longer, but we got to keep the show going. So uh, I'll say hi and, and, and then bye. But again, big fan of your work and hope we can get you back for something else so I can talk to you again. Definitely. Thanks so much for having me. No, thank you for coming, Francesca. Let me, so I'm told, by the way, I'm told that you and your mom both uh, really love dogs. Uh, is, first of all, is that true? And then secondly, why? Is it true? Is we're it obsessed. True? We're, we're maniacs. Yes. I, I have my dog Pip who is snoozing over in the corner where I'd grab him. My mom has four Cavaliers. We all, we've got this little mini mafia of Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Our house is not very well guarded, but it's very furry. And why are we obsessed? I mean, who, like, how could you not be obsessed? You know, I mean, we need we need these therapy animals more than ever now. And um, dogs and cats, we have both, just inject that necessary humor and spontaneity into all of our lives. And for writers, they keep us company all day. What kind of dogs do you like? Is there a certain, certain kind? Absolutely all. I have all. had, you know, all American mutts, as they call you, mixes from rescues. And we've also had these little frou-frou Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. So really, I think there is just so much beauty and specialness in every dog. Maybe my, I have a special 
touch, warms my heart for older dogs. My dog is 12 now, and he just gets only more precious to me as he gets a little more, you know, frosted with gray around his eyes. I We have a dog who's going to turn eight soon, and I can't believe we're three hours in and he hasn't said hi yet. I, my big fear was he was going to start barking from, from downstairs and it was going to interrupt the show, but uh, he's been on his best behavior, so... Oh, uh, that's I think that's the charm of these virtual events, not only helping us stay connected during these weird times that we're living through, but, you know, I like the little randomness that, you know, I just heard yeah. my cat's collar jingle behind me. I'm like, here she is. You know, like, it's fun to just get to see a little pet every now and then. You never know. That is the fun with these shows. You, you never know. And Francesca, what are you working on now? Because I'm really excited about the second book you're going to have come yeah. <laughs> She heard all those dogs getting attention. Um, there, she just, she just flying, jumped off. My next novel is, you know, it's a little too soon to get too into it, but I will say, I think, you know, Ghosts of Harvard really examines the way um, grief and regret warps our world and warps time. And the next book is much more of a sort of rumination on actually attraction, lust, instincts, fear, you know, that the, the way that our bodies speak to us and our gut instincts during this time where we have sort of outsourced so much of our lives to technology for better and for worse. You know, we've, we date on the apps, we eat on the seamless, we navigate via Google Maps, even when we're in the neighborhood we've lived for a decade. But what are we missing when we're not listening to those more animal instincts and the, all the nonverbal communication that happens, you know, behind a mask. <laughs> that is what the next book's really about. It, have you read the Galvin de Beck? I'm so sorry, I think you cut out. I, th I think Kim froze again, uh, which which is okay, because I think we have uh, your mom, by the way, is gonna be coming in. Now, do you wanna hang around for that? Because here's the thing, I, Jeff, my producer right now, Jeff Ferris, saying, should we bring your mom in? Yeah, let's bring her in. I am Definitely. a massive fan of your mom. I think it's so cool you want to hang around. So I have six kids, and I don't think any of them would want to hang around to, to shoot something <laughs> live with me. I think the second dad comes on, they'd all be leaving. So here she is, Lisa. <laughs> She's got to activate her mic. Listen, this is this is some mom tech happening right now. But it's good that you're here to walk her through it, it just in case. Oh, I, I got, like, yeah, me walking her through Zoom, so now we go way back with this. Yep, Mom, yep. make sure you're, make sure you, okay, it's connecting to audio. So she's going to get there, you guys. See, this is the best because she'll call me with some tech problem and just be like, I don't know, it's not, it's doing the thing. And I'm like, you need to be more specific. How do I do? There she goes. Lisa, are you here? Can you hear us? Here, don't curse, you're on. Now the audio works. Don't curse, you're on. Am I in? Yes, you are you're in. in. We're all seeing your face. Everybody. <laughs> we got it. This is, by the way, this is the first time tonight, no offense uh, to every other author we've had on, this is the first time I got nervous. Ryan, Ryan do you hear me? Ryan. Uh, Mom, what is going on? on? I, I don't think she has her computer volume up. Well, she I'm might not. Her. I got it, I did it, I did Computer. it, I did it. We got her. <laughs> oh my God, I don't know what happened, I'm so sorry. I'm so unfair. No, 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 they have, should blame the internet. Uh, that's where I'm technical I blame the dog, I blame the dog. <laughs> Well, Lisa, thank you for coming on. Welcome. I was just oh, no. telling everyone, this is the first time I got nervous tonight. No offense to all the other authors. I am such a fan of you Aww. and your work. Uh, a mega fan here. It is so great to be able to talk with you. Thank you. I know. It's so great to actually see you in actual person and, yeah. Kim and, my, and my one and only beloved daughter. Who I just said is so cool that she wanted to stay on to talk with you. I have six kids. As soon as I'm done, I'm going to make sure that they'd want to be on Zoom with me. I'm pretty sure they'd all be running the second. No, oh, I know. We already on, they don't want to be there. <laughs> well, it's so great because she, you know, probably predicted that I was like, have a problem with the tech, the tech stuff. And I'm like, I can handle this. It's like, uh, I hate being the resident boomer, but what are you going to do? You know, but thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. This sounds like a real cavalcade of authors, huh? Well, we are about three hours in and actually longer with the pregame and we're almost halfway done. 
So <laughs> this, this has definitely been a marathon so far. It's gone well, mostly knock on wood. Although I said that and like 50 people tweeted me already, like stop, don't jinx it. And don't talk about 2021 will be better than this year. But I'm over here like, how could it not? You know, things have gone good and <laughs> and uh, we got you guys in. So this is great. I, know, Let me no, hop I, was, into I it. was actually, I was watching it. I thought the show is amazing. I mean, this is just great. So. Well, thank you so much. Now you have so, my favorite author of all time with you. So. <laughs> well, we are psyched to have you to have you uh, both here at the same time. This is huge. And three of us, the three I'm of us. Wearing the sweater you got me, mom. Oh, my yeah. If your mother is an author, she will get you a sweater with your book's title on it. This sweater oh, literally so says Boast of Harvard on it, and I'm too embarrassed to wear it anywhere else, so I have to wear it on this. So you wore it. I'm, a, I'm officially jealous of, you know, I hope my kids are watching this, because like, that's another thing. <laughs> if I pick out clothes for anyone in my house, they don't wear it. They don't want that. My, well, three, you know my, what? my youngest son just turned three, and he didn't like the shirts I got him for his birthday. He's three, so I'm just, I can't win, but I'm jealous of <laughs> Of, of you guys. This is awesome. Let me jump into it. Lisa, recently your new book, our forthcoming Eternal, was announced. I am so psyched for it. What can you tell us about it? Thank you. I'm super excited to. Uh, it's historical fiction, so it's my first try, but the truth is, as a born thriller writer, I, I like to think that it's kind of like written at the pace of a thriller. I think it's, it's a love triangle set in... Um, you know, against a backdrop of fascist Italy. Francesca helped me with the love scenes, by the way. She made wonderful edits. She's like, there's, it's a woman in love with two guys who happen to be her best friends. You know, they're both like gorgeous, hunky, fictional men. That's my favorite. I, I <laughs> <her> dream men. <laughs> and um, and the, Francesca read a draft and she said, you know, this guy doesn't have that much game. And I'm like, what is game? Like, what is game and like what is awkward guy only goes so far i was like mom i'm like it's a i know i'm a sucker for an awkward guy i'm like a sucker she loves and I, said to yeah. I was like help me out oh, no hold on hold on I'm, I'm gonna call you out on that one uh i've seen you tweet a lot about bradley cooper and oh, if right. he's awkward none of us have a chance in life at all i mean if bradley <laughs> cooper's awkward the rest of us are no, screwed. A so good, a good point excellent point i know my my tweets are so literary aren't they if it's not like about the <laughs> or a dog or my amazing daughter, you know, but um, it was a really exciting book to write and I'm really thrilled about it. It's not out till March, but it's really fun. We're really- well, We can't wait to read it. Yeah, Thank you. I can't wait as well. Now I've heard a rumor and I don't know if it's true or not that you've recently taken up the game of golf. Is this accurate? <laughs> no, I sucked at it so bad. I think um, <laughs> someone gave me lessons and, and my best friend gave me clubs and I, I screwed up because you actually, I wore a, it was summertime and I wore a tank top out for the lesson. And I, I'm walking towards the guy and he's like, I'm like, look, I, I know at my age, like I, I'm not doing wonders for a tank top. And I'm like, what is it? He's like, what you're wearing? And I'm like, I know, what can I tell you? And he said, no, you're not, your arms can't show. I'm like, what? You know, so things were all, like went from bad to worse. I mean, really. I'm not great. I got to tell you something. So I'll tell, I'll tell you my golf story. Um, first of all, no one's good at golf. The only people good at golf are the pros. Everyone else is not, nothing will make you swear more than the game of golf. Like it, it's just, they say every one good shot sustains you for 300 bad. That's not even my ratio. It's so much worse than that. <laughs> my dad took me golfing and he's a phenomenal. I hate it. Uh, we went golfing for my birthday and I tried to dress the part. But I, I was playing so bad and so uncomfortable. And we were at a nice country club. I ended up sneaking back up to my car and I put on gym shorts with my polo. And uh, everyone thought I looked ridiculous. It was the best round I ever played. Half a round. Best half a round I played. So I think that's the secret is to ignore the dress code and just go for it. Yeah, maybe that's it. I, I'm too antsy. You know, I like to run around and there's not much running around in golf. So, you know. I think it's when you, you know, when, as you know, we're all writers, you sit all day. When you, when you, when you get let out of your crate, you get a little crazy. And as you can see, um, so <laughs> golf was not good for me. <laughs> I do ride, I do ride, Francesca's a wonderful horseback rider. Um, but I have, I had a little pony. Isn't that a song? His name was Dapple Gray. I lent him, sorry. Um, but I plod along on him and you know, we talk on horseback. That's that's the, the excitement that I do. 
Well, talk to us, Lisa, what is your writing process like? You have written so many books. You are one of the most well-known and recognized authors on the planet. Do, do you sit and outline? Nice. Can you just sit down and does this just come easy to you? Because that would not be fair. Like, what is your process like? I'm going to totally give you, I'll give you like a good PR release. And then Francesca can tell you the real true story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. I like that. It's so, um, yes, well, the, it all just comes to me and I wait for the muse and none of that, right? She knows that's not true. That's not true. And anybody listening to the previous interviews know that, and actually the truth is that's what I really like about what you're doing because showing how real writers actually write shows what, a, you know, how, I want to say what a bitch it is, but I'm trying to, you know, that doesn't sound good. Is that bad? Is that down? Honey, correct me. Already done. So here you get out of that. <laughs> no, you, sit, time to move on. you sit down and you really just try to crank out your word count every day um some days they're crappy words and stephen king wrote a wonderful book on writing well that sort of says forgive yourself a little for the days you write badly but then at least you sort of get the story out bit by bit and hopefully you do that with eternal it was more difficult because of the historical backdrop so i had to do all this research so which was fascinating and because all my books are about justice. So it was really a time when the law was perpetrating injustice. But you try to, you know, weave it in and just like everything else. Francesca is the one who taught me this wonderful motto of get it down, then get it good. And I'm like, that's a good motto. I can't take credit. It's like a million writing advice versions of it <laughs> are out there, but it's a great but one. But she didn't know that. You could have took credit for it. We wouldn't have said anything. We were good. You, you could have. Like my mother. Who raised you? You you <laughs> always take credit. Take credit with you know, such a great work ethic. That's what I really learned from my mom because she is so, as you can see, so down to earth, so unpretentious. But she puts logs that butt in chair time, and she works with a word count goal. And I now I work with a word count goal when I'm in first draft mode too. And that's the best way to help yourself get it down, then get it good because. It makes it an empirical measure, not a personal measure. It's just you either hit your word count goal today or you didn't. It's not like a referendum on your personal self-worth <laughs> like it is for so many of us. So Right. And also, you know when you can stop. I mean, especially we all work at home. Everyone's working at home now. And you don't feel guilty like at eight o'clock if you've made your word count goal. And I think particularly for thriller writers, like I don't really, you know, I think we all love fast paced books. So some people call, right? I mean, can we don't, we don't want to be boring to anybody. And so it, when you just kind of organically write something, I think you end up um, aping to a certain extent the flow of a logical narrative flow, which is what's really good for a thriller. Readers need to be able to follow along what you're doing. It's almost like basics. And oh, so our, our, our next guest is here, by the way. Uh, we can listen to Lisa and Francesca hey. forever. Sadly, Francesca, Why? we have to say goodbye. Oh, beauty. Keep it moving. Another cavalier lover, but I, I love cavalier. him. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm dogless you, now. Oh, I'm dogless. We'll, we'll let you yeah, share. it's terrible. Too, but she's still good. Right, Pete? So you're, you're, you're rubbing it in. I'm sorry. I'll Lisa. share her. I'll now share. I have to go cry. Don't cry, honey. You know we love right. you. We love you. <laughs> no. What a beauty. Stay well, so? honey. <laughs> What's that, a book? An actual book? It's an actual book. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have a book? I do. I do. My first novel came out in the middle of the pandemic, but it's good. Oh, it's called Joseph Harper. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. I, ta I talked to Kathy Reichs on Sunday. Her book came out March 13th. The day yeah, of the yeah. lockdown. Oh, it's perfect, it's perfect timing. <laughs> hi, Kim. It's Kim, great. Hi. Oh, hi. I, I'm getting goosebumps just having you here. I love it. You're so, very kind. Hi, Ryan. Yeah, it's, we'll let you say goodbye to us because you know I don't know how. I don't know. <laughs> well, yes. Are we, are yes, we done? Good, are we done or what? So you're, I'm done. You're in. You're oh, in. I'm in? So Bob. He is in. Thank you so much for joining us. We love Lisa, you. Francesca. We love you all. Thank you for having us. I love us. you too. I need I need a dog. You do, honey. We love you. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. Nice to see you. So Bob, did you recently have a dog and, and lose them or I had a dog for four. You saw Minnie. You were here. You oh, saw Minnie. You. She was 14. We had to say goodbye to her this summer. I, mean, I love to start out on a really grim note. <laughs> It's really good, right? 
<laughs> How's that magic bacon that your amazing daughter-in-law makes? Is yeah, she there's still no bacon. She doesn't do anything. Now she orders out. <laughs> They're all just at home. She's not cooking for anybody. You know, poor Liz, if you want to talk about that, my daughter-in-law is a, a chef and a caterer, and she has no work at all. No one's having parties. There aren't any, any parties, so she has no work. And this is really a grim conversation. My son, Matt, who's a Broadway guy, he was music producer of Beetlejuice on Broadway and Moulin Rouge. His career is over. There's no theater. Theater has gone. The two of them get to spend a lot of time with their kids, my grandchildren. So that part's fun. But they have no, you know, no one has any work. I'm so lucky. I have books to write. I feel, I know, I feel really lucky. It's like a normal part of life, you know? I can sit down and write every day. Well, let's talk about those books. I, I recently read that you started out wanting to write humorous novels. I did, um, yes. The, how the heck did you end up writing, you know, Goosebumps. Well, it's an embarrassing story, Ryan, because writing scary books wasn't my idea. I was a funny guy. I did a humor magazine called Bananas for 10 years. Sure. And I wrote about 100 joke books for kids. And I was jovial Bob Stein. I was just funny. It's all I cared about. <laughs> and then uh, my magazine ended and I was home. And I had lunch with a friend of mine who was editorial director at Scholastic. And she came to lunch and she said, I need someone to write a good, scary teen horror novel. Go home and write one. Go home and write a book called Blind Date. It was all her idea. It wasn't my idea. And she even gave me the title. And I said, oh, OK, no problem. I didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> What's a teen horror novel? And I ran to the bookstore and bought up Lois Duncan and Christopher Pike and all these people who were writing teen horror so I would know what it was about. And then I wrote Blind Date. It came out a year later. It was a number one bestseller. And I thought, whoa, wait, forget the funny stuff. I've been, <laughs> sc I've been scary ever since. Well, you certainly have an incredible, you know, library of books, but you also are, you know, have been on every other medium. We're talking plays and, and audio books and movies and small screen, big screen. And I wanted to ask you, where do you think your words have the most impact? Is it certain mediums you think more than others? Or I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, that's an, no one's, that's an interesting question. No, I think the books, because they uh, have the most impact, because they get kids to read. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, you know, that's a real point of goosebumps. I don't really want to terrify kids. Well, a little bit, but I don't want to terrify them a lot. <laughs> we want to get them to read. And so I think the impact, it, and the fact is, and the thing I'm most proud of, of course, is all the millions of kids who learn to read on Goosebumps and who learn to say, gee, books can be entertaining. Books can be fun. That's, that's what I'm most proud of. Speaking of the Goosebumps uh, books, I, I read, I think this was two years ago that you had uh, said you were going to write at four or six more at least. Do you ever worry that you're gonna run out of ideas after this many books that you've already written? <laughs> Ryan, I ran out about five years ago. <laughs> so far, no, so far no one's noticed, right? There's a <laughs> lot of sequels and every other book is a book about Slappy the Evil Dummy. So, you know, Goosebumps is actually called Goosebumps Slappy World now. He's so popular. <laughs> I, no, I don't worry about that. I, I'll tell you this, the truth. I just signed on for six more Goosebumps books. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be 102. I'm still going to be, <laughs> I'm still writing this stuff. But um, I don't try to think of ideas anymore because I think I've done every story a human can do. I, all I do is think of titles. I don't try to get an idea. And I think of a, 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 I just, I have a title of a book I'm starting tomorrow, actually, at Goosebumps, called Judy and the Beast. Great title, right? Yeah. Judy and the Beast, it's good. And then, so I thought of the title, 
And then I said, well, what if a girl goes up to a lonely mountain, a mansion where a father works and there's a beast on, and the titles lead me to the story ideas, always. I always just start with a title and then that leads me to the idea instead of the other way around. So before we uh, welcome our next guest, Bob, I do want to you to share one of your favorite fan moments because I, I know that's a great funny story and I don't want anyone to miss out on it. With some fan mail? What are you, what are you talking about? The greatest fan moment, you know, where you've been somewhere and something kind of funny happened. Yeah, my greatest fan moment is the mail. The, the amazing fan mail that I get. The, for me, that's just the best part. A couple of weeks ago, I got a letter from a girl that said, Dear R.L. Stein, you are my second favorite author. <laughs> that, that was the whole letter. <laughs> that was it, right? And of course, my all, you probably heard me tell my all time favorite uh, letter from a boy. Um, Dear R.L. Stein, I've read 40 of your books and I think they're really boring. It's well, perfect, they, right? Well, listen, you'll have to come back next year to see if you get the sequel to that letter and we find out who her first favorite author is. Now yeah, we're dying yeah. to know. Um, listen, we could talk to you about laughing and scaring kids all night. Uh, Grant Blackwood and Steve Barry are here. You wanna help us welcome them in? Well, of course. I'm told they are coming in. Yes. And you know, oh, there he is. Steve Here Barry, live Sounds from like Disney World. Steve Barry and Grant Blackwood, welcome. Live from Disney World. Yeah, Bob Stein, look at that. Steve, Steve I'm so jealous. Do you believe he's living inside Disney World? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I thought we'd have a little Thriller Fest reunion for a moment before Bob has to head off, so. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see you guys. Good to see you too, Bob. So uh, Grant and Steve, we're having you on because we want to share with the readers out there some very exciting news. And I'll let you two take it away. Oh, well, uh, we're going to write uh, three books together, actually, Grant and I are. Um, we're going to take Luke Daniels, who is uh, the younger character in my Cotton Malone series. I've been wanting to spin him off for a long, long time. And uh, so I'm going to do it. I've, uh, I'm changing publishers. I'm moving from uh, Macmillan and Minotaur over to Grand Central Publishing starting in 2022. And I'll be doing three, cot actually two Cotton Malones and a standalone with them on my own and three with Grant. In fact, tell them about it, Grant. You're working on it right now. Yeah, just started it. Um, you know, Luke Daniels is an interesting character known well to Steve's readers. Um, You've got a lot of layers, but I'm finding him a, a very uh, polite Southern boy who knows how to be really impolite when it's appropriate. And uh, that's kind of what we're doing with him. But it, it's a lot of fun, and I think readers are going to love it. We have an interesting uh, plot angle. We have something very fascinating from American history that's going to come into the novel that I think readers are going to find very uh, surprising. I know I did. Um, it's uh, The look books are going to be a little different than Cotton. There'll still be action, history, secrets, conspiracies, but a little more action, a little more action adventure than you would get with Cotton. Um, a little more towards the Cussler realm and uh, a, little, a little bit there. Try to pick up a little for some new readers, new audience. And of course, Grant is very familiar with that because he was a, uh, a Cussler co-writer for many years. And so he's got that down. And so uh, when I when they asked me to do the three stand, the three, uh, Luke books, the first, the first guy I thought about was Grant. That's the guy I wanted to do it. And he's, uh, and so it, it's in good hands for him to start, to start going with it. We, we plotted the book together. Now he's got to bring it to reality uh, and get in, and bring us out a first draft of the book. I have a question. I have a question about it before we get to that. Uh, Bob, before we let you yeah. go, thank you for coming by. Can you tell us what is your next book and when does it come out? My next book, I just came out. It's a Goosebumps book called My Friend Slappy, about Slappy the evil dummy and a boy who actually likes him. That's the newest thing. Also, I'm doing a brand new series uh, based on the Garbage Pail Kids. And the first Garbage Pail Kids book just came out. I think that's probably a real career ender for me. But uh, <laughs> the book just came out. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, come back next year and tell us if you ever got that follow-up letter. <laughs> Anytime. Great to see you all. And Bob, I want to see you at Disney World. Yeah. I'll be down on Tuesday. Come on. Come on. I'm waiting for you. Hey, I'll right. be there. Believe me. All right. I can't wait. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, Steve, does this mean, let me clarify. So, this is big. This is our first real breaking news of the night. Breaking news? Um, does this mean you'll be doing a cotton book every year, and then also there will be a Luke Daniels book, so it'll be two books a year? Well, what's going to happen is uh, there'll be a cotton book next year with Minotaur, my last one, called The Kaiser's Web, comes February 23rd. And then in 22, there will be a, I'm going to, the first book I'm going to do for Grand Central is going to be a new character and a new everything. Um, it's a character that I've had in my head for many years. I've been wanting to kind of create him and they wanted to try something a little different. Now it'll be action, history, secrets, conspiracy, just mm -hmm. like the cotton books. They'll have, it's something from history that's fascinating that I think yeah, that readers are going to find very, very interesting. It's a, it's the most stolen piece of art in all of history. And then I'll let you, I'm going to let you figure out what that is. But it's the most stolen piece of art in all of history, and uh, it's 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 going to deal. We're going to deal with a new character. I'm going to create. Hopefully, it'll spin to a new series. Then in 23, there will be a cotton book. 24 will be a cotton book. Uh, the Luke Daniels books will probably come in 23, 24, and 25. It's possible it could come in 22, with uh, but I don't I, I don't think so because they're going to push me to summer in 22, which is, uh, you know, I'd like to get back to summer. It'd be nice to be there. So I don't know when the Daniels book could come out, maybe later in the year. Um, I'm not a big fan of coming out around Christmas time. That's bad. I was there for years. It's, it's a wonderful for selling books. It's terrible for everything else. Uh, and as far as being in, in Christmas time, there's too many big books out then. So, now, in Grant, uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Steve. No, no, I just, I was going to say, and I, I think you'll see two books a year for three years, yes. Okay, so, so Grant, you uh, previously, I mean, you've done all kinds of stuff, man. I'm a fan of your work. You also wrote with James Rollins, which is funny, because, you know, Jim and Steve and Brad Thor all sort of wrote each other's characters into their universes. Now, now here's the thing. Who really came up with that? Because I did an event with Jim. I've talked to Brad. It feels like that everyone's took credit for it. So whose idea really was that? Jim, Jim did it first. He, Jim did it first. He made a reference in one of the books to a, an American expatriate living in Copenhagen. And he didn't use a name. That's all he said was that. And his readers picked up on it immediately. And, and when they picked up on it, I then took it and brought his people into my book and then Brad came into it. But the guy who did it first was Jim. We're going to give him credit. And we did it about three or four times. And it was really a lot of fun. And we figured out we had a lot of cross readers, an awful lot of cross readers. Who knows? We might throw a little something in the, the Luke book. Uh, Grant wants me to make an appearance in the Luke book, but I don't know about that. I, I, think, I, I think we'll leave that to Cussler. That's his thing. Oh, yeah. Just write him in, Grant. Ready. Just write him in. I don't, I don't know, Steve. I think that uh, you should make an appearance, but you're going to be in Disneyland. Disney World, sorry. Well, it seems can you work that in, hmm? Can you work that in, Grant? Um, I've already got the catchphrase, you know, picked out. So it really doesn't matter where the location is. I'll just plunk Steve down there, give him the catchphrase, <laughs> and it'll all be good. Who knows? We might try it. You never know. So speaking of James Rollins, guess who we have waiting to join us? Is it Jim? Yes, it is. Oh. And we'd love to surprise everyone, connect them online tonight. And we thought it'd be really fun to bring Jim in. Um, and, uh, and maybe he would help welcome him. Hey, there's the guy. There's my man. Hey, Stevie. Hey, you kids. Let's see you. And Grant's here, too. Hey, I'm trying to see. Are you in your new place? This is new. This is my new office. Yeah. I was saying that doesn't look like the garage anymore. No, not the garage. <laughs> we, we, we got a little bit. We went a little up, a little more upscale this time. Nice. <laughs> Did you take everybody on the tour? No, no. We just been sitting here and. Uh, um, right. But I hadn't seen you in a long time. It's been a while. It's been a while. Has it been the last Thriller Fest? Is that the last time? Probably it was the last time I saw you in person. We we emailed and communicated, but that's the first time I last time I saw you was uh, summer last. 
yeah. back before all of this. All of the bad stuff. Yeah. Yes. Which we should ignore. And you're hunkered down in, in Lake Tahoe? I am indeed. Yep. Huh. We're getting our first snow theoretically Friday. Yay. Oh, really? It's 85 degrees here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Bad. No, it's hot here. Well, it's a little chilly. Actually, today it was 75, which is like freezing for us. Did you get a nice little cardigan to wear? And Yeah, you put that on for the little chill that's coming, but uh, it's going to be back <laughs> up in the 80s. I'm actually going to go into a Magic Kingdom on Friday. I've, I've oh, not cool. gone in the parks because I kind of, but they do a really good job here with it, I will say. A really, really good job with uh, mask and control and everything. Do you have to wear a hazmat suit? Uh, not quite, but they're pretty peculiar about the mask, though. Is it, who is this on the camel? <laughs> I think that's KJ's that's, uh, Kimberly uh, vacation. Cow's, uh, that's him, isn't it? Yeah, there. Yeah. That was that was uh, my cue. I'm going to ride you out on a camel, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Our time is up, and it's now Jim's turn. All right. Hooray! Thanks for coming by, guys. Thank Good you. To be here. Thank you. All right. I think Jim, good uh, to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> Hours almost. There you go. Good to see you, Jim. Hey, Jim, how are you? I'm doing good. How about you? Yeah, good. not too shabby. Good. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a little trouble with one of your one of your personal interests, and and a lot of people do, and and it seems to make its way into some of your novels, and that's the sport of spelunking, and. Yes. What is it that you? What is it that fascinates you about it when it terrifies so many other people? To me, I started when I was in a in college. Uh, you know, there's different clubs and sports you can join, and uh, on weekends, a lot of people are doing these float trips. With, you know, kegs of beer balanced on the back of the sure. canoe. We went to the same school, so we know where that's at. Oh, exactly. You know, that's right. Trip. Well, for me, you know, again, Missouri is Cave Central, so uh, there's a caving club. So I thought, well, it sounds like fun. Yeah. You know, I, I always sort of. Uh, Loved adventure novels. This sounded sort of very adventurous. Uh, you know, my probably the appeal to me more than anything is to uh, two things. One is the physical challenge of trying to to maneuver through a, you know a wild cave uh, and how to do your rope work, how to get down and up safely, but also just the fact that you know theoretically you may be seeing something that no one's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're venturing into these caves that are on private property, uh, oftentimes you know, maybe a little trespassing is involved <laughs> to get there. So. Um, you know, they're, they're known by the clubs, not known by much other people besides the club, outside the club. So uh, a lot of times you're, you know, just theoretically, not that I can't really say I've ever done this, where, you know, you discover a new offshoot off a cavern that's fairly well mapped by the club. Uh, but uh, so it's always sort of fun to, to think you might be discovering something brand new that no one's ever seen before. Mm, like writing. Sort of. I don't know if it's my size or not, but I, I've never been, it's never appealed to me to be stuck in a, a crevice somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> But Jim, last time you were on, you were promoting the last, last time Mike and I spoke with you rather, you were promoting the last Odyssey. And uh, first I want to thank you because my college age son who was uh, interested in mythology got into thrillers because of that book. And that was his sort of gateway drug, if you will. Um, but One since the fold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But since we've spoken, um, you've come out with Unrestricted Access, which is a collection of stories. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, I've... Uh... Back early in my writing career, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't think I had room in my life for writing a novel. You know, I only had cracks in time as an employed veterinarian owning my own clinic. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I wrote short stories, uh, stuff that's buried in my backyard, hopefully never see the light of day. But, you know, once I got published, there were the, and, and it was, it's a, to me, short storytelling, short story writing and novel writing, are very different birds. Uh, they're different skill sets. Uh, I don't know if I'm necessarily the best uh short storyteller, but it was fun once I got published to try to, to, to play in that sandbox. And so over the course of, you know, 20, 30 years I've been writing, I've done, a, you know, short stories here and there. I find them a lot of work. And uh, I was entertaining a lot of emails or on Facebook or whatever, uh, social media about uh, people inquiring, those that wanted the, the, you know, the James Rollins completists out there that wanted the complete yeah. James Rollins collection. You know, they were discovering these titles that they hadn't 
heard of or didn't have in their in their book collections you know let's see hearing things like you know i heard this you know this this novel you're called the pit you know where can i find that book and then i have to explain oh it's not a it's not a novel it's a short story and you can find it you can find it here or oftentimes uh, some of the answers where i, I you can't find it anymore mm-hmm. they were either yeah. uh, uh you know an anthology that were no longer in print and they never did an ebook version of it uh so i decided uh to do a collection. So I approached my editor and said, Hey, you know, why don't we do like a little chat book and I've got a handful of short stories out there, you know, I'll put them together. She says, that's a good idea. And so I sent her all the short stories I'd written over the uh, 30 years. Uh, and she said, you know, gosh, this is, you've got enough short stories. When you put this all together, they're about as long as one of your Sigma novels. Hmm. But why don't we just do a proper book and, and, and relaunch this? And I was a little hesitant initially. I thought, well, at least that will put all my short stories in one volume and I can always point to it, which is convenient for me. But uh, I didn't want to just sell people old material. Uh, that felt uncomfortable yeah. for me. So I, I decided to write something new for the un- anthology. And I wrote not just a short story, but a, a novella featuring Tucker and Kane, a brand new adventure never seen before. Uh, very pivotal because you're going to see Tucker and Kane in next year's Sigma book. So this is sort of a refresher course on, on, okay. on Tucker and Kane. And they have a quite a traumatic little experience. Hmm. And uh, I also discovered my editor asked, hey, why don't you do an introduction to the anthology, which I thought, Made sense. I figured that was going to happen. But she asked me, why don't you also, uh, well, actually, not me. She, I, when I was doing the, the, the uh, introduction, I thought, why don't I do introductions for other short, some of the short stories? Because I realized the breadth of the short stories are sort of the breadth of my career. And that hmm. I could uh, use the short stories as a vehicle to explain, you know, uh, my arc of a writer. You know, here's the first book, I, first short story I wrote. This is why I wrote it. Um, this is what I might have done differently if I could. Um, and then over the arc of that book, I, of, of the anthology, I explain, you know, why certain stories appeal to me, why I wrote them. And so it gives a little glimpse of the arc of my career, besides the fact that you have these short stories. And so you well, mentioned I, I, Sigma Force. When is the next one coming out? Uh, right now, just March 2021. Yeah, everything's up, somewhat up in flux because we don't know what the state of bookstores are going to be. Uh, uh, you know, theoretically, if there is a vaccine coming out, uh, and that there's some hope that there might be a, a more open market. They might shift that around a little bit. So right now they're saying March. So we'll see. Any uh, any teaser that you can give us? You know, it's, it's a weird novel. Um, and then it's all about viruses. Uh, now, I, I did not plan this uh, in anticipation of COVID. I actually pitched this last summer. And I, I wanted to do a novel about virus hunters. Uh, those uh, specifically because a lot of these virus hunters that are out in the field looking for viruses in the wild that might spill over into the human population are veterinarians. So again, that, that sort of appealed to me. That was in my idea box to do a story featuring a wildlife veterinarian that's out in the field uh, researching viruses. So I pitched this to my editor and gave her sort of the, the thumbnail version of where I was going to go with the story. And, and she said, that's cool. You know, go ahead and do it. And then, you know, months go on and, you know, January comes, February comes. And I get an email from my editor. Did any of your research scientists warn you about <laughs> COVID coming on? And why are you writing about this now? Uh, <laughs> no, I had not hired nothing. Uh, but it was weird to finish this book and to finish writing this novel in, in, the, in, the, in the, the depths of a pandemic. You know, here I am writing a novel about ter- the terrifying nature of viruses. Because again, this novel isn't a pandemic novel per se. Uh, there's a pandemic quality to it, but I didn't want it to be a, a truly a pandemic novel. I've done those before. I've done uh, The Seventh Play, the Doomsday Key, all had a sort of a pandemic element to them. So I really wanted to do more about uh, these wildlife hunt, these virus hunters, about the weird biology of viruses, and discover exactly how creepy and scary those viruses are. So initially when uh, COVID struck, I thought, wouldn't it be, you know, I thought, wouldn't it be nice instead of writing Last Odyssey, if I'd written this book before, then it would have been coming out right in the middle of COVID. Um, but in retrospect, maybe not. Uh, a, I don't think maybe people want to read about viruses in, in, in great depth right now. And number two, uh, what I'm going to reveal about viruses in that next book, pretty darn scary. So yeah. uh, if you're scared of COVID, uh, maybe hold off on reading this novel. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot worse out there. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to read it, Jim. I'm, I, I love, I'm a former medical writer. So for me, this stuff is just fascinating. Lots so, of cool stuff. You know, some of the things you're going to find on this book is, you know, why are bats such vectors for viruses? Why does it seem like bats are always the ones passing these viruses to us? And what's unique about bats? You're going to find out a lot of just weird things about, about the, uh, the prevalence of viruses. One of the, the details I found out is that like uh, every hour or every 
square meter of the earth, viruses rain down out of the sky. They're actually airborne for the most part. And they, they're just basically pelting the earth. Every square meter gets pelted with like, I can't remember the exact, I have to look it up, but I think it's like 8 million viruses hit every square meter of the earth every hour. So just to give you an idea, if you think you're going to be able to wash away all threats of uh I can't wait to read it too, but I got to say, I feel like if your publisher's watching, I can feel them saying, no, don't tell people if you're scared of COVID not to read this book. <laughs> They're going to be saying, if you're scared of COVID, you have to read this book. Well, you know, everybody's scared of, sh of sharks yet, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Snakes don't read Jaws, but they do. I yeah. think you know, yes. you're going to find a lot about viruses that I think are going to be quite shocking, quite intriguing, quite interesting. I was fascinated by a lot of the things I discovered uh, from talking to these virologists out in the field. Uh, so it, I'm excited great. about the book. It's a big gigantic adventure, uh, a lot of history. I won't go into. I think I've blathered on long enough about that book. So, so Jim, I wonder if you can just help us welcome the amazing Gail Linz. Hey, Gail. Is it hey. fun? So, how is Maine? Twenty-nine degrees. Ah, see, I was just telling Steve, he was on before me, that we're expecting our first snow this Friday, and he was going, "Oh, well, it's eighty-five degrees here." I know I was, I've been listening to you guys. I really enjoyed you, uh, but uh, you're right in the virus area, aren't you? Hey, Gail. Am I in the virus area? Is that what you said? Yeah. How is Maine? You know, I, I'm up and I'm relatively isolated up here in, uh, up in the mountains. So uh, it's not, we're not in a, in a major exposure risk here. Oh, well, it's 85 degrees here. Yeah, that's, uh, I feel bad for him. <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> it's a rough life. And I think he's down there by Disneyland too. So he's yeah, having a good time. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to read that book. And there are all these voices. Do you, it's kind of confusing. Gail, I think you might have our show on. Do you have our show on in the background? Oh, I do. Those are the voices. <laughs> and don't worry. It's good that we all hear them. Yeah, now oh, we know you were honestly watching before you came on. Everyone oh, keeps yeah. saying it, but we don't I, know because we don't ever that. hear it in the background. We actually know you're watching. James Rollins, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, Have Hi, a good Gail. one. I'll later. Bye. Now we are live with Gail. As we cross the, uh, we're officially halfway done. Gail, one of my literary heroes. You know how much I love you. The queen of espionage. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, it's a thrill. I just think this is the best idea. You guys come up with great ones. Well, well listen, you know what? I'm going to say something right now. Lisa Scottolini was here with her daughter and she told Francesca, just take credit for everything. So uh, this was oh. all my idea. Uh, the whole oh. thing I came up with and uh, it was all me. And I just, I, I pitch it to everybody else and they like, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, David Brown, Mr. Atria Mystery Bus, publicist extraordinaire uh, at, at Simon & Schuster Atria Books, Emily Bessler Books. This was his idea. I did notice he came up with the whole thing, thought it would be a good idea to go live for like seven, eight hours, and, and then didn't want to be on camera. Uh, so he, <laughs> he, came up, he came up with this seven-hour live show and then was like, great, go ahead and host that and sit on camera for that. For that time for us so well, uh, between here we crossed you the and kim and everybody else that you're having on i mean my gosh what an extravaganza in, in david's defense it has been a lot of fun so gail yeah. um we're, we're running a little bit of short on time so with the kellermans are here they're probably going to be in any time now but i want to ask you um you are so great working with you know younger writers or new writers so many people have already commented they're getting great writing tips uh, from this show, I'm reading Twitter right now. What is your best advice for young authors? Oh, uh, think long term, because uh, I, I one of my early mentors said to me, make a lot of mistakes early on in your career, because if you do that later on, when you've been publishing a while and you're sort of famous, it's much more embarrassing to make the mistakes. So make them early on, and that's part of your long term thinking. And, and Gail, uh, I just want to give a little shout out. So Gail and I are part of a wonderful group of female writers called Row Women Writers. So come check us out. We blog and we do some reading and exciting other things. 
And you know, I wanted to you know ask you what advice do you have for a young female author who wants to write in the international or spy or action-packed genre? Since you're a trail, I think they should do it because there is room, and more and more, I think people are are again accepting that women can write these books and they're very exciting. I especially love political thrillers, political international thrillers. And I think in that area, especially there's more room. There've been so many marvelous people coming out of the various services and creating books. And I can see some of them right here. Uh, but, and there's also the side of it that's much more political too. Kim, I'm a little hurt. You forgot to say that I have a column uh, with the Real Women Writers. Uh, no, oh, you, yes, you guys do great. I mean, it's so great. Everything you guys do is so awesome. I'm so honored. Um, I, I, I hardly do anything. Every month, Kim's like, can you send me your, your pick for this month? And then she reminds me eight times and I finally send it to her and you guys put it out and make me look so good. It's the easiest thing in the world. I'm so, so uh, thrilled and honored to be partnered with you. Uh, Gail, it's my turn to sub out. Sean Cameron is here, but I wanted to say hi to you especially. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. It's been a delight. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're doing this and thank you for uh, contributing such great authors to Rogue Women and pleasure. the world. <laughs> and, talk, and talk with you soon. Hello, Gail, you um, you broke sort of the glass ceiling on on the female thriller, um, on the political thriller. I, I mean, there, there's, you are you are a pioneer. And that's got to be kind of surreal sometimes, but it was kind of burden. I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> <laughs> My God, I had no idea I wasn't supposed to do this. <laughs> well, that's 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 an actually an excellent thing. But did you did you face any resistance um, early on in your career? That, that yeah, like I did because truly I didn't. Well, I picked the terrible time to be doing this it was in the mid to late 90s and you know we were tired of overseas commitments overseas wars uh we the, the cold war was over we were the last standing superpower uh the new york times column on spies and thrillers had been discontinued even though it had been in existence for decades and it killed it Jean Le Carré and uh, Frederick Forsyth went off to write other things because they thought the spy thriller was no longer of interest. Uh, so I, that's when I started, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the first mistake. The second mistake is I'm a woman and who can, a woman who writes action, who talks about guns and uses them and you know she can do karate and kickbox and do all this other stuff. And she knows about culture and history and you know, science and stuff like that. And uh, so when I first, when my first book was turned into for an exclusive offer, supposedly my agent was very excited about it from the head of Dutton. And she came back and said, I really love this book. It was Masquerade. I want to publish this book, she said, but no woman could have written this book. And that is really, my career has been up and down because I periodically would run into that. Is that Jonathan? Is Jonathan here? I see somebody there. Um, I see him, John. Well, is that John? I gotta put my glasses on. Ah, sure. oh, it's Jesse. Jesse, I knew you when, when you were 10 years old. That doesn't mean you're necessarily going to remember. Hi, John. Hi. Hi, Gail. Hi. Remember, like, hi, all these people. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, fun. it's fun, isn't it? Yeah. You're much fun overlapping different authors because really we're stuck at home and having the community and collegiality and being able to touch base and, and just say hello to everyone has been so much fun tonight. So Gail, thanks for joining us and we're gonna dump so Jesse and Jonathan right now. So good night, Gail. Here we so, are. Yeah, so Jesse Jonathan, yeah. I such a pleasure to meet you Thank and you. Uh, love you. And I'm a big fan of psychology. I love studying it. Mm -hmm. um, can you walk us through, do you start off with a novel with a psychological idea and work from there? Or do you come up with characters and work from there? What is your, what is your uh, take on that aspect? All of the above. I mean, I've written so many books. They start in different places. Um, normally, it's, I, I'm not a premise-driven writer. So basically, I... I, I do a lot of thought. I, it generally starts with characters, interesting people, interesting type of situation. 
how can I manipulate it and provide lots of surprises? Because I think my job is to entertain, which is why I'm really happy to do this, to take people away from reality and create our own special world. Yeah. Especially in 2020, we certainly need a little escape, right? May, may I indulge myself with a, a, a short little joke about Please, that? Absolutely. Okay, this, absolutely. Is, this is actually taken from an Israeli comedy. This is the scene. It's before Yom Kippur, Jewish Day of Atonement, when all the Jews are apologizing for their sins. And this guy's in his apartment and he hears knock, knock, knock. He goes, who is it? He goes, it's God. He goes, oh, some crazy guys out there. So he opens the door and there's some big tall guy, a bearded guy in a white coat. He, he slams the door. By the time he gets back, God has gone through the wall. So it really is God. He says, oh my God, oh my God. He goes, what are you doing, God? He says, well, it's Yom Kippur. I'm going around apologizing to everybody. He goes, God, why are you apologizing? We're supposed to be apologizing to you. And God sighs and goes, this year I overdid it. <laughs> Amen to that. So that's what it feels like. You know? Amen to that. Well, I'm going to direct this one at Jesse first, but I want both your takes. What is the dynamic like collaborating versus, versus your relationship uh, as a family, like it, how, how do you delineate the two and, and tell me how they bleed into each other? Well, one thing that I think is really important um, for the stability of the collaboration is the recognition that the, the relationship precedes and, and takes precedence over the collaboration. We were father and son well before we were writing partners and long after we stopped writing together, uh, we'll still be father and son. So I think we, you know, we both come to the to the table with a great deal of respect for each other, uh, a great deal of admiration for uh, the each other's craft, um, and you know, and I, I, I would I would venture to guess that in most successful collaborations, that's 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 present and true as well. Just the baseline has to be a starting. Uh, there has to be the baseline of respect. Um, you know, I, I, one of the reasons we write well together is because we get along for the most part as people. And, you know, and we share, we're not, we're by no means the same person, but obviously there's a certain consonance of, um, you know, sense of humor. Like I come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, I, I, I think that, um, Actually, the more revealing thing to me has been over the process of our collaboration is that we're coming up on, um, we're working on this, our sixth book together now. So we, we will have written more books together than I wrote on my own, which is kind of interesting. Um, is, is that when we first started, we didn't know how it was going to work. And uh, one of the wonderful surprises has been that our skill sets are um, somewhat overlapping, but also complementary. There are things that, you know, I, I, I think that my dad, there are re points to which I can, you know, I go to my dad and where I'm really stuck and he will have the answer um, ready um, almost by magic. So um, on the whole, I, I wish, you know, people often ask, do you fight? Do you, I wish I could give you a more dramatic, uh, you know, insider story, but the truth is it get, we get along, which is why we continue to do it. <laughs> because we're both mature adults now, you see? <laughs> you didn't have to go through my adolescence. I went through yours, but you know, it's over. And you know, uh, both of us are musicians. We both play guitar and Jesse plays drums. I play a few instruments. Both of us have played in bands. And I liken it, if you're playing in a band with someone with really good chops, it's fun. And uh, I knew he was a great writer. So I knew he came with those chops or I wouldn't have even done it or even tried because life is hard enough without a bad collaboration. Um, so it's meshed really well. And uh, it's, I don't think we've exchanged a cross syllable. So it's been really a lot of fun. Mature adults might be, might be pushing well, it. Semi-mature. Semi <laughs> Semi-mature. Kim, we might've lost your audio again. Kimberly, I can't. Kimberly. Kimberly. Jonathan. There yes. we go. What is your proudest moment with respect to the way Jesse has grown as a writer? My proudest moment with Jesse has nothing to do with his being a writer. I was talking to Faye about this. We have four, four kids. Jesse's the oldest. We have nine grandkids. They're all great. They've all married great people. It's too much to hope for. It's almost disgusting. But I, I always, I, I, I honestly feel Jesse is one of the most intelligent people that I've ever met. Raising him was not quite like raising a child. It was like raising 
a phenom. And, but the main thing that I'm proud of is that he's a, he's, he's a good person. He's a moral person. Uh, as uh, Walker Percy said, you can get straight A's and flunk life. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's, it's more important to me character and uh, Jesse and my three daughters and our three daughters. I give their mother all the credit because she's a very grounded Midwestern born woman. <laughs> So, I mean, I obviously was proud of him at each step along the way. He kept winning contests and uh, he won the Princess Grace for Best Young Playwright in America. Recently, he, he's probably going to win a weightlifting con contest in his age class for deadlifting. Uh, what is it? 575 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> it skipped a generation. <laughs> that is so impressive, Jesse. Holy oh, yes. Yeah. What's your bench press? Are you good there, too? Um, it's okay. I'm not a great bench presser. <laughs> He's modest too, you know. Well, before you guys get out of here, let, let, let's t talk about what you're doing next. Like what, yeah, what's sure. next together? What's next solo? Do you want to go first or do you want well, to start you, with go, the go, stuff? Go ahead. Go ahead. My dad, I think could probably, my dad will speak to his series. You know, we are in the midst of, uh, of uh, creating this wonderful new series with uh, Alameda County Coroner Clay Edison, the third book, Half Moon Bay came out over the summer, and uh, you know we it's been the feedback's been really good, and and we love him as a character, and we love uh, developing him and getting a chance to um, you know explore the geography of Northern California, which is which is where I live. You know, it's a it's an area that you know has a crime writing crime writing tradition. We're trying to sort of like. Um, you know, you know, up, update that for, for, for the modern world. And he's a great lens for that, uh, for that uh, kind of exploration. Um, so we're, we're under contract to do several more clay books together. And what's great about um, him as a character is we are, you know, we're, there are some, some series who that quite successfully, you know, sort of freeze a character and they're, they're sort of timeless, you know, it's an adventure right. and adventure and, adventure. and, and that's a, I, I absolutely, respect you know the way that's uh that's been successful for so many years and some of my favorite series like for example uh the ross mcdonald series you know Ar archer you know he moves in time but by and large he's he's like he's right. sort of static as a person um one nice thing is we get to do with clay is we get to mature him in in time and move him through different phases of life through love and marriage and and children um and get to watch his watch his evolution not just as a investigator but as a, as a person and as a family man um so currently we're at work almost done uh with uh, the dra a draft of the fourth book uh, which I hope will be out next year. Um, and uh, then we've got three more after that. And then, then it's all up for grabs. But that's, uh, that's sort of where my attention is. And you have a solo right project that you, you've been working on. I, I have a never ending solo. I have a no, couple never of ending solo project. projects. I have a never ending solo project. Yep. You know, <laughs> working, working, working on, on the Golden Series and the Clay Series has been very absorbing. I, I, I'm not, I used to be a better multitasker or, or I, I'm not sure if I was. I think I was just sloppier. And so I was content to multitask. Whereas now I really prefer to focus on one thing at a time. Eventually I will go back to writing my own books at some point. Well, it looks and like I, the family portion of the show has begun where we have uh, all, all, all family <laughs> authors. I That's right. That on Jesse's screen, it says Oscar Kellerman, who is Jesse's son, which is- I know, it's, he, he's the only one who uses Zoom for school, so- Now, now he has Oscar. one son named Oscar, the other one's name is Edgar. His daughter is not named Emmy, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so the awards right. thing. No, I'm working on another Delaware. I, I, the COVID thing gave me this burst of creativity because I was stuck in the house. So I actually completed six oil paintings and, and two novels. So wow. one's coming out in February and the one coming out following February is done. And now I'm working on another one. And uh, they're, you know, I love the Delaware series. I, someone has pointed out to me, I, they think it's the longest running American contemporary crime series, which just means that I'm old. So, you know, <laughs> but, uh, it's great. It's great fun. Mm -hmm. well, we, we wish you both luck with both with Thank all you. of your endeavors and uh, we really Thank appreciate you. you coming on and spending time with us tonight yeah. what of a course our idea. pleasure good Thank writers you. we will distract from reality that's our mission and, yeah. and before you go i want to make sure that you do uh, have met lynn and val constantine who are hi, hi. Hello. 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 sister team 
We're a sister team and we get that same question all the time. Everybody wants to know about our fights. And I'm, I'm saying we need to all come up with some good fight stories because we get along as well. And we were like, oh, you don't have anything fun to tell you. Is, is yeah. Jerry Springer still doing a show? I don't know. <laughs> he is, yes. Maybe we could all go on. Unfortunate. Okay, well, listen, it's great. So that's our that's our time. And we say we say goodbye now. All right, yes, guys. Sir. Nice to meet you. So nice all to right. meet you all. Thank you. Great Take Bye. care. Kim, we're having mic problems again. Um, yeah. Down here. I believe. Oh, there we go. Kim, you're, yeah. Can't hear you. Working up? No, now we can hear you. Yep. Oh, yes. Let's... I want your background. <laughs> your talk, our show. I love it. So, uh, Val and Lynn are also part of Rogue Women Writers, which is Gail was on just a little earlier. And um, we certainly have a lot of fun when we talk um, about, you know, edgy stories. And what I'd love to ask you guys first is to talk about female stalkers. Hmm, because you seem to know a whole lot about them. Well, Valerie used to be ben a stalker. Was a stalker. And so, <laughs> same, that's what I, we both have stalking experience uh, in our backgrounds. Uh, do you want to take it, Val, or you want me to? All right. <laughs> So female stalkers, you know, we actually wrote a piece about that. Um, and uh, typically in fiction there, you know, we're all used to seeing the male stalker, but we find the female stalker very interesting. Think back uh, in film and in books, um, Play Misty For Me uh, was one single weight female, right? So they're all different motivations for female stalkers and um, whether it's wanting to take over someone's life or being jealous and wanting to become another person. There, there are you know, really a myriad of reasons why women become stalkers, but we find it quite fascinating. So um, you have to read the wife stalker to figure out who, which woman is the stalker and why. <laughs> and and uh, female stalkers are very different in their motivation than male stalkers. Male stalkers you know, everyone says that the male brain is much simpler than the female brain, that we're very complicated, right? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that was another thing that we thought when, when we start, as Lynn said, when we were looking at different uh, films and books, there were just so many different reasons for women to be stalkers, but we all know why men are stalkers, basically. Not to insult anybody here. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's Hey, I, I have daughters, so I trust me. I I my antenna are up for men all the time. Yeah. Um, I have a question that goes to process and and your process together. Do do you generally is one of you generally the idea person, and then you develop it together, or or are you always calling each other? Hey, I have this idea for a, a, another horrific ter tale of terror. Yeah, <laughs> we're always calling each other with hey, well. Actually, when we, we start a new project, we talk about ideas. You know, we just throw ideas back and forth. Well, what, and we usually start with a twist uh, of, of a situation that we can twist and how we can do that twist. And then the talk goes on oh, probably for a month, maybe three weeks, a month, where we talk out the story in a very general sense. Mm -hmm. Not, we, we know the twist and we know the bones of the story. But I would say that it definitely goes back and forth, wouldn't you, Lynn? Yeah, it's a very organic process and it evolves. And a lot of times the, the main twist that we start because it takes us a while to settle on it and it has to be something we're both really excited about. So that doesn't change. But a lot of the nuances change and the twists and turns along the way can change. And all of a sudden, you know, I might get a call, I might call Valerie and say, oh, I, you know, I've got this, crazy idea but just listen to me for you know before you say anything or vice versa and the iterative the iterative process for us really helps us to take it I think to the next level of much much more easily than doing it by ourselves yeah, so it's I, fun yeah I know that there I'd and, love to have somebody throw a lifeline to me almost every day so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do yeah I mean we even will finish each other's chapters if one of us starts a chapter and sort of gets stuck or feels like, mm, I don't really know where I'm going with this, we can send it to the other and say, would you like to finish this? And then it's great for the other person because you, you, are, you already have something started. Um, something's on the page already and you can just pick up and go on. So that's been terrific. I've, 
I love that. Yeah. yeah Elaborate. Yeah. Well, I'm going to hand it on for Tashawn and Mike. And, and hello, Meg. Beautiful. Well, hello, hello. Hi. What's happening, gang? Ladies, I appreciate you guys coming on tonight, and uh, we need to have we need to have you back on so we can talk for longer periods. But as the the nature of this show is, hello, how are you doing? Hello. Hi. <laughs> but I okay. want to give you an opportunity to. to we, we like to give you guys the opportunity to say hi to the next author as well. So, hi Meg. Hi. Hey. Hey. Nice to meet you. You too. How are you guys? We're good. We're, We're good. doing well. Doing well. Enjoy. Well, thank you very much, ladies. Appreciate thank it. All right. Thanks for having us. Appreciate Take care. Bye -bye. See you later. How are you doing, Meg? I'm okay. I see that uh, Sean and I have put on jackets. This is the first time since like February I put on. He's jackets. covering up a food same. stain. Don't let him <laughs> think it's like you know. Absolute, absolute same. I have not, I have not <laughs> worn anything even remotely semi-formal. No. <laughs> when I did this because um, <laughs> Kyle Mills was earlier joking about needing to put on his tux, and so I said, "Well, I'd better find one," and I managed yeah. to find a jacket. <laughs> is it yours? It actually is. Oh, okay. This is what I was supposed to wear to the Edgar Awards in April. Oh, <laughs> where oh I was brutal. <laughs> Close second. <laughs> At least we gave you another reason. So yeah, you guys ought to be pleased. Oh, we are. Well, Meg, last time we talked to you, I think I think you were just coming off unsub two. I, I think we actually got you before your third book yes. came out. Yeah. It was last was, fall, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah which so. was a, a smash and one of my favorite books terrifying books you always oh, thank me you. awake at night um even after the book's <laughs> that over warms my heart <laughs> so what's what's going on now are you is the next book an unsub book or are you in something else the next the unsub four is on the way so Ooh. i will have details about on that soon it'll be out sometime next year and uh we'll get that uh out to everybody before too long. And I'm working on another project after that. So it's, um, I'm busy. It's a very fortunate position to be in. So yes, uh, yeah, doing hmm. all right. <laughs> well, speaking of busy, uh, one of the themes that we seem to find in your novels is the negative impact of the internet and social media. Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay, we'll, we'll roll with that. We'll yeah, roll no, with I, that. I, I think it's I there. do have in one book, there is a, there is a, there is a, a lurker, stalker, hacker who... Right, exactly. Uh -huh. So uh, do you think that that's actually true? Or is this just something that you cooked up for your novel? No, of course not. There's, uh, I mean, with the internet has come every benefit and terror that we couldn't have even foreseen. I mean, what, <laughs> when my... <laughs> When my daughter was in high school, you know, uh, I was like, should we get her a phone? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Went to the same thing. And, uh, but I mean, social media in particular has figured out the key to turn us into the hamsters, turning to, uh, to our little fix, like seeking out that pellet every single time, whether it's um, to get a like or to reward yourself. If I'm just saying, hypothetically some of us were trying to write a paragraph and then we'd say well i certainly deserve a reward after that maybe i should mm -hmm. check instagram <laughs> they uh they they know where the reward centers in the brain are and how to uh, uh, instigate us with uh conversation gossip uh every shiny tasty terrifying thing that uh, turns our brains on so it's uh, it's something we need to take close uh, care about Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, I hope the unsub series never ends, but do you ever consider going back to Evan Delaney or Joe Beckett to check where they are now and, and take their story another step? Or is that kind of just in the past? No, well, sure. I mean, uh, Evan Delaney series right now, the, the fifth novel does end on a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> people hmm. have been staring at me for several <laughs> years now going, you know, uh, well, what's up? I do have the next novel <laughs> outlined. It's just when I actually have time to write it. And I hope there will be a space when I can fit that into uh, my writing and publication schedule. Joe Beckett does make an appearance in my latest Unsub book. Oh, really? Oh, she no does. kidding. Yes. Uh, so she's uh, she's still poking around on the scene. She's uh, doing her thing. And uh, I love both of them. I love writing those series. I love writing standalones. I love what I'm what I'm doing now. So it's, um, as I said, it's a fortunate position to be in that I'm I'm busy writing all this stuff and trying to fit more into the schedule. Well, um, well, go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking a quick question. Have you become more of a pantser or less of a pantser with the schedule coming up of yours? 
More of a pantser. No, no, less of a pantser. Oh, I've been, I, I even wrote today. I wrote a lot of words today. My brain has obviously turned to soup. <laughs> I found that I need to have a, um, at least a chicken wire structure for the book. Yeah. That saves me uh, an incredible amount of time that I won't be wandering around or painting lipstick on a pig and can instead be making sure the story is solid and uh, it, it holds up all the way through. Because if, if, if you've got the story and you've got the characters, then that's what's going to carry you solidly through to uh, what you hope is a stirring, satisfying climax. If you're wandering around in the underbrush, then um, six months later, you might find yourself uh, someplace you don't want to be. Yeah, an enviable spot. Well, if you ever hit that, if you ever hit that dead end, you can always do uh, Meg's headline of the day compilation book. <laughs> We're uh, waiting on that. And pull people over. <laughs> for... Well, I, yeah, that, that would be fun. That's, I mean, that's just something that I, I keep thinking as long as we can laugh, as long as we yes. realize that life is absolutely absurd and that <laughs> the 7 billion people out there will find a way to outdo our wildest imaginations, then um, I hope so I'll true. stay balanced. <laughs> well, and we want to welcome uh, Jennifer to the show. You guys know each other, I assume. We do. Yes, we Hello. Do. Lovely to Hi, see you. Meg. Good to see you. Yes. <laughs> Is it cold where you are? Jennifer, is it cold? Is it cold? Are you up in Toronto? Is it, it cold? It is cold here, yeah. <laughs> it just, the weather just changed. Yeah, it's it's getting chilly. <laughs> mm. well, Meg, Meg, thank, thank you very you so much, much for stopping coming by. by. Yep. My pleasure. Thank you for doing this. This is a this is a trip, and it's a lot of fun. It's so wonderful to see so many people. But the panic the panic has like lowered just a notch. So we're we're doing good so far. No, you're doing great. This is wonderful. I love your soft, bright sense yes. of kindness. We'll talk to you when Unsub Four comes out. Hopefully, awesome, great. <laughs> thanks, guys. I'll be I'll be watching. All right, thanks. We'll see you later. Hey, Jennifer, Bye. how are you? Hello, Jennifer. I think she's frozen for a second. Oh, is she frozen? All right, she. We've had some, there, there she Oh, goes. fast forwarded too. I'm good. How are you guys? We're Ooh. great. I feel like I'm getting deja vu. Didn't we do this before the <laughs> pandemic? <laughs> right. Yeah, that was a little different back then. So I think my, uh, my you know what my Wi-Fi was working perfectly all day, and now suddenly. Mean. We've, we've, okay, we've had a so, few glitches. Yeah. Hi, Kim. Now nah, we're doing fine. <laughs> I'm also in Toronto and having trouble with my Wi-Fi. It's a thing. It's like, <laughs> it was working fine all day. And then I hop on and suddenly it's your connection is unstable. I'm like, that's rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jennifer, quick question. And it has nothing to do with writing, but it's a critical thing to ask. Um, you're a big Seahawks fan. <laughs> and today is the final NFL draft day. Who would you like to see brought onto your team in the last oh, opportunity? Trade deadline. Trade, yeah. trade deadline, Mike. Did I say trade or not? You said draft. Like I hear deadline. you guys laughing, draft but now trade. I missed what was coming. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mike, Mike asked uh, what it was trade deadline. He was wondering if there's a player out there. Repeat the question. It's that internet connection. And I don't know. I don't want to mess with anything. I think we're doing okay. You know, um, I'm sorry. I know I, I don't, it was working perfectly and now it's just being mean. <laughs> I don't think I would trade anybody. I think I, I don't want to jinx it. All right. Better left alone. So jar of hearts, um, kind of puts your career. I mean, you already were doing great, but I think jar of hearts feels like a pedal to the metal on the career. Did it feel like that to you as it was finding its way out into readers hands? Yeah, it felt like it accelerated things. Um, I mean, I felt like I'd flatlined. And I think that happens at multiple points in a writer's career where you just, your trajectory changes. Um, but Jar of Hearts definitely, it kicked me into a, a different gear. Uh, but you have to be careful what you ask for because then it comes with like more stuff. You know, it's not just your book is going out wider. There's also more people coming at you with reviews and requests and you're juggling promotion and not that I'm complaining but it's it was more than I was prepared for <laughs> at the beginning well you handled it great 
Uh, so can you tell us, can you tell us what's on the horizon for your fans? What can we expect next from you? I'm working on a new thriller. I, it's so early and I don't want to explain it because I tend to sound like I, I, I bore people with my pitch, but it's basically another thriller generational. Uh, like a grandmother share some violent tendencies and I want to kind of explore whether that pattern can be stopped if it's kind of already innate so that kind of stuff just you know inspires me <laughs> <laughs> nice well look who we have Ryan's deck KJ's back actually if you don't mind me just sticking my nose in for a second I just yeah. want to Beautiful shout out to Jennifer. Um, I met Jennifer um, at Thriller Fest the year she was a debut author and she was very nervous and I gave her a big hug and I felt like we bonded ever since that moment. And it was with the absolute delight and pleasure that I watched her win Jar for Jar Parts the Thriller Award. And I just feel like, oh my gosh, I just saw this person like a butterfly come into her own. And, and I, I think she's a very, very talented author and a really nice lady. Thank you. It really came full circle, you know, and I was, Kim has really been kind of part of that journey the whole way through. And, um, and so, yeah, and it makes me realize 10 years, it's not the longest anyone's been in the business, but it, it surprises me how long I've been around that I'm still doing this, but it's probably because I can't do anything else. Oh. So then you just, kind of, you just kind of do what's, what's, you know, what's in front of you. Well, you okay. mentioned that she was a sweet person and I completely agree when we, when we spoke with her on our, on the crew reviews, all I could think about was this person is sweet, adorable person. And she has these books that just make me go, holy crap. Every, <laughs> every page. And I love that dichotomy. I love that, uh, that you can, you know, ex I guess, exercise those demons on the page, so to speak. As so long well, as in the fact, that it's making Sean disappear in real time. Uh, <laughs> you're fading in your background there. Yeah, yeah sorry. Sean is, yeah, scary. sometimes, Sean, you're just ahead. It's kind of cool. <laughs> that's, how terrifying, that's how terrifying it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, no, 10 years is a long time. Uh, our next guest, who's about to come in, Mr. Jack Carr, uh, he's only been writing a couple of years, made a lot of noise in that time. I think he's about to pop in here. Jennifer, do you know Jack? We, we were on a panel for, uh, in 2019, we were both nominees. So we were on the, uh, the award nominee panel and that's how we met. Jack Carr, welcome to Night of a Thousand hey. Authors. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, how are you guys? This is hey. awesome. Good, hey. you're, you're kicking off our high powered hour. Uh, you are, we have this run of action thrillers, uh, authors coming on, uh, you first. What you been up to? Oh man, well you guys have been providing all my resistance today. So I've been down in the bunker, downstairs, <laughs> riding away, but I keep wanting to check in and see what's going on. And then if only I'd known ahead of time that I think this is being recorded so I can actually watch it later uh, instead of checking my phone all the time just to see who's <laughs> on and what they're saying. But it's been, it's been like a masterclass watching you guys interview all these amazing authors. It's, just, it's been incredible. You guys are doing fantastic. What a day. Well, yeah. well, well thank we get to say hello to you and goodbye because uh, we're gonna we're gonna bug out. Sean so is literally oh, fading man. into the sunset as we speak it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, well you just uh, back yeah. up. So that all we can see, see is your head floating. Yeah, we'll see you, Jack. <laughs> That's good. That's good, good to see you. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer, we'll see you soon. Yeah, see you soon. All right, Jack. Yeah. What's Carr. happening? Glad to catch up with you, man. It's been a while. You know, it's good to see you guys. This is good. What a great idea this has been. I mean, it seriously has been a masterclass, like for anybody, whether they're established or just starting out to have watched this all day and take notes. I mean, what a valuable experience for us. Well, it was your publicist who came up with the idea. Though I think we're giving him too much credit, honestly. I mean, you know, <laughs> he's, he's, he's sitting behind the scenes right now. Um, oh, no, he's watching. He's watching. Yeah, he, he is. Keep us looking, in watching, line. Judging. Keeping us in line. So, Jack, all right. When you're not banging out New York Times best-selling author uh, novels, I'm sorry, novels, uh, James Reese books, or hanging out with Joe Rogan or Chris Pratt, or shooting your bow and arrow on the beach <laughs> in the kind of badassery I will never, ever, ever be able to present. Uh, what are you doing right now during COVID lockdowns? How are you spending your time? 
I am juggling kids and chaos and insanity. And that was one of my takeaways from when I would pick up my phone to see who was on is that all these other authors seem so organized and have everything, had everything together. And meanwhile, I'm like getting texts like, hey, can you pick up my daughter at the bottom of the hill? Hey, we got this going on. We, it's just complete chaos all the time in our household. So it's juggling the chaos and trying to prioritize those things on my list, those things I need to do, like the, the edits for this fourth novel, The Devil's Hand, uh, the fifth scripts for the fifth out of eight uh, scripts for the Chris Pratt Amazon series uh, and all the other things that are that are juggling and in the works here. So uh, that's pretty much what I've been up to is uh, is juggling all that chaos. And it's uh, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. But uh, definitely looking forward to putting a couple of these things to bed, these scripts and and uh, and this uh, fourth novel and then take a breath and then get ready to charge into 2021. Well, you certainly de deserve a break, Jack. You've been working so hard. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I always feel it connected to you with is that I think we share um, a passion for the same novel, which kind of motivated us both to get into you know, writing thrillers. And that is David Morrell's Brotherhood of the Rose. Yep. And we loved it. Like, so, you know, when I read that, I just said to myself, if I could ever take someone in, in an adventure like that, I would be so happy. So can you walk us through what your experience of reading that book and how you felt? Absolutely. So I read, and I think I read it uh, before I read First Blood. I'll have to go back and, and think because I'm juggling so many novels in my head here. And I have, now I'm lucky enough to have a signed first edition of it, which is amazing. Uh, and then a couple other copies over there because I don't want to crack some of the bindings on, on some of the, the other ones. But uh, yeah, I remember I read it um, in probably eighth grade, I want to say. But uh, it was just such a magical experience for me. And I was already a reader because my mom was a librarian. So I grew up surrounded by all these novels. Um, I think I actually read the novelization of Rambo First Blood Part Two first. Because uh, I was about sixth, fifth or sixth grade uh, at that time, so I found that first, and that was kind of my my gateway to uh, to the books and to the films uh, and and all that. So I remember reading it. I remember that that magic of uh, just being so immersed and engaged with these characters, uh, wanting to know more about their backgrounds, uh, wanting to to go. And luckily, we got Fraternity of the Stone and League of Night and Fog uh, afterward. But still, wanting to know more and uh, just wanting to. Uh, they were like friends they were like people that you that you knew and for me people I wanted to be like in many cases wanting to join the military and go into that uh, the intelligence side and the special operations side of the house um, so I was reading about protagonists with backgrounds that I wanted to have in real life so it was it was so meaningful for me on 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 a few different levels there so um, and it was something that that motivated me that inspired me to go both into the military and then into writing these type of novels to hopefully give other people that same kind of an experience that I had reading it growing up. So um, yeah, just, uh, and David Morrell, of course, what a fantastic individual, an amazing person uh, and so fortunate. I know you know him well and, and I'm so fortunate to have gotten to know him a little bit here over the last uh, couple of years. And he's just, uh, what a fantastic human being. Jack, you mentioned the uh, prized signed first edition, Brotherhood of the Rose. I have uh, signed first editions of Terminalist, True Believer, Savage Son. Your books were basically out of print at one point this summer. Like, couldn't get them. I didn't realize how valuable those were already. Um, I'm holding on to them, man. Are you, so, A, are you back in print? And B, tell us about the next book. Yeah, so that was crazy. So at first it was kind of cool to have a, a book out of print, like you know, like yeah, no yet, that was kind of cool. Sold out everywhere for, for a couple of days, and then I was <laughs> like, well, hey, people, I want it to get back in stock so people can actually purchase it. Um, and then it was out for like a good, I'll, I'll say a good month and a half. It might be a little more than that, but um, but that was crazy to have that first novel uh, go out. So it is back, yes. But now just this week, the paperback is out. You can't find the paperback now, which is kind of crazy that that first novel so um so but if you search around i'm sure you can uh so yeah the fourth one uh, the devil's hand is coming out april 13th 2021 and in the editing process on that right now and of course i love every part of this process i feel so fortunate uh to be in this industry and to to, to be doing what i love to do and to be incorporating some of my past experiences into these fictional thrillers uh so yeah that hits shelves april 13th and uh, fired up to get that one out there. And as soon as I'm done with edits, because right now in the editing phase, uh, I'm thinking about that next novel, thinking about that fifth one and thinking about, okay, what do I need to like drop here and there throughout this? My last chance at these edits to drop any little nuggets that'll help 
propel the story forward into this fifth one. So I'm at that stage right now. And uh, yeah, I love all, I love every part of this process. Great. So Jack, I also have another shared interest that, uh, of yours. And that is I learned how to dry on a, you know, two-tone blue Land Cruiser standard. And it is, it was crazy with big, you know, mother truck and clunking, you know, standard and everything. And I was laughing so hard when I see all your Land Cruiser posts, because I'm probably, you know, one of the few people who really do love them. And because I've traveled all over the Middle East and Africa as well, they're everywhere, right? They're ubiquitous. So I would love to hear where you got your passion for Land Cruisers. Yeah, so I think it started in Afghanistan because we were using the Hiluxes at the time and we were modifying them with uh, with armor on the sides, doing it, we had mechanics doing some things to the engines. And I saw what those things could do over there, what they could do, like some of the Humvees that we had were a little big for some of the, the trails or roads that they had in Afghanistan, but these Hiluxes were just bomber. They were incredible. And so I think that's where it started. And then I started noticing Land Cruisers. And then I just love that iconic look of the Land Cruiser. Then I went to, to Africa, not with the military, and I got to see them over there. And I just developed this love and this passion for the, the Land Cruiser and for what they could do. And uh, it was just very natural for me to then incorporate that into the novels. Uh, it was very natural for the protagonist to have a vehicle that helped develop his character. Uh, just like I have another character who likes the Defender 110. And so that helps develop his character. He also likes 1911 45s and leather holsters where James Reese, my protagonist, he uh, likes Kydex holsters and uh, the nine millimeter striker fire type weapons. So I use all these things to help develop characters. And, uh, and I have a, happen to have a Land Cruiser sitting in the, in the garage and I based uh, the Land Cruiser in the novels off that one. So, uh, so I have a, a deep connection to, to the Land Cruiser and it's really cool that there is such a, a, a community of Land Cruiser aficionados who are just so uh, devoted to that to vehicle platform and uh, a lot of them have become fans of the novels. So that's, uh, it, it's been fantastic. Well, Jack, we're blowing right through your time. It is time to bring in our next guest, another buddy of yours, I think. Yeah. Mark Graney of the Gray Man Authors. He's here. He's going to be joining us momentarily. In fact, I think. All right, there he is. The newlywed. Mark, welcome is. to Night of a Thousand Authors, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Ryan? Uh, what's, what's happening, buddy? a little tired. Hey, Getting Jack. a little tired. Uh, hey, Kim. We're coming up on our, what, it's four now that we've been live or so? Um, a marathon. I love it this. It is a this marathon. Is Listen, having you two guys here is like, like you're competing for like who's gonna have the biggest like star-studded cast on on a film and movie adapt like i got chris pratt like i'm gonna get ryan gosling and chris evans like <laughs> this is amazing guys like seriously um no, it's thanks. so awesome they both have high profile stuff in the works mark uh yours is with netflix i believe right it's a it's a film and Correct. Jack, yours is a tv show with amazon yeah. Yep, that's right. That's right. So yeah, work as soon as we uh, sign off for the night, or as soon as I watch these next few interviews, then we'll be back to uh, editing script five and getting that back to the uh, to the writers' room and then to the the executives at Amazon who get to go through it with a red pen as well after I take a look. So it's a fascinating process. Well, Jack, we'll say goodbye, man. Keep us in the loop. Let us know how that's going, and uh, talk to you soon. Take right, care. Take care, Mark. See you soon. See you. So, Mark, how the heck are you, man? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks to you guys for doing this. This is a lot of fun. I've been tuning in uh, all afternoon. Thank you for being part of it. Um, sure. I was just teasing off camera that it's the most depressing thing in the world um, looking at your Facebook. <laughs> First of all, congratulations. You're recently married. I, I, you. Everyone else, I don't think you know how much 20 20 sucks for everyone else. Uh, Mark's just got a, a beautiful wife. They just had a beautiful honeymoon. Hit number one on the list this year. Big movie news. You are crushing this year, man. Congratulations on everything great that's happening to you. Thank you so much for saying that. We we, we tell each other how lucky and blessed we are. Uh, who knows what next year? <laughs> We're all going to get hit. We're going to hit, get hit by a meteor next year. But for now, things <laughs> are really good. <laughs> we love it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. So look, tell, tell us about the next book, uh, Relentless. That's a February 2021 book, right? How's it going? Uh, it's going well. Um, I was I had this like mini panic attack about 10 minutes ago going like, oh my gosh, do I have to pitch my next book? Because I really haven't, you know, gotten ready for that. But uh, it, I, it's all but done. I'm doing what's called the first pass pages. So my last read through of, of the whole story. And I'm about 250 pages out of the 528 pages. <laughs> And once I turn that back in, I will never read it again. But I've spent, uh, I started working on it in 
January or February, and uh, I've been working on it pretty much straight through. This one took a, a while to write. There's a lot of detail. There's a lot of different things in it. So uh, I'm happy to be at this stage, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it coming out in February. Well, Mark, you've certainly earned all this great stuff that's coming your way. I mean, Thanks, Kim. you really like buckled down and wrote like crazy amount of words every year. So can you just mm -hmm. give us a recap because you were doing Clancy novels and we all know how long they are. Plus your great yeah. man every year. Um, so I guess basically you committed yourself to just focusing on the career so that you could get to a certain place. Yeah, I, I say that I'd wanted to be a writer for 20 something years when I finally got my first book deal. And then for the first 10 years after getting that first book deal, I never said no to anything. <laughs> I was I was so excited to be, you know, like given the opportunities that I've been given that uh, I wanted to make the, the most out of them. So uh, my first book came out in 09 and um, I did some ghostwriting as well. So I was actually having two books writing two books in 09 and 2010. And then in 2011, I started uh, working with Tom Clancy and he passed away at the end of 2013, sadly. And his family asked me to continue that series. And I was bouncing back between that and Gray Man. So uh, Relentless, which will come out next year in 2021, will be my 20th uh, novel to be published. So I've, been, I've done two a year pretty much ever since. There's a That's amazing. That's really amazing. <laughs> so there's a wine name Relentless. So check it out for your, uh, you know, uh, whenever you launch that book. All right. I will. I will. Okay, good. That's perfect. I'll use it. Mark, uh, I, I mentioned the, the, the movie stuff kind of jokingly, but it's actually a huge news, man. It's incredible. The Russo right. brothers who did a couple small little films like Avengers uh, Endgame. Um, they're the ones doing this. Do you have any update on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the last I heard is they're supposed to start in January and uh, wow. it, think things are looking pretty well. I mean, I you know, who knows if COVID's going to derail this, but um, there are other uh, films being shot right now. So they're they're coming up with ways to do it care carefully in the time of COVID. Um, and yeah, I was surprised back in July. Uh, I'd, I'd heard for months that uh, Ryan Gosling was interested in it and there were going to be some rewrites to the script and this and that. Um, but I'd heard a lot of that stuff. I mean, I, I first, my book first sold to Hollywood in 2009. So there's really not a whole lot that was going to get me excited, um, no matter what people said, uh, and, until they finally kind of went ahead with this. And Netflix, Netflix uh, said they, they would agree to a $200 million budget and, and they were going to start shooting in January. So um, that's where we are now. And, and I couldn't be more excited. It's, I look at it as, a really great advertisement for my books. Yeah, <laughs> I don't really yeah. look at the, I don't look at the film as like an, a, you know, like a, its own thing. It's other, you know, I, I, I'm all I am is the writer and, and I, that's all I can, all I can do. It might bring new, new different types of readers too, by the way, like my wife does not love these kinds of books at all. And I was really yeah. geeked out the day this news broke and she's like, that's great. And I'm like, Ryan Gosling's in it. And she's like, Ooh, oh, I'm definitely going to watch what books are these? What's the books about? <laughs> uh, so, she, yeah. so you have a new fan now and my wife who's excited. That's awesome. That's uh, yeah. Terrific. Getting Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans involved does not hurt, uh, you know, bring, bring those types of viewers in. So yeah. congrats, man. I mean, this is awesome. Thank Hopefully you. it shoots in January. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And so now that you've had, you know, um, a few years in the business, Mark, what advice would you give people that are aspiring authors? I mean, it's a tough time in publishing, especially with COVID and the way things 2020 are going on. So how would you, you know, advise people to work towards breaking in? Um, my, my advice, there's a couple of things. It, it, my advice is always geared toward where people are in the process because some people need advice about earlier stages and some people need advice about, you know, which agent to select from, from a number of agents. But I, I, I really think uh, it's like the most important advice is just be yourself and don't try and chase what's big or what's popular. Um, you know, when I wrote Gray Man, I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel. I, I enjoyed the espionage genre and I just decided I would just try and execute my version of that and think about what I would like to read and, and, and wrote that book essentially. And I, it, it worked out for me. Had I tried to write the next, whatever was big back then, Dan Brown or, or Gone Girl or whatever was big when my first book came out, um, I would probably still be really languishing 
that. And, and I meet a lot of uh, newer writers at, at writers conferences and I, and I sometimes occasionally get, get the sense that they are trying to, you know, jump on a wave that might have already crested, or it will be crested by the time you know, Kim, how long it takes from when you your first inception of a book and, and, and when it actually, you know, ends up on shelves. Um, you just can't try and, you know, do the thing that's already been done before. You just have to do your own thing. Well, I am told our next guest is here, another buddy of yours, Brad Taylor. Yeah, uh, he's joining us now. I think he's coming in right now. See, that's the rumor, anyhow. It's the rumor. I mean, this is the power hour, man. This is where all the action thriller novelists are coming out. He's, he's very ninja. He's very stealthy. So he could be here and we wouldn't even know. That, that's the scary part. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, we'll wait on Brad, see if, uh, if he gets in. Um, in the meantime, Mark, um, yes, so I know you've you know, given a lot. Oh, here he is. Here he is right now. It's connected to audio. Yep. Um, we see him. We can talk about him now. Now he can talk back. Hey, Brad. That was, hey, that wasn't my fault. <laughs> I connected. It said, Elaine came running downstairs and saying, they're saying you're not there. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my ear. I'm hearing, don't blame the producer, but that's exactly who we're going to throw <laughs> under the HP mystery bus. Uh, Brad, thank you for coming on, man. How you doing? I'm doing very well. I didn't want to say that I had to jack my uh, laptop screen up so I looked normal. And so there's two good reasons for a Mark Greeny book. Agent in Place fit perfectly. Mission Critical was a little too big, but Agent <laughs> in Place is working perfectly. I stacked you up. I got, I got you some lift. I, exactly. It was like a facelift, basically. Read it, enjoy it, and then you can use it for something else. <laughs> Whatever the word count on that one was, Mark, that's your new target for, for each exactly, and every it's book. It's exactly what Brad needed. I'm very happy that I was able to. How you doing, Mark? Good that. to see you. It's good to see you, man. How's it going? It's going well. Well, you know, I'm stuck in the house. So, yeah. Yeah. It's good I getting am... to Memphis. That was about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. A, thank you so much for coming to my wedding. That's my that only was, trip. It, it, probably it was the whole year. <laughs> I was supposed to go to, uh, uh, I was like, I got to do book research, book research. And Croatia was the only place that would let us in. And so I was mm -hmm. like, okay, we're going to Croatia. And then the whole Europe, you know, turned into a COVID Shut nightmare. Shut back down. Yeah, yeah. I was like, God, if I get to Croatia, A, is it all going to be closed anyway? And B, are they going to say you can't come home? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Now I'm st That's... still stuck at home. Same but here. But I'm doing Same. this. I was supposed to be there right now. So here we go. Yeah, good. Well, Brad, we're going to get into uh, the new book in just a minute here. Mark, we got to keep things going, man. So we'll say bye to you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll look for you, uh, Relentless in February and for movie updates everywhere. I'm sure that will come out soon. Good luck. Thank, yeah. thank you all. Bye, Kim. Bye, bye, Brad. Bye, Brian. So, Brad, I've got with me American Trader. Yeah. Looks yeah. slick, man. I mean, this is a good car. I love a little backward R. I don't know if people can see that on here, but... Uh, Everything, everything's reversed for me. I keep touching the wrong. Yeah. I don't know how weatherman do it. Like, honestly, uh, we I, the pregame, I couldn't even point to my own name. Everything's reversed. And so um, uh, people kept saying your head's tilted a little bit and I'd tilt it farther because it's all reversed. <laughs> I didn't know which way to go here. <laughs> so this R, it's reversed, but it's just a slick cover. Not only that, it's a great book. I just finished it a couple of days ago. Um, tell readers a little bit about it, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, actually, it's uh, um, the... Uh... I, I first got the idea for this thing when I was writing about uh, um, Operator Down. I was in Lesotho doing research for in Africa, and there was uh, and I had to see the Parliament buildings and things like that because it's about a coup. And they had everything was there was built and it was brand new, and they had a bunch of Chinese lettering, which I assume said something like "You have to wear a hard hat" or something like that. And I said, "Why is it all Chinese lettering?" And they said, uh, um, "Well, the Chinese are doing this out of the goodness of their heart." And I was like, eh, I don't think so. If they're doing this for free, there's a reason for that. And then the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative came up and I, I still do security consulting. And there was a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and the Belt and Road Initiative. And then the Taiwan Strait started bubbling up. And this was probably a year and a half ago. Now it's all over the news. Um, and I thought, there's a book there. They're gonna, there's a, something's gonna happen between the Chinese, the Taiwan Strait in between Taiwan. And that kind of was the genesis of it. I love the authenticity in your books, Brad. For me, that I, I feel like a resonance of verisimilitude. 
And so thanks, you know, for your background and your research, because it's evident in every page. Um, I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite fan moment? What, what stands out in your mind of all your experiences touring and such? <laughs> favorite fan moment, believe it or not. And this actually goes back to Mark Reedy. We okay. were at SHOT Show uh, for Thriller Fest, signing a bunch of books. And uh, his publisher gave him a lot more books than my publisher gave me. And I ran out of books. And this guy came running up. We were in the 511 booth. And the guy came running up and said, I've got to have one of your books. I've got to have one of your books. And I said, I, I'm out of books. Sorry. He said, my mom's a librarian. She loves your books. I'm going to be crucified if I don't come home with your book. And I happened to be working on the next book, as every author is doing. And I said, uh, well, I've got a manuscript here that I'm working on right now. I can tear a page out of it. It had handwritten notes in it and all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, I said, I can sign that for her and you can take this one page home. I don't have any more books. And so he was like, that'd be the greatest thing ever. Well, then I went to a book signing and uh, this lady walked up with the page in a frame and it was her. And that was probably my best fan moment. She was just enthralled by that. I had given her, a, you know, I torn a manuscript page out and just signed that and given it to her, which was nothing to me because I'd already finished the edits actually on that section, but she thought it was the greatest thing ever. And it was really a kind of a bonding moment, which when it was like three circles of separation where I met this guy, then I went here and then there she was and she had it with her. That is a great story. Um, and it leads into my question too, which is you're not the only superstar at your own book signings, I'm told. Is it true that people want your wife, the deputy commander of everything, oh, yes. she's so known, they want, they want Elaine to sign books now too, right? Yeah, they do. <laughs> Actually, it's happened quite a few times. They're like, she's supposed to be taking the pictures. And they're like, no, 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 I want you in the picture. And I want you to sign this book. And so she does, because she keeps me on track for everything. She's the one that was just screaming at me, Ryan. You texted her. She came back. Are you not signed in? I said, I am signed in. I don't know what's going on. Well, here's the deal. We are like four hours in and we're on schedule. And so we have our producer in our ear barking at us, you know, get this person in. Now, Jeff's the sweetest man ever. So he's not barking, you know. So and so is here. Let's get him in. And he said, "Hey, you know, Brad's not here yet." And so, uh, so I did. I I'm looking at a all. screen that says, "Next, next thank thing you for I joining. get is the next thing I get from Jeff is, oh, you know, my bad. He's here. He was right on time.'" And I thought, "Of course he was, Mister Military. He's right on time. He was here, ready to go." Um, uh, so no, that so that was why. But yeah, she got you on. I mean, hey, look, you know, I think that's awesome. I do not have a signed book from you and the deputy commander of everything. So I'm going to come down to a book signing one day. Uh, yeah, if we ever have them again, that'd be great. If we ever have them again, that's right. That's absolutely right. Um, so how are you passing time in quarantine? Uh, well, it, the uh, we have not been able to travel, and it's, it's well, I'll just be honest with you, it sucks. Yeah, it <laughs> it just sucks. We do go out and shoot. I, we've gone to the range a couple of times because that's kind of a solitary type thing. So my wife and I went out there and, and uh, it, there's certain things you can do that are solitary, but for the most part, it's just horrific. I hate it. If you could travel now, where would you like to go? I'd like to go back to Europe and Croatia and do some book research. I have a book due. So, <laughs> I, well, you're like so to... known for traveling. That's like one of your things. You have all these great travel research stories. So how has that impacted you writing the next book? That, well, the one that uh, the American Trader didn't impact me at all. It impacted the writing process. Uh, I, I mean, it went all over Taiwan. It went over Australia. And we traveled up and down. That, that whole thing came out because the DCOE wanted to go dive the Great Barrier Reef. And I'm like, I got no plot for, you know, Australia. And China started bubbling up. And so I said, well, we're going to go to Taiwan. I had some friends in Taiwan that we went and help, that helped us with the research. And so I looked at, Thai, at uh, Australia and I started doing the research and there's just an enormous amount of James Bond espionage intrigue between China and Australia. It's just incredible. So much so that it kind of took over the book. I was like, this is just, I mean, this is a book in and of itself. <laughs> and so I said, well, I guess you get to you know, die the Great Barrier Reef. We had to go to Cannes, which has nothing to do with it. It's all around Sydney and everything. So I said, we'll go there, there we'll go up here. You can go dive the reef. But the rest of it was, uh, um, and of course, Elaine, once again, said, you know that Taiwan's not anywhere near Australia, right? Because I'm geographically challenged. I was like, no, it's kind of like Georgia and South Carolina. We just go right <laughs> to each other. And she's like, no, it's a nine-hour flight. And I'm like, okay, whatever, make it happen. If you want to dive the reef, we're going to Taiwan. And then you can dive the reef, we'll go to Australia. And so we went running around all over Australia 
and uh, it was a lot of good fun. And then when I got back to write the book, then we got locked down. And usually I do the research and then I kind of fast forward when I'm writing the book, it's kind of set when the book's going to come out, which is sure. you know, sure. generally eight months later, a year later. Well, this was a huge change. It was not a you know, little bitty change. It went from everybody's running around the world to nobody's doing anything but locked in a house which made a huge problem. I'm like, how am I going to write about that? I mean, if you're going to do a surveillance operation down the streets of Melbourne and everybody's gone, the only people on the road are going to be the target and Pike Logan. You can't do that. And if there's no flights, you're not doing any globe trotting. If there's none, you know, everything changed. And so I uh, said, okay, I'm going to set it at the exact same time I did the research. And that's what I did. And it actually worked out because the whole thing focuses on the Taiwanese elections and that's what's happened right there at 2020, 2021. So it worked out. So, well, we're going to know down the road, by the way, if you have a book set in the Bahamas or the Caribbean that Elaine wanted to take a vacation somewhere and you had to work the plot around I'll it. tell you right, right now, that's about the only <laughs> yeah. place I can go. So next book might be there. <laughs> that's Hey, we love it. Um, so we, we had our first uh, missed author of the night. Um, so we're, we're just uh, kind of vamping. Brad, thank you for joining us. Uh, Bob to Goni, you, we're going to try to get him in later, but uh, from right Ken, now, we're, we're going to switch gears. You, thank you, Brad. Talk soon. All right, Mike. See you later. See you, Brad. Do I Hello. sign out? How are you? <laughs> yeah, you could just jump off there. No one knows what to do now. It's our yeah. first best writer. We're all adjusting. <laughs> well, hello, Tosca. <clears throat> Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? You're doing great. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. My pleasure. We just scared my dog. My dog just leapt up off the floor. <laughs> oh, no. Too many voices at once, huh? <laughs> uh, hey, so we're streaming uh, on the Facebook of your local bookstore, Bookworm of Omaha. Mm, hey, Bookworm. Hello. Say hi to your locals there. Absolutely. We love the Bookworm here in yeah. Nebraska. Yeah. You know, like you, um, I, I've written on the subject of pandemic before yeah. COVID actually emerged. <laughs> and you released two titles in 2019, The Line Between and A Single Light, both dealing with mm -hmm. kind of country ravages. How did you react when you were learning about COVID in light of, you know, your recent releases? Well, I just thought, no. <laughs> I, did, I didn't make this happen, did I? <laughs> no. And then, you know, some more things happened and I thought, you know, this is... Um, it's a little surreal. This sounds kind of eerily familiar. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, having studied it kind of made it worse, I think, in a way, because when you sure. study it, you learn that, you know, it's not a question of if, but when. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> it's been a weird year all around. So. Well, with a single light, you at least have a plan for post-apocalyptic post, uh, pandemic, right? Yeah, an underground doomsday bunker in a silo. Yeah, there you go. That's, That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Which we happen to have some of those around here in Nebraska. So, um, and if you have a cool extra million laying around, you know, you can you can buy a share in some of those uh, in various locations. So, that's the plan. I'll, I'll have to earn the million first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually want to go back a little further in your career because you wrote one of the most thought provoking pieces of fiction I've read with um, Iscariot, a novel of Judas. And uh, I want to know you. what compelled you to tell his story and mm -hmm. how you went about the research. Um, it was an editor friend who said, I think you should tell this story. And I said, absolutely not. It's, it's too hard. And I'm not sure I want to do that. And I write in first person a lot too. Mm -hmm. So this means writing in first person as the infamous betrayer of Christ. And I was working as a management consultant at the time, and I was in New York City um, on work, and I was eating at a restaurant by myself, and it had a paper tablecloth. And, you know, those are irresistible to people like me, especially <laughs> if I have a pen in my purse, right? <laughs> and so I'm eating dinner by myself, having had a long day of work, and I'm scribbling on the thing. And I realized I had written a scene between a young Judas and his mother. And, you know, we don't think of Judas Iscariot as ever having been a child or had a mother or anything like that. And I just thought, oh, no. And I tore the thing off and I shoved it in my purse and I called my agent the next day and I thought he'd talk me out of it and say, this is a terrible idea. And he said, I, I, I think you should do it. And so I, I really put it off for a long time. I fought it because I was scared, frankly. I was, yeah. I was, yeah. I was scared. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. 
Um, the research, uh, I was cowed by the research, but in the end, I um, enlisted a small army of experts, and I went to Israel with the Biblical Archaeology Society, and I devoted a year and a half of my life to, you know, becoming a student wow. before I ever even started outlining. So um, it was a very meaningful experience, but it was a very long experience, too. Now, you you co-wrote with Ted Decker, is that true? I did. Mm-hmm. Well, how was that for you? How was how is- you know, co-authoring something versus writing, you know, for your, for yourself? How did you find uh, those two different worlds? Yeah, so I'm, I'm asked this a lot. And, you know, and I, I've known many writing teams. And as far as I can tell, no two writing teams ever do it the same. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, I always tell people, you know, if you're interested in doing something like this, the best advice I can give is to know what strengths you're bringing to the table and how they complement the strengths of your writing partner. Um, For Ted and I, it was a very unlikely and kind of a strange partnership because he had just come from writing serial killer novels and I just come from writing biblical fiction. And then afterwards he went and wrote biblical fiction and I wrote, um, you know, thrillers. So, um, but you know, it requires a lot of compromise, but I think the secret is you really have to know what your strengths are and you have to, you have to write with someone you trust. Right. Yeah. Well, as far as that writing process, uh, I believe I was told you live on a farm. Is that correct? I do. Yep. That- and I'm waiting for the coyotes to go off in the background because <laughs> that happens about this time of night. So, Do you find that, I mean, yeah. I know we're all inspired by different things. Is, is that setting a, a ideal setting for you writing? Oh, it's wonderful, especially during a pandemic, because, you know, you can look out and you can see the countryside, you can go and walk around, you don't have to mask up to be out here. You know, we're, we're miles away from anybody. Um, You know, that said, I do miss traveling, because I find traveling to be, you know, really inspirational. It's something that always, you know, kind of got my imagination going. Um, That's probably the thing that I miss the most this year. Um, but gosh, if you're going to weather a pandemic, a farm sure is a good place to do it. Absolutely. So true. <laughs> do you find, do you yeah. find kind of the dichotomy of country living versus a career that really involves communicating with people and, and being in front of people? Do, do you find that kind of odd or does that seem normal to you? I think it's great. I'm an introvert like so many of us. So, you know, I like to kind of be quiet, hang out in my sweatpants, the same ones I wear the day before, you know, and just kind of <laughs> do my thing. And I, you know, like to go do the interviews and be on for a while, but, you know, it's great to be able to just go retreat and be quiet and, you know, have that quiet around you. Um, But, you know, that said, I also miss, you know, going off to New York City to Thriller Fest and things like that, because, you know, that's a break from the quiet of the country. But then at the end, it's always good to come back. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tosca, we we really appreciate you coming on and spending time with us. uh, Oh, thanks. Sharing some info. Wish we had more time to talk, but the show must go on. So that's right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. See you later. You too. Welcome, Allison. <laughs> Hi, Allison. Tag, tag out. Tag in. <laughs> <laughs> Coming off the top rope. <laughs> so how are you tonight? I feel completely inadequate because I've been popping in and out all afternoon, <laughs> and I heard um, Jack Carr and Jim Rollins and a little bit of Steve Barry, and I'm like going. What am I doing here? <laughs> oh, we know why you're here. <laughs> and then I have this boring background because my books are all over there and I just have my window behind me. You just didn't want and to show off. These, okay. like, great offices and that's why we have the that's why we have these green screens because the only lighting I can get is with the worst background. So it's a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I keep fading in and out of the background. Uh, well, anyway, we want to thank you first of all for coming on and um thank you. Want to, talk about your career. I know you have a cold as ice was just recently out and then tell no lies is coming right around the corner. So yeah. talk about both of them. Well, um, cold as ice, uh, is the 17th book in a series, my Lucy Kincaid series. And I, um, uh, it's really kind of bizarre because the tell, well, I have to go back and forth between those two series and they're completely different characters. I mean, they're both FBI agents, but they're, different personalities but for me I love that because you know Lucy's very by the book she follows the rules she has a very big um, family and a support structure and then Cara Quinn who is in Tell No Lies was raised by con artists she's an undercover cop 
um, doesn't have the same support structure and she kind of tends to bend the rules a little bit or walk the line. Walk so it, it's really fun going back and forth between the two characters. You're the most thrillers have sometime, well, not to say most, but a lot of thrillers have romantic elements. And then there's thrillers that are classified as romantic thrillers. What do you see that difference and what, what pushes a book forward into a more romantic thriller uh, genre than the, than the others? Um, I think the Lucy Kincaid series might be considered romantic thrillers. They don't really have any sex on the page or anything, but they have a relationship between Lucy and her husband. And they weren't married at the beginning of the series. Now there are 17 books in. They got married. They should have. Otherwise, they should have broken up because after that minute, that long of time, you either know or you don't know. Yeah. Um, but I think because the stories kind of go through, um, they grow both individually and as a couple through the course of the series. But the books themselves focus on the suspense elements. Whereas um, in Kara's series, she, the romance is incidental. I mean, if she has a relationship that's incidental to the plot of the story and to her personal journey as she grows, um, hopefully she grows over the course of the series. I, you know, the second book is coming out. So, I mean, I have a little bit of time to work with her. <laughs> oh, good. Well, you, you mentioned jumping back between those two characters, but when you started out, you started out with a, a handful of trilogies um, that mm -hmm. came out. When you got to Lucy, was she planned as a trilogy as well? Or did you know you wanted to spend more time with that character? I wanted to write a series for her, but I wasn't sure I could sell my publisher on it. So I sold them on a trilogy with her. Uh -huh. And so they published the three books and I kind of had a, a three book story arc um, with Lucy and Sean so that I could, um, so that if it ended after the third book, I wouldn't feel bad but I had so many ideas. I want to show how she got into the FBI Academy. I wanted to set a mystery at Quantico because I had toured Quantico and I really wanted to do something cool there. Um, and I had all these other ideas. So once, when the books did pretty well, they said, okay, I, I then moved over to Minotaur. They said, yeah, we want more Lucy's. We love her character. So I said, yay. So now we have 17. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna ask you, it, it, if you had known at the beginning, if you were going to write 17 and, and beyond, <laughs> would you have, would you have started a little differently or would you have developed the characters a little differently uh, than, than maybe what your thought process was at the beginning? Probably not because I think the characters, they kind of, I don't plot. So the story kind of evolves as I write it and it evolved the way it was supposed to. And I think if, uh, I had known I was going to write 17 books. I might never have started because it would have felt overwhelming. Oh, I like to be able to, okay, I have three books I need to write or I'm contracted for three books. That's what I need to focus on. And then I can, it, that's workable. But if you're like all of a sudden think, oh, I'm going to write 50 books, like, you know, Nora Roberts and <laughs> death series. Then you're thinking, oh my gosh, how oh, am I going to come up with 50 ideas for these characters? There's no way. So I, you know, I like doing things in like two or three book chunks. Um, like I know the Quinn and Costa series is it going to be at least four books. That's what I sold. I sold four books. If it ends at four, I know that that fourth book, um, which I just wrote up the synopsis for, um, it would be a good place to stop if I had to, but I do have more ideas. So if they say, Hey, these are doing well, we want more books. I'll go. Yay. But I don't want to have to think about that because then it makes it a little overwhelming. Hmm. So you're not leaving anything on the table. <laughs> no, I mean, I, every book has to be the best book I can write at this moment in time. And right, I'm right. not going to like hold things back because I'm saying, oh, I'm going to save that for another book. I mean, unless of course, you know, it becomes too cumbersome for the plot, then, you know, okay, I can't kill off all of those people in this book. I'm going to have to save somebody to kill next book. <laughs> but, uh, other than that, you know, I think you want to do your best with every single book you have. Do, do you find that, jumping back and forth between um, protagonists and, and stories from your series to other books. Do you think that keeps you sharp from a, you know, from a narrative standpoint, do you think it's easier not to kind of fall into, I don't know, not, not, not boredom with the writing, but just kind of too much of a routine. I think it does keep me excited about the stories. I think when I can, you know, I could write a Lucy book, and then I can go and completely switch. And sometimes it might take me a couple of weeks to get back into the groove with my other characters because they are different. Um, 
But then I can write that story and I get really excited about it. And then when I go back to Lucy, I feel like, oh yeah, I, have, I know these people. I can now write another story for them. And it, it also, I think if I'm bored, my readers are gonna be bored. So by being able to go back and forth between two series, it helps me stay excited about both series. Well, pre, pre-COVID, when we were all out touring and doing book signings and whatnot, what, what, were, what was maybe the most memorable time you can think of when you interacted with fans in any one particular place? What, what kind of comes to mind when, when you think back on that? Uh, for, I don't do a lot of book tours because <laughs> <laughs> um, I have five kids and going out a lot uh, is, is t- difficult. I, I will say the most fun I had was probably... Um, we had a great event with Christina Dodd and Paige Shelton at the Poison Pen. And that was a lot of fun. We had a great turnout and everybody had terrific questions. And I absolutely love it when readers come with like a bunch of books because then I know they really do read my books and especially (laughs) if they're like born and stuff. And I'm like, well, you really do love my books. You read them more than once. (laughs) Um, I really do enjoy that. And then the readers get engaged because they're already engaged with the character. And so it makes you feel like your characters are real because I feel like they're real because I'm writing them and I know that sounds odd but Mm -hmm. if I don't think they're real then they're not going to be three-dimensional on the page so to have that conveyed to a reader and have them share that with me just it really excites me (laughs) it makes me happy that I've accomplished my goal yeah right well we we really appreciate you coming on tonight we've enjoyed our discussion um and we uh you know if you have if you haven't gotten out there and gotten uh, cold as ice yet, get it and then pre-order. Um, hang on. What's, what's the next one? Tell no lies. Tell no lies. Gosh. Tell no lies. Yes. <laughs> like, I love that your body disappears when you're talking. I know. I, I, I'm it's it's starting to frustrate me. So a good. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Allison, thank you very much for coming on and spend time with us tonight. Thank you. Love to have you Take on. care. Good night, everyone. I can. Hey, beautiful lady. Uh, so anyways, I would love to take a minute just to mention a few of our partners. First of all, one more shout out to our amazing producer, Jeff Ayers, who is in an outstanding job in keeping this on time, which is remarkable given there's 50 plus authors. And of course, David Brown from Simon & Schuster, um, Atria Mystery Bus, who is driving steadily at this at a very good pace, keeping us rolling as well. And- Hasn't done a single thing yet, but yes, he has been so... So helpful to this process. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> David, uh, David's been great. I want, I do want to thank Jeff real quick. I was just talking to him a second ago off camera. Uh, the four of us get to kind of sub in and out. This is great. New writers are coming. Jeff is the one constant sitting there all the time, making sure people get in and get out. He has been fantastic. So Jeff, thank you for helping the show go smoothly. Yeah. And, and I'd like to give a, a quick shout out as well to a few of the people, like our partners that are broadcasting this, in, including bookmarks from Winston-Salem, uh, the Bookworm Omaha, Auntie's Bookstore in Spokane, Washington, Village Books in Bellingham, Washington, Novel Suspects, Atlanta Writers Club, and the Doylestown Books- Bookshop in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and Romance in P- Pasadena, California, Murder by the Book in Houston. I've been there and I had a great time. The great print- bookstore. Yeah, they're all these. These are all amazing. Print Bookstore in Portland. Um, the South Dakota Humanities Council is covering us and a likely story in Sykesville's as well. So with that, we will now bring on my fellow Trontonian. There he is. Look at that. Hi, Linwood. Hello. (laughs) Still working on a candy bar. I'm jealous. I'm honestly kind of, I wish someone run me a candy bar right about now. <laughs> we, it's been a long night. Uh, I feel like we could do a Snickers commercial at this point. Someone give me one and, and we'll turn back into good hosts. Um, Linwood, thank you for coming on, man. How you doing? I'm just great. How are you guys? Good, thanks. What kind of candy bar is it, Linwood? We'd love to know your taste. Well, it was, I'm actually at my uh, sister-in-law and brother's last place, just a few blocks from where we live. And they had leftover Halloween stuff, and I grabbed. I just scored a coffee crisp. You know, one of these little guys about that big. My favorites, absolutely. So, Linwood, as you know, I'm a massive fan of your work, and especially Elevator Pitch. I thought that was just such a great book. Um, I've never been able to walk in an elevator the same way, and it is absolutely evocative. 
Now, I know we've talked before about this, but I, I want our viewers to hear that you did an enormous amount of research and actually you know, spent time with an elevator specialist. Can you give us a snapshot of the things you learned about elevators that might surprise us all? Yeah, I tried to think of everything too that could go wrong in an elevator. And of course, I wrote the book uh, you know, a couple of years ago, so I didn't have getting onto an elevator with somebody who had the coronavirus. But, um, but, what, but what I did was, there's uh, one of the big skyscrapers in, in Toronto the fellow who's sort of in charge of all of that, he gave me like good part of a day and we went all through the whole thing and so forth. And we do really cool stuff. Like we get, we take the elevator to the 17th floor, we'd get off and he had this gadget that would keep the doors open and we'd send the elevator down to the 16th floor. So we could look at the ceiling, the roof of the elevator and get on it and look up the shaft and all these really cool things. And, and the really neat thing was he was holding this device that was like a really large TV remote. And I said, so what is that? And he said, well, with this device, he said, I can control every elevator in the building and everything that it does, up, down, doors, closed, all that sort of stuff. And I said, wow, that'd be something to get a device like that. He says, I oh, get them on eBay for 500 bucks. And I thought, yes, that's so important. <laughs> I said, well, that's, not, that's probably not very comforting news to a general member of the public, but for a thriller writer, I thought, oh, I love this. Now, you know, to, to sort of figure out how to use that and to sort of, if you bought one of those devices, get it to interface with a building security system and so forth, it wouldn't be easy. And if I taken a couple of liberties, maybe, but that device exists. And that made all the difference when I was writing elevator pitch and had a guy who was, you know, dispatching his victims by sabotaging elevators all over Manhattan. Yeah, you're, you're going to be the reason I end up getting in shape, man. I have not read, wrote an elevator, I think, since I read. I'm just taking the stairs everywhere right now. It's the book really was intended as a public service to get yeah. people, you know, climbing the stairs and looking after their health. That's all it, that's all it mattered to me was that people get in shape. Hey, Ryan, before you jump into your question, I just have a quick follow up. Yeah. So those new elevators that you, you know, you punch them where you want to go and then it comes to you. Is there, did you talk to him about that? Is there any difference in the way they work or can they be overrided just the same? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I know that there's some very fancy ones now where you just, you, you pick a floor and then you go to that elevator and so forth. I started to, I made it simpler. So I didn't really get into that. I just wanted to be able to kill people. And, mm -hmm. and it was great. I said to him, when I told this lovely guy, I said, but I was a little afraid to tell him why I was pumping him for information. Because when I thought, well, I'm going to tell this guy, I want to write a thriller about this guy who's killing people with elevators. Maybe he's not going to want to talk to me. So I tell him, this is what I'm planning to do. He looks so excited. He says, oh, I know exactly how you can kill people with an elevator. He couldn't have been happier. He just had all kinds of great stories to share. I love it. That is terrifying. Uh, <laughs> Linwood, you credit the legendary Margaret Lawrence for helping shape your writing. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the influence she's had on you? Yeah, so Margaret Lawrence, perhaps not as well known outside Canada, but she should be. She was really one of Canada's most premier literary writers through the 60s and the 70s. And she was the writer in residence at Trent University where I attended. And so I was taking my, you know, so you could, as an aspiring writer, you could go book an appointment with her and have her, you know, look at your stuff and critique it and so forth. And, and we became very good friends uh, subsequently after that. And the funny thing is, so I wasn't a big reader of sort of literary fiction at the time. I was reading crime novels and all kind of stuff. But I go to see her and she's really nice and she's reading my things. And, and I thought, you know, I really should, should read her stuff. So between the end of one, one year school year and the, the fall, over the summer, I read a whole bunch of her books. And, um, and so she was back as writer in residence in September. So I went to see her the first time I went to see her. I said, you know, I felt kind of bad that you were reading my stuff and I hadn't read yours. So I read it over the summer, it was pretty good. And I thought, what a jerk she must have thought I was, you know, and you sort of, yeah, you know, your stuff's not bad. But um, she was wonderful and she was very encouraging. And, and even when I got my first newspaper job at the Peterborough Examiner, if I had some big front page story, because she lived in Lakefield and she got the Peterborough Examiner, the phone would ring and she'd say, hey, kiddo, that was something. That was great. You know, so she was a real booster. And which authors were you reading that inspired you to pursue the suspense genre like or were, were there other genres you were thinking about or was it just automatic that was going to be your place to be 
it was never anything else. It, and it still wouldn't be because I just do it. You go with what you like and your strengths. I mean, when I was, you know, I started out reading the Hardy Boys and then I were on grade five or grade six. I think I graduated. I started reading Agatha Christie and then I was reading all the Nero Wolf novels by Rex Stout. And then at the age of 15, there was this kind of revelation when I discovered the novels of Ross MacDonald, who's, mm -hmm. you know, his Lou Archer character. I became obsessed with those more than anybody else to the point that I wrote to him. I had a long correspondence with him. I had dinner with Ross McDonald one night when I was 21 years old that I'll never forget. And so I think that those, certainly Ross McDonald, I think more than anybody at that time was my, was my biggest influence. Who, he was a guy who was taking the conventions of the crime novel and doing more with it. He was using it to explore things like environmentalism and family dysfunction and all that kind of stuff. So he was, he was really important to me. Mm -hmm. Linwood, this has become my, uh, my favorite question of the night because we've got some great answers uh, from a lot of different writers. But what is your best fan story? Do you have a really great one? Oh, geez, just off, I, I, should, I should have been prepped. I should have had some sort of an idea. I have, I have one that's kind of, that's a little different. That's the only first one that comes to mind. And that was a woman who came up to me a couple of years ago to get a book signed for her son, who I think was in his early 30s, late 20s. And he had uh, dyslexia or something like that, uh, a, a reading disability, and yet was very successful in business. He was, did very, he was doing great, but he couldn't read. And she had suggested that he read probably one, one of my books, I think it was No Time for Goodbye. And not only did he get through it, but he was reading everything and it was that my books had turned him an adult difficult reader into a real consumer of that kind of material that meant a lot that was nice absolutely well um linwood we would love it if you would just uh, stay to welcome our next guest who is david morrell oh i believe you know Canadian that, guy, right? yeah, exactly we're a bit of a canada moment here uh, and uh hello david and um, it's, it's always fun, you know, to reconnect with everybody because we're all stuck at home. So this is a really fun way of overlapping guests and just having people connected. David, welcome. How are you tonight? Hi, I'm doing fine. And yourself? Excellent. So you remember, of course, Linwood. And, you know, do you know Ryan Stead? No, I'm not sure I do. No, I don't. Have we met? We no. met at Millerfest at the dinner. But uh, I was just thinking you, I was just talking about Ross McDonald, but you would probably know about Margaret Miller and so forth because you're from around the Kitchener area, aren't you? Yes, yes. The, the, um, he went to the KW Collegiate School, yep. and that's a very well-known school in, in, in Kitchener. Uh, and um, at the time, nobody, uh, when, I was, when I was there, nobody had made the connection, but later on, people understood that he had uh, spent, that sounds funny, spent time at the school it sounds like a prison yeah, he, but he was a teacher there and then and then met his wife the noted crime writer margaret miller from was from kitchener i guess and that's where they met i think it's well, it's a it's a it's a wonderful connection and uh, uh i'm i'm you know proud to have that connection well uh dave before i dive in and ask you a couple questions uh linwood we got to keep the show going we're back on time we had a few uh technical mishaps and all that so we'll say goodbye to you. We'll keep this going. Thank you so much for stopping Take by. Care. Have a good night, guys. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. David, um, uh, first of all, big fan. Uh, thrilled to Thank find you. Back Thank you. Love all your work. Um, biggest, biggest question I've got on Twitter of the night, people dying to know, uh, what's going on with your next book? Well, um, I've been working on a Western uh, I finally decided that what I do, it's not that I'm turning my back on, on thrillers, but as I look back over, this is what, 48 years now, um, I've been experimenting with genres. If you look at First Blood, it's outdoor action. Brotherhood of the Rose is espionage. Uh, Creepers is non-supernatural horror. Um, Murders of Fine Art is a Victorian mystery thriller. And uh, I had written a Western back in 1977 called Last Revelry. And uh, my mind has just been going back to that genre. So that's what I've been working on. I do have a, a, a thriller that I had 
been working on, but um, what's happening in the thriller world is happening so fast and changing so dramatically. I, I, I'd hate to be in the spy business now because plots that would have been considered outrageous in a spy novel 10 years ago now are whether they're real or not, they're flying across the media and in news, we can call it fake news, we can call it real news, but these would have, every day, the mechanism that would have been for a, for a spy novel. So I, I couldn't go in that direction. And uh, I, uh, the thriller I was working on, um, the market kept changing. I don't follow the market, but it's not like I'm gonna write a book that I know isn't gonna be accepted. And the one I was working on was not domestic noir. It was not um, an unreliable narrator uh, in, a, in a world where your worst enemy is your best friend kind of thing. So I just stepped back and I've been working on my Western and it's become eternal. I'm on my seventh draft, which has never happened to me before. Well, just know, David, that we're all waiting to read it. <laughs> well, as am I. Uh, it keeps, honestly, when I say seven drafts, uh, I mean, this isn't just fooling around with rearranging paragraphs. This is major rethinking of the text. It, I've only done, I've, normally I do three drafts. I do a long one and then I edit it and it's a short one. And that's obviously for me too short. So in the middle, I, I find a mill range, but I've never had one where, I, well, I shouldn't say that. I did an all called The Totem. It's non-supernatural horror. It, it, it's, in, it's cited in a book called The Horror 100 Best Books. Um, and when I, it was 550 pages. And when I gave it to the, my editor, he didn't get it. And, and First Blood had not yet been a film. So I didn't have the, I didn't have the clout that I now have. So he said, I don't get it, cut it by half. And I said, all right. So I turned it into, I wrote it in blank verse and I changed, and no, very few people know this, but the 1979 version of the novel is in blank verse. Obstinately, I did this and, and I shortened it and I changed the plot, but I always loved the longer, bigger, epical version. And that finally was published in 1993. So I've done two, two, two versions of that story, but I've never, in this case, done, I don't know, it's, it's been fascinating, but I have to say it's frustrating. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. But I, I just want to give you a shout out, David. Um, David has been instrumental. Oh, it looks like we lost Kim just for a sec. She's, she's had a couple technical difficulties. <laughs> Have you been time. having some technical difficulties? Oh, uh, 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 a little bit here and there. Not as, not as many as you think for uh, a seven hour live broadcast with more than 50 authors. No, it's been surprisingly smooth. Every once in a while, there's a little bit of a speed bump. Kim, we lost you just for a sec. You're back now. Very sorry. I was giving a shout out to David because he's an incredible mentor. He's been my mentor, Skyjack, my latest book. Indeed. To him. And, and I feel like David is a natural, obviously he was a professor, but he's a natural and gifted teacher. And I wanted to ask David just before we bring on our next guest, what is it about sharing knowledge and kind of nurturing different authors that is so rewarding to him and why he spends so much time on doing that? Well, I, I guess it's in my nature. I have, uh, I, I have helped a lot of people uh, and we don't shout about it, but there are a lot of people who know that if they came to me and they talked to me, I had advice. And a lot of it is because I had that same help. I had, uh, I've had a number of mentors. One was Sterling Siliphant, the screenwriter, the Oscar, he won an Oscar for In the Heat of the Night. Another was uh, Philip Klass, whose pen name was William Ten, who taught fiction writing at Penn State and was extremely generous to me. I couldn't, I, I dedicated first blood to him. Um, and uh, as, as I moved on, I, I, I realized that I had a, I just had a need uh, to want to, the, I, I had a lot of help from Donald E. Westlake, if anybody, uh, 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 he's, he, God bless him, he's not with us any longer. 
and he uh, he could talk about writing in ways that were spellbinding, and and it, it's in a sometimes I think I'm channeling Don. Not that I could ever be as spellbinding as he is, as he was, but I have. I remember how important it was me to listen to him, and and so I I like to pass it along. In in some ways, you know, you can categorize people as teachers and non-teachers as as passive and active or narcissist and not narcissist and all you know kinds of different ways and uh i I don't know it's just in my nature i think to teach well i'm most grateful and i know there are many people out there as well david thank you for joining us tonight we're actually playing catch up uh there's a writer who was supposed to be in earlier got things crossed uh bob degoni robert degoni he is now ready to come in so my best to him absolutely here in fact here he is now uh audio he's coming in Hey, Bob Degoni, thank you for coming on. Hey, thank you. And uh, let me apologize. I know I'm a little late. Uh, I wrote down on my calendar, don't ask me why, Wednesday. <laughs> you are fine. Listen, man, we'll take I'll you. Thank you for your great great election day. <laughs> so my apologies. David, how are you? I am good. Yourself? I'm well. Thank hey, you God, very much. You look healthy, as, as everybody does here. That's really the, the question, whether we're healthy or not. Oh, I, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I do have a 21 year old daughter, though, who went through the whole COVID thing. So Oof. no symptoms, though. So she's fine and everything. Everything's good, you know. But uh, no, I, no complaints. I'm just uh, probably like you. I, I have all the time in the world to write. And that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, in some ways for authors, it hasn't changed that much. Yeah. Uh, as we, we spend most of our time in our office. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually a little embarrassed. I don't want to know how all you guys are, but I mean, I get asked all the time, you know, uh, how are things changed for you? And my answer is, well, not really, you know? <laughs> my, my we, we've had several authors say that tonight, by the way. Several of them have mentioned that they, they barely even realize they're in quarantine because this is sort of, Joel Rosenberg came to us from Israel live tonight, and he basically said that as well, that uh, two weeks passed, he had to go in quarantine when he came back to Israel. And he barely even realized he was in quarantine. He was writing on deadline and, and trying to get his next book done. So, you know, he kind of almost forgot about it. Yeah. I, have, yeah. I haven't been to restaurants or, you know, done anything like that. It's been essentially really staying at home. Yeah. No, my, my day is I'm, I'm usually at my desk by six and then by about three 30, I'm on the golf course and that's changing now because it, the, the darkness is coming around four 30. So, uh, you know, I'll do what I can, but uh, it's a pretty simple lifestyle. I'll tell you that. Has anybody found that they're waking up at three in the morning? This is getting to be tiresome for me. I'm getting up at three and I don't know why. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, I read for a while and then I go back to sleep. In the Middle Ages, they called it the second sleep. Uh, there's a theory that we weren't meant to sleep continuously and that uh, with electric lights, that was the habit. But in the, in the old days, without you know with the sun we went to bed we woke up we did whatever and then we went back to bed so um, i i just i don't think it's alarming for me to do it but i'm just curious if anybody else is doing it. Well, what what time are you going to bed at oh 9 30. yeah but when you look at it see that my my mom had a similar thing happen and the doctor asked her when are you going to bed and she said nine o'clock and he said well that's that's six hours you know <laughs> you don't need a lot more than that yeah. you know to go with so I have the opposite problem. I can't fall asleep till three o'clock in the morning. I have oh, totally the opposite problem. Uh, David, David, let's say goodbye to you. Hey, good 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 nice Thank to you so much for coming in tonight. People. Nice to see you, David. Take care. Bye. So, Bob, it's so yes. to connect with you. And um, I'm really glad you could come on. And no worries about the mix up. We, 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 we wanted something exciting to happen because it's running like a movie for us. Okay. That's so, okay. I have a question for you. So, um, I love that, you know, you write the Tracy Crothwaite series, but you also have the Charles Jenkins. Do you feel like you get in a different headspace because of the completely different nature of those books? You know, one from more an international and spy and, and other more domestic? Yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 answer, I'll answer that question two ways. One is, uh, I was literally, I was just getting my hair cut and... Uh, the, uh, the woman that was cutting my hair, I know her pretty well. And she said, you're awful quiet today. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm in the middle of a book. And she said, oh, what are you reading? And I said, no, I'm not reading one. I'm writing one. And 
I'm, I was so into Charles Jenkins' head because uh, I'm, I'm wrestling with this book and I know you've all been through the same thing where you, it's like an alligator, right? Once you get your hands around it and you feel good about it, then you can go forward. But until you get that, get a grip on it, it's, it's, it's difficult. So, uh, so I'm, I'm struggling with this one, but it, it is a totally different mindset than the Tracy Crossfight mindset. Not, not only because I'm, you know, um, a different gender or things like that. Um, but just, it's, you know, this is international, it's Moscow, it's Russia. Uh, you know, I'm, I can't just, I, I can't just say, okay, they, she went down the street to the bar and I know exactly what bar she went to and I know exactly what the bar is like. You know, I haven't been in Moscow in 20 years. Uh, so it's a lot more complicated. I got to go back online and look things up. And so it's a lot of back and forth. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I know, you know, you do the same uh, travel and then a ton of research, but um, it's a different, it's a different kind of research. And so um, it's a lot more complicated. The international thrillers for me are a lot more complicated um, because you can't, like I said, you can't just drive someplace and get another look at it. Well, I want to say uh, we're a little short on time, but I think of all the writers we have, and I, I genuinely mean this, I think you might have the most range of everyone we've talked to tonight from the international thrillers, the spy thrillers, action, we've done legal thrillers, you, mystery, crime stuff. I want to ask you, uh, Tracy Crosswright, uh, she returns in her tracks due out April, is that correct? And correct. can you tell yeah. Rita? Yeah. Yeah, tell readers just real quick about that if you can. Yeah, so um, basically she comes back to uh, to, to uh, Seattle and um, she uh, goes to get her job back. And of course her her captain who she doesn't get along with has you know given her spot away to another woman uh, because the uh, the team that she worked for was you know just overwhelmed with her out and Faz both out. Uh, so she has an option and the option is to take a, cold, a position in cold cases for a while which is I was trying to move her into cold cases just to sort of, you know, stretch her a little bit as a, as an author. And so she moves, uh, she moves into cold cases and she picks up a case of a missing girl who uh, went, on, went on a jog and never came home. And, uh, you know, they don't know whether she's dead or alive or any of that stuff. So I'm able to kind of get back into all the forensics and all, all the, the tracking, the man tracking and the the medical examiner and all that stuff that you know goes into writing a good police procedural so um so that comes out in april and then in september my second literary novel is coming out oh really uh, yeah it's called the world played chess and it's uh it's a story of a of an 18 year old young man in 1979 graduates from high school just wants to have a good time with his friends for his final summer and uh, he goes to work on a construction crew with two vietnam vets and one of the Vietnam vets is going through PTSD. And the title comes from the saying, you know, the world played chess while I played checkers, you know, meaning he wasn't even playing the same game as these guys at 18 years of age being sent to Vietnam, et cetera. Uh, so I'm real excited about that as well. And then, uh, then another Charles Jenkins book, if I can, uh, <laughs> if I can corral this thing. <laughs> Which is one of my favorite new series, by the way. I'm a huge fan. My, uh, my father is too, by the way. He's watching this. My dad is a big fan of that series as well. He actually oh, got The Eighth Sister from me, read it, then came back and said, oh, I read this great book. You've got you've to gotta read a review on The Real Books by. And I'm like, Dad, you got it from me. Um, <laughs> so we both love that series. Listen, Bob, I mean, I'm so sorry. We're short on time. We have, to no say, worries. we have to say bye to you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having um, me. I guess talk soon. Lots of books coming up. Uh, so, so we'll be back in touch with you. Thank you. We have uh, coming in now. JD Barker is here with us. There he is right there. I see him. JD, how you doing, man? Checking network connections. I'm like watching the little things <laughs> and on the screen. I'm like, oh, maybe they forgot about me. There's other stuff going on tonight. No, you I know what happened is we had a we had a writer mix up who actually thought he was coming on tomorrow. And uh, instead, we had to, we squeezed him in, and so we're a little bit behind, but not as bad as you might think for, again, a seven-hour show with 50 different writers. We're mostly on time. Yeah, that's crazy. How many cups of coffee are you guys on? <laughs> it's, it's been tough. So anyways, how, how are you doing, man? How's it going? I'm doing fantastic. Um, we haven't actually, I don't know if we've actually talked talk. We email all, all the time, but we've never I, actually. We spoke on the phone, but we've never Zoomed. 
Yeah, yeah, this is this is kind of cool. So I'm living up in New Hampshire now. We, we bought a house in New England. Um, we're like maybe 70 percent through a, a major renovation. Like the place hadn't been touched since Reagan was president. Um, there was a, a giant living room above the, the, the garage with a hot tub in it. And not just any hot tub. It was like an 18 person hot tub. Um, Ooh, with- party at J.D. Barker's <laughs> house. <laughs> we're going to shoot next year. We're going to do this next year. We're going to host it from your hot tub. I dared my wife to go through that room with a black light and she wouldn't take me up on it. <laughs> I do but, not blame her. I do yeah. not blame her. There's probably some some videotape floating around on eBay somewhere that has something to do with that room, but I, I haven't found it. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've, we've been just up here just doing that. Like I just realized we've been here for a little over a year now and we're still not done with this this renovation. <laughs> it takes a little longer than, you know, I, on TV they do it in 22 minutes, you know, so like the scale is a little bit off. It's it's hard to, hard to realize how, just how long it takes in real life, but... Anyway, so we're doing that. I'm cranking out books in the meantime and raising my little girl. I just spent three hours outside playing in leaf piles. That was fun. <laughs> yes. Well, you are cranking out books. Dude, you are everywhere. Um, last few years, you have, I got it right here. You've co-authored the Bram Stoker book. You finished your own hit trilogy. You even co-wrote with James Patterson, the fantastic Coast to Coast Murders. What was that experience like? Oh, that was fun. Um, he, he read, um, I, I sent him a copy of Fourth Monkey, which was my, my first uh, thriller that I actually wrote. Yeah. Um, and I was just hoping to get a blurb out of him. Um, and, and I got a phone call from him. Um, and he started giving me his review of the book. And I, I you know, it was a, a Florida telephone number. And I'm looking and I'm like, this can't possibly be the real James Patterson. So in my head, I'm going through my mental Rolodex of all my buddies trying to figure out who would actually try and prank me with something like this. But he gets a couple <laughs> minutes in and I'm like, this, this might actually really be him. Um, so we started talking and, you know, I, I, I was actually living in Florida still at the time we hadn't moved yet. Um, so I, we ended up going out to dinner and we started hashing ideas for a book. Um, the, the thing was like, he always worked with an outline. And I've never worked with an outline. Um, so that was kind of a deal breaker for me because I've always felt like if you use an outline and just the book itself comes across very formulaic and, and that, that may just be me. I mean, everybody's got their, their own process and it obviously works very well for him. Um, but, but he agreed to do the first book without an outline. Um, so we literally just went back and forth, back and forth. And to give you an idea of how this this played out, there's a scene in the book. Um, you know, it's in like every detective story ever. They've got you know, our, our our good guy is sitting in the interrogation room. The cops have just grilled him. He's sitting there with his attorney. Um, everything looks very bleak. Uh, the cop walks out the door, the detective, and leaves our, our hero sitting in there with his his attorney. And the the attorney get you know says a couple things to him, stands up. And, um, you know, like the, the interview just sort of ends like that's the way I wrote it. And I sent it over to Jim and he sent it back like 15 minutes later with a new ending. And I read through it and he's like, he's got the attorney. The attorney stands up, knocks on the door. And when the cop opens the door, the attorney grabs the cop by the shirt collar, takes him, bashes his head into the wall, kills him and turns to our client and says, OK, let's go. And like that's the end of the <laughs> chapter. And then Jim handed it back to me. And he's like, OK, now it's your turn. And kind of set the tone for the book. We just, you know, chapter after chapter, we just tried to one up each other, just going back and forth. And we came up with this crazy psychological thriller um, that I'm really proud of. We, we had so much fun working on that. Um, we've actually got a second book that, that's already done and comes out in August of next year called The Noise. Um, and that was already optioned by uh, E1. They're doing a, a limited run TV series for it. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, so we're having a lot of fun. And that one we did with an outline. He wanted me to try it his way. So we, we worked off one of his outlines. You know, so we, we're, we're trying we're trying both. You can well, see JD, which one you... sells the best and then, and, then, and then do the outline or not for book three. Are we in competition now? Is that how that's going to go? <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm seeing the benefits of it because it does make the writing process go much faster. You know, like for every book that I write, you know, like I've got one on my desk right now that I'm finishing up. I'm at 136,000 words. 30, 40,000 of those words are going to end up on the cutting room floor because just, now I'm at the point where I go in and I just I trim the fat. Um, when you have an outline, like you don't have that issue. You know, you know where the story is starting you know, in the beginning, you know, the middle or your end, and you just kind of fly through it and you knock it out a lot quicker. Um, but I, I enjoy the creative process of, of pantsing it, you know, which is what they call it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying both ways. I'm trying to figure out if I can actually write a book with an outline. Um, and try to be a little bit more like Jim. Like, can I do two books at a time or 10 books at a time or, or, or something like that? At the moment, I'm doing two. I'm, I'm writing one book in the morning and another one in the afternoon. Well, J.D., uh, I want to ask you a quick question about your brushes with greatness, because you started out out of the gate getting the blessing from Stephen King to use one of his characters in your debut novel. How, you know, what, what are you doing that's, that's making James Patterson and Stephen King and all those people, uh, you know, come to your door? I, you know, I've got a podcast and I talk about this kind of thing quite a bit. Like I, I ask the question, you know, like at, at Thriller Fest, you know, if you get in the elevator and you're in the elevator with Lee Child 
do you ask Lee Child for a blurb or do you stand there for those 15 seconds awkwardly and watch him walk away? I, I'm the guy who will ask the question because the worst thing these people are going to say is say no, you know, so so why not? You know, so if, if I sent Patterson a book to get a blurb out of him and if he called, you know, he called me up and it just it started this dialogue with with, with King, I, I chased that down. Like, you know, I, I wrote the book and in the story, I had to explain where the wife bought a journal. And just to get the book done, I wrote that she walked into Needful Things, you know, Stephen King's store and bought it there. And I, I fully expected to have to change that. And my wife read it and she's like, no, this is kind of good. Let's just get his permission to use it. How do you do that? So it turns out he's got a house about 10 minutes from my parents' house in Florida. So we printed up the manuscript. We hopped in the car. And we figured, well, we'll go over to Steve's house. He's probably outside gardening <laughs> or something. We'll, you know, we'll catch him in the front yard. We'll show him the manuscript. He'll, you know, give us a thumbs up and we'll be on our way and go grab lunch. Um, it didn't work out that way. If you ever go to, to King's house in Florida, he, he lives on, um, I, it's called a key. He lives on Casey Key, which is like a little island off the coast. And you, you go over this little tiny bridge. And if you make a left, you're on the public portion of the key. And if you make a right, you're out like on the entire half of this island that he owns. Hmm. And immediately, there's a no trespassing sign and then there's a private drive sign then there's a gate and then there's another gate you know like we got a half mile in and i was looking up in the trees watching for snipers and i'm thinking this is probably a really bad idea um so we turned around and i called a friend of mine um a guy named uh, he, he wrote under jack ketchum his real name was dallas mary he passed away a couple of years ago but a really really cool guy that I, I knew for 10 15 years um i told him what we were up to because he knew king really well and he said no don't stalk steve he hates that Here's his email address. Just send it to him. If he likes the book, you'll hear back from him. If the book sucks, he probably won't respond. Um, and I got the email back from King and it said, I, I love it. Go ahead and use it. And let me know if you need anything. And I, I stared at that for like four months, you know, waiting for him to, you know, send me something else. Saying, oh, I meant that for Grisham, not you. Sorry about that. But <laughs> turn, turn, <laughs> out, turns out it was for real. Um, so, yeah, I, I tell people when I'm when I'm outside not to stand next to me because lightning is going to strike to try and even out the karma a little bit. You don't want to be right here when it happens. But I, I've been crazy lucky. I love it, man. It's so awesome. JD, thank you for coming on. We got to roll. We're a little bit behind, still playing catch up. But uh, thank you for coming on. Before we let you go, tell us what's your next book that, that comes out, JD? Uh, the next one is called A Caller's Game, and it comes out um, hey. uh, <laughs> it, uh, comes out in February. Perfect. We'll look for it then, man. Talk soon, and thanks for coming on. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye. And now with us, joining us, Christopher Razzo. How you doing? Hey, Ryan, how are you? Good to see you. Sean, how are you? Good. How are you, Chris? Good. Thank you. You guys look great for doing this for like two days now, it seems. <laughs> tuned in early. A while. It's been a while. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm starting to get a little tired, but uh, we can't Did really get you. We only have one producer and he's been sitting, you know, off stage this whole time doing the whole thing. So um, look what I have with me. I brought uh, a couple of props. Just Thank you very much. That just a little bit. Look at that. Look at that. Um, so great. listen, man, I've been dying to ask you. You self-publish your first two books. Both are smashing hits. You go on some of the biggest talk radio shows in the country. Clearly, readers love Ben Porter. And if you don't know who Ben Porter is, go to Amazon, look these up. The reviews are ridiculous. I mean, it's you have so many reviews. They're all positive. People love Ben Porter. What's next? How do you top yourself in book three? Well, so book three is, is almost done. And, and actually, book four is right behind it. They're they're cranking along uh book three will, will will literally be done very very soon and and you know it's it's just sort of getting better at the game and learning from you know the the reviews learning from uh people who have given me advice and and from other authors and from this crowd to be part of which is which is really humbling and, and i'm really grateful for the opportunity just to just to be in the same stage with them but to, to top it you know i think we just keep developing the character and and making him more relatable and having more fun with him because it's been super fun writing Ben Porter's character and he, he's different and, and he's got a lot of room to grow and expand and do different things. Well, Christopher, that character is, it's a fan, fantastic character and it echoes one of my favorite novels of all time, The Six Days of the Condor, and that it's, you know, kind of the analyst type um, way over his head. So what I'm curious about is what about the common man um, the every man over his head appeal to you versus the invincible warrior style protagonist that many books have. Well, so the, Sean, the story of the story was I started doing this sort of as a diversion. You know, I, I was working the day job and I was like, I'm going to write a story to, to, to distract myself. And I'm going to write a story about a different kind of hero, someone who I could relate to. And as much as I love the, the great, uh, you know, thriller heroes, the, the Mitch Raps, if you will, mm -hmm. of the world, you know, 
I I couldn't relate to do that. I'm not, that's not me. So that's why I set out to write somebody who was the, almost the anti-hero. And as you said, the everyman of, of the, um, of the genre. So, so somebody who could be totally relatable and who could be um, flawed, but could be fun to be with. And just, you know, a, a guy you want to hang out and have a beer with. So not the guy that, that you're intimidated by because, you know, he's good with the ladies. He's got the six pack abs. He's, he's, a, he's a marksman, you know, that sort of thing. You know, someone, you know, who's, who's a dork like me and I could have a beer with. I like it. I, I love it, man. Hey, listen, before we let you go, we're short on time. We're playing catch up still. Uh, I want to ask you, you recently signed a, a movie deal. Tell readers about that. And do you have any updates? Uh, so I signed a movie deal, an, an option with Spyglass Media book, Group on, um, on false insurances, my first book. Uh, we signed that in August. We've talked to uh, some writers and some uh, directors, and I wrote a screen adaptation for the book as well so, to, to do the, the, the screen ad, book to screen adaptation for the book. And, um, and it's coming along. It's, it's moving nicely. Obviously, it's a very difficult time to, to start something new for Hollywood. Um, but, it, you know, I, I'm I'm confident that it is going someplace and, and I hope to see more news on that in the very near future. Well, we will stay tuned for that and we'll, and we'll look for, uh, for news on book three soon as well. Chris, thanks for joining us tonight, man. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. So we have another guest in our lobby, I believe. Sherry. Hello. She's how here. are you? Hi. Hello. Thanks for joining Hello, everyone. us. You doing, you doing well? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get right into, into your books because we're, you know, we, we don't, we don't have a, an hour to talk tonight. So I want to make <laughs> sure <laughs> your novels are drenched in a paranoia. Um, and that sensation lives in the subconscious long after you, you set the book down. So I'm curious, are you a paranoid person by nature or is it just a quality of your writer's imagination? I don't think I'm that paranoid, but I, I'm probably a bit of a worrier and I, I look deep into the darker side of things, but I wouldn't describe myself as par paranoid. Although I do like to go there when I'm writing. Yeah, well, I like to go there as a reader and it, it, it languishes in the mind. So <laughs> yeah, one of the questions that we've often heard and read from your fans is was there ever a plan for the sequel to, to your 2016 release the couple next door and we kind of knew and heard what the answer was but with such an outcry for more of that uh, was that a tough decision for you did you feel kind of torn between not doing it and doing it really i do get a lot of requests for sequels for my books and that's partly my own fault i tend to leave things a little bit open-ended for my reader um but no, I, I don't have any uh, desire to do sequels. I, I, when I write my books, I focus on um, the characters going through something really horrible in their lives. And I, I don't know if I could make them go through it all again. <laughs> 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 no. Makes a lot of sense. Well, an another of your themes besides the paranoia is a lot of your books have the underlying idea that you never really know the people in your life whether they're your yeah. spouse, whether they're your sister or whoever. Um, do you, do you think that's true? And um, it, it, do you ever, have you ever met anybody that you feel like you knew? Um, I, yes and no. I, I, I do think that it probably is impossible to know anyone completely. And yet I always feel that I do like in my own life, there's no one I feel has a secret horrible life that I don't know about, but there are examples of people in the in in life who who have had secret lives. So I, I sort of use that as the people around them had no idea. So it you know it's supposedly possible that anyone is capable of hiding that, but you know most people aren't like that. I think we can all pretty much trust the people around us. But when you're a thriller writer, it's nice to call on that. <laughs> and it, you can't be too trustworthy read, when you're a thriller. The more I read, the more inclined I am to believe that it's like your books. But. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you travel extensively, or you used to until probably uh, recently. <laughs> well, what's the part that you miss the most about doing that? You know, it's just, it, when you go to a, a literary festival, you know, there's such a buoyant, excited feeling, and everyone's there, and they're all excited, and they're all talking about books, and it's just such a nice 
environment to meet readers, meet other writers, you know, and when you're stuck at home writing on a laptop on your own, you know, every day, um, it's really good to have that sort of connection with the readers and the other authors, because um, it is kind of a solitary life being a writer, of course. of course. So I miss, I do miss that quite a bit. Yeah. Do you have a um, harrowing travel experience that stands out among your many travels? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Do I have a harrowing? You know, not that comes to mind. I do remember being quite frightened once driving, being driven down the Audubon um, by a guy who was Russian and he was going so fast and he had some sort of weird rock music on and I thought I was going to die just because I think he was going 160. <laughs> but um, other than that, I can't think of anything particularly scary that's happened to me, no. Well, doesn't that sound like the, the start of a thriller? <laughs> it, I was thinking, you know, yeah, it did sound, it was a bit like that. I felt very Tom Cruise-y in that, you know, back of that car. <laughs> so Cruise. true. Tom Cruise is the adjective. I like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you, you should count yourself lucky as often as you've traveled. Um, oh, hey. What? Sh Sherry and Mindy, do you know each other? Have you met on the- No, hi, Mindy. We have not met. Hi, Sherry. No. Hey. Hello there. Well, Sherry, we really appreciate you coming on and spending time with us and, and uh, rolling with our crazy format of pop in, say hello and pop out. But uh, really do appreciate your time and best of luck with your future endeavors. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Have fun the rest of the night. Thanks, Sherry. Absolutely. Okay, bye-bye. Well, how are you, Mindy? I'm good. How are you doing, Mike? It's so good to, hear. It's so good to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you too. How are you, Sean? Doing great. It's been a long time. It feels like even longer. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding, right? We've talked. <laughs> okay. Before I forget, I have to give a shout out to my local bookstore, The Tattered Cover here in Denver, and they are broadcasting on their Facebook page. So hello, hello Denverites. Cover. I'm with you guys. Hello, and Tattered so, Cover. Yeah. Well, Mindy, since you're here, are you still keeping up with that kickboxing class that you were taking before uh, and during your research for Strike Me Down? No, I what? I can't go anywhere or do anything. Oh. What country do you think I live in? <laughs> we thought you could maybe do it at home. I'm sure there's some tapes somewhere. I could, and I do have a bag in the basement. I, I totally um, take out some frustration on the punching bag from mm -hmm. time to time, but I'm not doing any formal training at the moment. Um, my gym is open, but I don't go there. So everything I'm doing is like all of my exercises either in my office here or in the basement right now. Hmm. All right. Well, sticking with that same character and strike me down, you made finance sexy again, or maybe for the first time, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> as a, as a non-math person, right for the first time. <laughs> what do you have next for us? So I'm actually working on a duet right now, which I don't know if that's a thing that happens in crime fiction. I, I can't recall like reading any duets. Do you guys, do you, can you guys think of any great duets? Anyway, it's a two book series that takes place in Iowa. And so I'm calling it the Iowa duet in my head. Um, it's uh, four characters that circle a drug trafficking ring. And the first book is told from two characters points of view. And there's two side characters in that book that are picking up the story in book two. Holy cow. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, as somebody who was born in Iowa, it, you, I, I need to see you work in that corn in there somewhere. So make sure that that's in there because that's <laughs> going to be critical. Oh, there's corn. Yes, yes, of course. It wouldn't I mean, be Iowa know, so if there were <laughs> well, Mindy, one of the things that stands out to me when I look at your catalog is that you really have investigated completely different worlds. I mean, you have, you know, the small town sort of teenage circle um, and your first, no and your well, your first major market novel. Um, and then you go into the woods and the mystery of mem memory in your second book. And then of course you're in finance. So what, what is your, what is your muse? Is it everywhere? Or do you just sit down as soon as that book's over and say, you want to explore something else? You know, it's everywhere. Actually. I I'm kind of a glutton for education. I have like three degrees. I wouldn't rule out a fourth. I just love learning. And I love reading a book that will teach me something, you know, give me a really entertaining rip roaring ride, but also let me learn something on the side. Um, so that's, that's kind of my favorite book. 
And so I always want to bring that to my readers as well. Just give them a slice of a little world that they might not know. And not so big of a slice that it feels like work, you know, that, that, it, that it feels like school, but just a, a tiny little uh, tantalizing slice so that they get a taste of something that they might not have known otherwise. Because mm. what is fiction if not to broaden our worlds? Right. Well, like with, uh, with the coming of winter, and there's so many great uh, writers from the Minnesota, Minneapolis area. What is it about that dreary, never seeing the sun for the next six months that produces such great literary talent? I mean, it's the lack of vitamin D. I think, you know, <laughs> it's the, we, we can really sink into that seasonal affective disorder um, really well. And uh, it, Honestly, no. There, there's this, um, there's this wonderful cultural community here in the, in the Twin Cities and, and all over Minnesota. We've got so many great independent bookstores. We've got so many great small presses. There's just a, it's a wonderful place for a writer to be. And uh, just the different landscapes that we have from the, the forests up north to the, you know, the, the fields and the agricultural communities in the south. It's, ugh, it's my favorite state. You guys have to come. Oh yeah. I've, hmm. I've been through it. Uh, Duluth is actually one of my favorite little stops on the way to Canada. Yes. Um, a little fishing trip I've been on a couple of times. Um, but I, yeah, I haven't seen much of the state yet. So and that's, hmm. I'll, 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 I haven't been to the Twin time. Cities at all. So all right, we'll put it on your post COVID list. You got to come will. back. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. All right. Um, Mike, do you have another question? Andy? Nope. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I want to go back to your, your, your penchant for standalones, how you, what well, you, you're doing a duet now, which is exciting, but you've done three different stories and you, you, when you're writing a novel, you get to know those characters so well, you get to know everything about them. Um, do you, are there any characters that you've written already that you think in your head, you're going to go revisit at some point? I would like to go see Dell again someday. Um, Sheriff Dell Goodman, who is the investigating the murder of Hattie Hoffman in Everything You Want Me to Be. Uh, he was just a little too comfortable when I left him. You know, he, his life was a little bit too in order. And, and I'd like to go just mess with him a little bit more. Um, I was actually thinking of a prequel. Um, so I, I'd visit Dell before the murder of Hattie took place, maybe a decade or two before. When you're, and I've never even thought of attempting this, but writing a, like you said, a duet, and I'm just now I'm super curious about this. Like, do you have to think about the opposite book when you're writing the first one? I mean, do you have to keep the second one in mind or can you just solely focus on the first? Well, since it's the first time I'm trying it, you know, <laughs> we're kind of making up the rules as we go along. Okay. Um, but it, I mean, for me, I, I needed the first book to be intact, you know? So if you just picked up that and read that, you would be totally happy with it. And so it had to have a fully contained arc um, that wasn't reliant on the second book. But I planted a lot of like heavily interspersed Easter eggs, you know, throughout book one, right. that if you do pick up book two, book one will become richer and deeper for it. I'm so, just a little shocked by it. <laughs> since we, yeah, I know. It's, I, I love, I love the idea though. Um, I'm going to go, I want to talk about life. Just, just COVID life. You have a, a family. Um, I had, when COVID started, I had all four of my children home for um, about two months and our basement uh, flooded, which meant 1500 square foot of our house was not in access. So oh. we were all on top of each oh. other. Um, and I want to know, how are you staying sane without the gym, without, you know, without all the things that you would normally do in life? Well, right now it's like watching your head float sometimes. Like that's, that's what's keeping me sane right now. Cause sometimes your suit <laughs> disappears and you're just a floating head. And that's my favorite thing. Honestly, like little zoom fails are my favorite thing right now. It's so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Um, but in terms of family, um, they're, they're here. They're fine. No, uh, we, we are getting along We're we're healthy. We, I have like, um, two levels in our home. Haven't flooded the bottom one yet. Thank <laughs> God. I'm so sorry. Don't recommend. Did. Um, but so I've got one kid schooling on one level and another kid schooling on, an, a, you know, the, the above so that they're out of each other's spaces and can, um, can focus, can concentrate. And then I'm the, the floater teacher that's not qualified to teach anything uh, <laughs> going between the two of them like, oh, yeah, division. We can do this. That's fine. 
You've well, gotten it, so many it, reviews for for Strike Me Down. I mean, it, your book has been everywhere. And of course, we loved it. We, we talked about that in our own show. But what was the weirdest or the strangest review that you got for Strike Me Down throughout this, this past year? Because I can only imagine some of the stuff that you've seen across your desk. Yeah, th there's been some. I mean, mostly it's been the reviews have been so great. And uh, but what I just get such a kick out of is like this general undercurrent of shock of like so accounting is interesting you know like <laughs> there there's just kind of this like oh well maybe maybe she's doing it wrong you know so <laughs> uh so there, there's just always kind of a little subtle tone of, of like disbelief you know in every yeah. review even the, the best ones they're like so I guess this is accounting I guess <laughs> but it's fun so so yeah <laughs> Well, you've probably done a lot more for recruiting for that industry than probably anyone else that I can think of in the past 50 years. <laughs> and so, hey, Mindy, have you met Mr. Kruger? Yes, I have met Kent. He's, he's on his way in now. Hopefully we'll and see him. Pop does, on he, is your husband he's finally bought He is one of our, our, our shining lights in Minnesota. I mean, if you I want know, to talk right? about Rightfully the so. uh, characters that we have here, um, Kent is one of the best. Mindy, before you hmm. go out, can, can I ask you, has your husband finally bought into the, uh, the adjective enchanting um, as a descriptor for you? The, no, you know, he has not. One called me enchanting. I have no idea why. He must not have watched our show then because. <laughs> right, right. He, needs to, he needs to watch our show. Well, we really do appreciate you popping in in this crazy format and spending 10 minutes with us. And uh, it was great to see you again. Um, yeah. When your next book comes out, we hope to see you for a much longer discussion. I would love that. You guys take care. And uh, thank you so much for having me and for doing this. This is such a fun night. Yeah, I've been it was having great. Fun watching. Great talking to you. We'll see you later. It might just be Mike and I riffing on until it gets. Here we go. This could be the, <laughs> Here this we could be the challenge of the night. <laughs> so Mike, how are you staying sane in uh, COVID? Well, you know, I started with this show because- Can you I not can hear me? Everything. Oh, I can oh. hear you. Yes, but we can't see you. The Headless Horseman. That is so weird. My video looks good. Oh, 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 oh. we seem to be one step closer. There we go. Yes. There you go. Yes. Ah, technology. Yes, absolutely. It must be the Minnesota weather. Maybe that's messing with everyone's stuff up there. Well, we're actually having terrific weather today. It, <laughs> it uh, was over 60, uh, but, a, wow. you know, a little over a week ago, we had 10 inches of snow. So yeah. That sounds like Colorado. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. I got you. Well, be before we get started in our discussion with you, we are streaming live on Next Chapter Books in St. Paul. So hello to Next Chapter Books. Hi, folks at Next Chapter Books. I love your store, as you well know. <laughs> so I, I do a lot of events at Next Chapter. Yeah, I would guess. So yeah, yes. I would imagine so. Mindy said yeah. something just now that, that has me curious. So she called you Kent. Is that what you go by in conversation or... Yeah, I publish under that very literary three name thing, William Kent Kruger. Mm, but with okay. the exception of my seventh grade year, I have always gone by Kent. Okay. In my seventh grade year, when I checked into my home room and the, uh, the home room uh, teacher was running down the list and came to my name, William Kruger, he said, do you go by Bill? And I went, yeah. So <laughs> I was Bill in the seventh grade. And uh, it was a surreal, yeah, surreal year. Let me tell you that. It was junior All high school All my friends for you. called me Kent. All the teachers in seventh grade called me Bill. That's exceptional. I don't know. If I used my full name well, on my book, I'd feel like my mother was yelling at me for some yeah. reason. <laughs> well, well here's, here's why I used my full name, William Kent Kruger. So when my uh, first book was going to come out, um, I had been accepted for a public publication. My daughter was into numerology at that point. So I had her run all the permutations of my name, uh, William Kent Kruger, W. Kent Kruger, uh, William K. Kruger, Kent Kruger, William Kruger, everything you could think of. And numerologically speaking, William Kent Kruger came up to be the luckiest uh, of combination. So that's what I went with. That seems to have worked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like our meeting is long overdue because um, Mr. David Brown sent me an arc of this Tinderland. It was, I think it was the first arc he sent me when he started sending me arcs. And I absolutely fell in love with that book. I, I tell, I, I have gotten at least 50 to a hundred people to either buy that book or to read mine. Um, <laughs> and um, 
to me, it, it, to me, it's the kind of book that, and I mean this in the best possible way that you're assigned in a great co- high school or college literature class. And your teacher says, read it. It's a, it's the great American novel that we all, you know, hear about and, and want to write. And you don't have to, you, you don't have to acknowledge that because I know you're a humble guy, but let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. When you were writing it, did you sense that it was something special or did it feel like every other book you wrote? Oh, it felt like nothing like any other book I've written, with the exception of Ordinary Grace. Mm. Ordinary Grace, which came out in 2013, and This Tenderland are companion novels in my own thinking um, uh, for many reasons, but, uh, but in large measure because they deal with very similar themes. Um, and so I was writing both of these uh, novels. I knew they were very different. Um, when I wrote Ordinary Grace, I thought, this is the story I was born to write. I will never write another story that will equal this. Hmm. And then I wrote this tender land. And I thought, well, that's pretty good too. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I do not mean to disparage ordinary grace. It's just I, my introduction to you. I, I'm embarrassed to say I went reverse. I went reverse order. I went this tender land, ordinary grace court, <coughs> Cork O'Connor. Um, it just, I read a lot and I just somehow, somehow missed the Cork O'Connor books. And- well, you know, this tender land really has made a, a pretty big splash out there. And so you're like a lot of my readership now that they're, uh, they've read this tender land. That's how they discovered me. And, um, and thank you, Lord, want to read more of my works. <laughs> they've <gone back. laughs> Sometimes they've leaped back to the Cork O'Connor series and gone through that. Sometimes it's come back to uh, Ordinary Grace. Um, but I'm just happy that readers at, at, at last are having an idea who the hell I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, we just kind of briefly mentioned on that. Cork O'Connor's had what, 18, 18 novels in the series. I but, just you know, in 18. Yeah. But you've had uh, th- what, three standalones. Is that right? Yeah. A very long time ago, my fourth novel published novel was actually my first standalone. It was a political thriller mm. uh, called the devil's bed which three people in the entire universe bought. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then I stuck with the Cork O'Connor series for a very long time until the idea for Ordinary Grace uh, so compelled me to, to, to write it. And based on, that opened so many doors for me. It did really, really well for me and for, uh, for yeah. my And that kind, of draw, that, that, other uh, yeah, that kind of draws me into the question of what sort of internal mechanism do you feel that like pulls you away from that series and to do these standalones? What, what happens inside your mind that says, nope, I got to do this standalone amongst all that? Uh, well, in both cases with this Tenderland and Ordinary Grace, uh, the seed for the ideas have been with me for a very, very long time. Hmm. Um, and I, I guess it's just, the seed gets planted and when all of the conditions are right the seed wants to grow <laughs> so yeah. you, you know if you're a wise if you're a wise uh, writer you just step back and you let that uh, that thing grow and and that, that was really the you know i'm being a little facetious here but that really was uh, ordinary grace um and this tender land is a story i'd wanted to write since i was 11 years old sure. when i was 11 years old in the fifth grade our teacher read to the class uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. She did it by reading half an hour after lunch every day. I fell in love with that book. I loved The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Sure, we yeah. this kid who was just like me. He was out there on the Mississippi River having these really great adventures. And then, of course, I had to read uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which I also loved. And I swear to God, across my whole career as a writer, I have wanted to write a, a story that would pay homage to Mark Twain that might be in its own way an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. Well, you have succeeded mightily with it so again I, I i've read a lot of books and i and we talk with mostly thriller authors um but i've told people without hesitation that this tenderland's my favorite book of the last three or four years so and that and you know i read a good amount so so have i, I told you lately have i told you lately that i love you <laughs> not yet <laughs> but um, hi rachel hi how are you well Hello. and you I'm fine. Good seeing good, you. Good. And you know well, each other? How's it going? Well, in my neck of the woods and in yours? It's still early. It's 544 and I'm going to make tacos after this. I just I just had tacos. <laughs> Sounds perfect. Ooh. <laughs> so yeah, tacos and a nice bottle of Riojas and popcorn. So I'm ready. 
I'm Sounds ready. like a great evening. I wasn't ready until I am I'm now. Gonna, I'm going to let Sean take <laughs> over and I'm going over to Rachel's house now. <laughs> William, <laughs> can't, can't, thank you for your time tonight. Um, hopefully right. we can speak at, at length later um, in another forum. So I really appreciate your time. Oh, I've had a great time, guys. Um, be gentle with them, Rachel. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Much. Thanks, guys. You. Thanks. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Hello. hey. How are you? I'm fine. You know what my plans are? I'm, I'm yeah, I know. Right now there. we're jealous. Yes. <laughs> you must be yes. West Coast. Where are you at now? Los Angeles. Ah, yep. Yes, 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 yes. And LA it looks like it's eight o'clock with it being so freaking dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm Denver. It's the same way. Ah, well, yes. let's, let's get into it here. So 2002, your debut, A Quiet Storm, received reviews from O Magazine and Publisher yeah. Weekly. Could you have anticipated that sort of reception, like right from the get-go? And what did that no. have? What, what sort of effect did it have on you when that happened? Well, one, it, it was incredible. I was a baby writer. This was my first book. And I was over there in my living room when I first uh, heard that I'd gotten that. And, you know, I was young, 32. And it was amazing. And, you know, it kind of set me up for some false expectations, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the, like, the harsh it realities. It's better than this. <laughs> but, you know, it was coming right out the gate. It was incredible. One, to have, you know, such a, a big five publisher, Scribner. And then, you know, the great reviews. And I was a Borders original voice. You remember Borders? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was incredible. But it was so long ago now. Mm, I've been around now for you know, a very long time. That was 2002. And here we are 18 years later. Oh, well, that, that's a damn good sign that 18 years later, you're still talking about your books. So <laughs> yes. prior to that. Yes. Um, you write two very different characters, Grayson mm -hmm. Sykes and Lou Norton. Mm -hmm. Which qualities do you share with each of them? And what qualities do they have that you wish you had? Ah, um, Lou Norton is very much like me. She grew up in my neighborhood. She went to the same college, pledged the same sorority. She is a geek like me and you know, Angelino to her core. So we're very much, we have that in common. We were very close to our sisters. Um, and yeah, so I wish I was as brave as Lou and I wish I was, you know, as tall as her and as committed to, you know, social good as she is. I mean, she is a cop. Um, for Grayson, we, there's more of a gulf between us. Um, she is very, she is smart, but she's naive in some ways. Um, she believes uh, when people, when bad people tell her things and I'm very much a cynic. Um, yeah, she's very trusting. Um, she gets burned easy and I'm not that at all. Mm -hmm. So I am very closer. I'm, I'm closer to Lou in terms of pat personality. What I, you know, for, for Gray, she is a romantic. I'm a pragmatic romantic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be nice, but yeah, it's not <laughs> practical. So yeah, I, I like that about Gray. Um, and I like that she is a fighter. I'm a fighter, but she's fought back against a lot more than I have in my life. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I want to take a little issue with that because um, I think <laughs> you, you've done you've done some things where a lot of people talk, but you've you worked for the ACLU. So yes, you, you worked for Civil Liberties. Um, yes. You in your fiction, there's all sorts of social issues that are infused into the plot. There it's not beat you over the head with it. It's this is life and, and you need to recognize life. Yeah. But what I want to know is how can fiction in your mind, to your mind, how can fiction help with, you know, discussions of race, discussions of class, discussions yeah. of inequality? Well, crime fiction in itself is all about justice and injustice and who yeah. gets affected, who gets, who gets retribution, all of it. You cannot have good crime fiction without talking about those issues. Um, it's also one reason why there are thousands of CSIs and law and order SUVs because mm -hmm. 
these issues do affect us every day and people want to see how, you know, writers deal with these situations. They want to see actors play out something that's happening in their lives. And I think that's our superpower with, with thrillers and suspense and, and, and mysteries. Um, I like now that more and more people of color are writing these stories because, you know, a lot of these stories in real life happen in the neighborhoods in which we, we inhabit. So yes. it's, and, and we're not just, you know, background players or the villains, we're everything. And now that's being reflected in crime and mystery and suspense writing. Um, yeah, uh, you know, when people say, I, I don't, you know, I meaning, I, this mm -hmm. other writer over here, don't write political stuff. And it's like, well, if you write crime, you're gonna fall on one side of the spectrum or, or not. If you write good crime, you will say either through your protagonist or, or your villain, what you think about what's going on today in today's world and what's happened in the past. So yeah, yeah. I, think, I, I think we're, we're blessed with being able to entertain and educate with our genre. And I, I like that. Uh, that's how I've always kind of, you know, seen myself as like, yes, I like serious things, but I also like laughing. I like being entertained. I can watch The Simpsons and Rachel Maddow at the same, you know, at the same time. I'm a lot of things. And this genre is a lot of things. Right. That's an answer. Rachel, um, we hate, hate to move things along, but um, we really appreciate your time tonight. Um, we would love to sit down with a longer discussion with you on the crew review sometime. So yes, yes. we'll definitely hit you up for that, but thanks very much for coming on uh, thriller talk tonight. I'm glad I'm going to go make my co tacos now. <laughs> you enjoy taco Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Thanks. Night. again, Rachel. Hey, Bye, Megan. Rachel. And, Hi. Hey. And hello, Megan. Hello, Hi. Megan. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Where are you calling from? Um, I'm in, I can't talk. I'm in Connecticut. <laughs> that could be a problem. No, that's great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, let's get to it. Uh, Behind the Red Door came out of your fascination with missing persons cases, mm -hmm. missing people cases. Where do you get, where do you think that fascination comes from for you? Um, I think, I mean, as a thriller author, I'm uh, always drawn to those stories about missing persons, but I think that um, for me, there's something really, especially intriguing, especially scary, especially the word I use usually is eerie about um, a case where a person goes missing more so even for me than a murder case, because with a murder case, there's presumably a body. They have a place to start. They know um, sort of what they're looking for. Um, but with a missing person case, they just vanish and, and you, you have no idea. And a lot of times you don't have a place to start really. So that's really intriguing to me because then I think people's minds go to a lot of different places and then people try to sort of um, dig into the person's life a lot and to try to find clues and that can bring up a lot of things too. So um, I think that's why, where that fascination comes from. The father in the book is a psychologist and he specializes in fear and, and did fear-based experiences um, on for in your childhood. Mm -hmm. What kind of research did you have to do in order to, you know, write about this sector of psychology? Um, so I read um, The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker, which isn't really the same kind of realm, really just about fear, but about the benefits of fear. And so I kind of wanted to do the opposite of that. And the thing about Ted in the book is that um, he is not a great scientist. He's not the great scientist that he thinks he is. Like he, he's doing all these things that he sees as being totally creative and brilliant. Um, but anybody except really Fern in the book um, because she grew up with it can see that it's just kind of out there and wacky and unethical a lot of times. Um, and not really following the standard procedures that you do. So, I mean, I did look up a lot of like um, psychological experiments, like now they're all going out of my head, of course, but um, <laughs> <laughs> ones where they would have big groups of people because then I, I modeled some um, that the actual uh, scientists, there's a sort of uh, anti-TED in the book named Brennan Llewellyn, 
um, did some of his experiments off of that. But for Ted, I just got like super crazy with it. And I was like, I want to do the opposite of what the, the good thing to do would be the real Ooh, thing. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, your dog Maisie is a very popular <laughs> figure in social media and we're all animal lovers here in the show. Is she around? She is, she's sleeping in the other room. It's gotten too late for her. She's like, I'm done. <laughs> did, did she pick up any tips from this show? That's what I'm really curious about that. <laughs> yeah, she is. She is like, she's like, I like, have so many books I'm going to read now. Like she's yeah. ready. <laughs> <laughs> so you just recently, I, I keep disappearing into my background. Um, you just revealed <laughs> the cover of your next book. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about it and maybe even show yeah. us? Um, I don't have like a mock-up or anything. I just have okay. the, but people, if they want to see, they can go on my Twitter, um, at I'm Megan Collins or my Instagram, um, at Megan Collins writer, but the title of the book is the family plot. And it's about a, um, family that's been very steeped in true crime their whole life. They've had sort of this, the parents have this obsession of it and taught their kids all these sort of like murder stories from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And the kids grew up with that around them all the time. Um, and so when the kids are all adults, um, their father dies and they return home onto this sort of their part of it, at least secluded house on an Island off the coast of Rhode Island. And, um, and when they go to not them, but the person who does it, when they dig up the plot that's reserved for their father, they find the remains, what turns out to be the remains of their brother who's been missing for the past 10 years. Jeez. And so now they've been some, they've been people who have been obsessed with true crime and now they're sort of at the center of a true crime story themselves. Um, and uh, there's a, there's darkness and secrets and dysfunctional family, all the things I love to write about. <laughs> okay, so we want to know what, what, what were you eating that night when you first started? <laughs> terminating the story. <laughs> you know what? It's actually really funny. I had a whole other story that I was working on and I needed to come up with a title because we were going to submit it um, to my publisher and I couldn't think of a title. And so my husband just, I was like, I want something that like ties to family. And my husband threw out the family plot, which had nothing to do with the book I was writing. And I was mm -hmm. like, no, that doesn't work, but that's a great title for something. Yeah. And so that was kind of in the back of my mind. And then I just had this, it just like that idea just came to me, not necessarily the true crime aspect, just like they're there for, um, they're burying their father and in the grave, they find the body of someone else. Oh, who's it going to be? It's their brother. Um, and so I just like, I went into whatever room he was in, interrupted everything and was like, listen to this, the family <laughs> plot. And he was like, no, that sounds good. And so I kind of just ditched to the other thing that I was working on because that just like that got me going. I wanted to write about that. So this is his book. He's going to claim yeah. this is his book, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because I was going to ask you from the moment uh, we found out we were talking to you, if you started with titles or if you started with stories, because the family plot is a phenomenal title. So hey, I will tell him you said so. <laughs> <laughs> but the story, um, the story to match it even better. Thank you. Megan, do you know Karen? Yeah, we were Man. in the back room event together. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how things overlap. I know, I know, yeah. I love it. We right. haven't met in real life, but I'm right. sure we will one day. <laughs> Once oh, okay. we well, Someday we'll get back to it. Yeah. We're uh, author author matchmaker service, uh, thriller talk. <laughs> <It works. laughs> but, but Megan, we really appreciate you coming on tonight and sharing your story and, and your process. And uh, we wish you all the best of luck with Thank Family Thank you plot. so much. Thank you. Bye, Megan. Thanks so much. All Take right. care. Bye. Bye. Hi. Well, hello, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, oh, Hi Sean. Hello. Hi, Mike. Thank you for coming on and spending some time with us tonight. I was so excited to be invited. Yeah. Aww. And I've been listening in all day long. You know, I was going to work this evening, but I got hooked and I've just been watching the show. <laughs> I, I was too. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start right in because we're, we're, you know, we don't, we don't have an hour to talk. So I want to make sure we we talk as much as we can. Um, the Wicked Sister was named one of Publishers Weekly's best books of 2020. And that's on the heels of the massive success of The Marsh King's Daughter. So my question is, do you feel like you're hitting your stride or does this feel like it's always felt to you? Oh gosh, what a great question. I would say I feel like I'm hitting my stride 
after the success of the Marsh King's Daughter. That was so over and above anything that had happened to me previously in publishing. I'd mm -hmm. been writing seriously for 20 years. And the success of the Marsh King's Daughter was actually, you know, to me, it felt like a fluke. But now that I've written The Wicked Sister and, you know, I have two books with Putnam and, you know, that astonishing, you know, recognition from Publishers Weekly. Uh, yeah, I feel like, OK, maybe I am that writer. <laughs> mm. Definitely well, are. The, so The Wicked Sister explores both the wilderness of the, of the mind and the wilderness of the uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, we call it the UPA. Yes, and uh, well, yeah, which one was more fun to explore as a writer? Because they both come from very different places. You know, it's funny because I was thinking about this, and there really are a lot of similarities between the two books. Because in both books, the main character is a young woman who has to um, deal with the after effects of a, I call it a less than perfect childhood, you know, in order to get past that and make something out of themselves. In The Marsh King's Daughter, um, the title character is the daughter of a, a kidnapped victim and the man who took her who grows up in complete isolation for her first 12 years in a cabin in the marsh in Michigan's Upper Peninsula Wilderness. And so in The Wicked Sister, um, Rachel too has like this terrible tragedy in her past where um, the book opens with her in a mental hospital where she's been for 15 years because she believes that she's responsible for the terrible shooting accident that took both her parents' lives when she was 11. So, you know, like I say, in both of those, I, I think of the books as being in in some ways very similar you know mm -hmm. not that i'm telling the yeah. same story but sure. authors return to similar themes right hmm. absolutely well a lot of people some people may not know this but you were way ahead of your time you co-founded backspace which was an online writers community of writers helping writers and providing resources how did that community that you helped create get you to publication or help with your path to publication Massively, just massively. When I started writing seriously, I was living in a small town in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and I did not know any writers in person. This was actually in 2004. So, you know, a long time ago, I connected with writers online in, a, in another discussion forum, but that one was kind of like the Wild West. There were people who were serious about writing, but people who were not and just even troublemakers. So I, I asked an author that I had met you know, on that forum, if we could make our own private space, hence we called it backspace. And that just took off. But I think of it as I was collecting around myself, the people who could help me get published. <laughs> and I did, you know, I owe so much to backspace to the other writers. And, um, you know, it's just was a fantastic experience. I will say it almost derailed me from writing my own work because during the years that I was running Backspace and we had um, we ran conferences in New York, uh, 14 events at the at the end, we were asked by the owner of a private island in the Bahamas if we would please organize and run a week long retreat for writers. And we're like, <laughs> let me think about that. OK, <laughs> so and, and I was also on the board of directors of the International Thriller Writers. So I had gotten so involved in the fringes of writing. I wasn't writing. But then in the lead up to my 2013 Backspace conference in New York, I happened to notice that an author who had gotten her literary agent at my previous conference was coming out with her subsequent book. And I hadn't written anything and it just hit me. And I thought, you know, I haven't reached my publishing goals. So I dialed back those, those extracurricular writing activities. It wasn't too much after that, that I got the idea for the Marsh King's daughter. So, you know, here we are. And, but, but yes, backspace was just the foundation for me. Uh, it just, to me, it showed how much writers need other writers. And with, with that. all that, with all that communication with all these other writers, can you put your finger on maybe one piece of advice or, or one conversation that really kind of hit you and, and was the most important piece to, for before you began publishing? Yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, moments, but one that really stands out for me was at my very first Backspace conference and David Morell and I were having a conversation. I wasn't yet published, but mm -hmm. I had an idea. And I, of course I was bending his ear about what my book was going to be. And he said to me, make it real. And that just has always stuck with me because at first I had to even ponder over what did he mean by that? But, you know, he taught, you can probably surmise everybody's going to take a little something else away from that. But I realized, you know, that fiction 
it's it's these are real characters even though we're making them up and you know i have to say i'm kind of pleased because especially with the marsh king's daughter it's told in first person present tense a lot of reviews have written that they had to go back and see if it was true crime or if it was fiction so you know i that <laughs> that made me very happy to see that result so yeah, david sure. morell make it real <laughs> Well, there is a there is a David Morrell through line to this show because David gave me great advice when I was 25 that changed my approach to writing. And I know Kim earlier when he was on here to credit him to her. So the, yep. the man is still reverberating through through the whole industry, but absolutely. always a teacher. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Well, Karen, it's been a pleasure having you on. I really appreciate you coming, talking to us. And uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, we should have another guest that you might even know coming on. <laughs> yes, I also, do. Also, I mean, Sean and Mike have been on for, for a while now. Uh, <laughs> totally really, you guys ready for a break? I mean, we're getting a little tired. I mean, we it's only been like an hour. I, I think the, last, man. the it's, last five, 10 minutes trying to get a screenshot of every week for us. Sean Cameron head and eating Halloween candy to bring down <laughs> the, the, the home stretch here. Um, so uh, you guys want to go, you know, catch your breath and, and come back to the post game show. Thanks, guys. Uh, great job. Karen, okay. by the way, hi. Uh, I'm Ryan Steck of The Real Book hi, Spy. Ryan. Love your work. And Hank, so great to have you here. Hey, all. Nice to see you, Ryan and Karen. Hey, nice to see you. We have to stop meeting like this. I know. It was so fun. Before I disappear, I just want to tell everybody, it's like Hank and I are joined at the hip this fall. I'm not quite sure how this happened because our books published on the same day, August 4. Um, we both got starred reviews in Publishers Weekly. We're both teaching at Masterclass this winter as part of Winter Thrills, and we recently joined together to start an online author series called The Back Room. So, you know, here we are. Hi, Hank. <laughs> but bye, Hank. I'm going to let you have your moment <laughs> without me around. <laughs> it sounds like you guys should keep meeting like this, by the way. It sounds I like know, you're doing success here. Funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So have a great evening, everybody. And we'll talk to you all later. Yes, Karen, thank you for coming by. Hank, so so good to connect with you and, and talk with you. Big fan of your work. Um, thank you for coming on tonight. How are you well, doing? Hey, Ryan, let me just say, I've been watching and watching and you all are incredible. Not only brilliant conversationalists, but you're, I mean, seriously, I'm a reporter and you guys are so prepared. You know what you're doing. You've got this underway. And backstage, Jeff Ayers is just, I can't, like he's got spinning plates on sticks back there. I think, I think Jeff's is, to be really honest with you, Jeff's probably the only one who knows what he's doing. The rest <laughs> of us are sort of, we're trying to make people think we do. Um, Good job. I, I was tired. I know that Mike and Sean, they were running on fumes. They had to be. Uh, I was tired. Kim and I got off a lengthy stretch and uh, Linwood Barkley was in here eating a candy bar. So I was, I was dying for Snickers and I went and raided my kids Halloween stash. And, and here we are. So thrilled to have you on. Let me, let me jump into this with you if you don't mind. Let me start. Uh, you mentioned you're a reporter. 14 Edward R. Moreau Awards, 37 Emmys for investigative journalism. You've accomplished a lifetime's worth. Um, how does all that affect you and help you as a novelist? Oh gosh, it's, I'm so lucky because really being a reporter has been the perfect experience. Couldn't be a more perfect experience because every day as a reporter, what am I doing? I'm telling a story with a beginning, middle and an end, with a character that you care about, with a problem that needs to be solved. Um, and in the end, you want the good guys to win and the bad guys to get what's coming to them. Um, and you want some justice and you wanna change the world a little bit. And you want, and besides that storytelling element, um, you know, I don't want you to change the channel when my stories are on TV, right? And I don't want you to be able to put the book down. I want you to miss your stop on the subway, right? Because remember subways? Because you're reading the book. So that we have to be entertaining, we have to be enlightening, we have to be unique, we have to be compelling and fascinating and all of that which is exactly the same as good investigative reporting is exactly what a good thriller is. So I, I didn't start writing till I was 55, you know, 15 years ago. So the idea that I'd had all those millions of words of practice was completely invaluable. So lucky to have that experience. Well, first of all, I'm gonna ask to see some ID. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, I, I, I like your books are so incredibly captivating and I feel like your voice is very unique. And 
I came from a background of medical writing. So I had to really ditch that kind of, you know, the nonfiction telling journalistic style voice. Did you struggle with that as well? Or did you just have another voice inside of you? Because for me, it's really taken time just to be able to, you know, take away that and just dramatize. I mean, it, that is an interesting thing to untangle, to sort of decide and figure out how your brain works and how your mind works. And I can tell you that um, I had the storytelling after 43 years as a reporter, which is kind of crazy. And I'm still on the air in Boston. But what I worried about was, would I be able, and don't laugh, okay? I know this is a softball, but I wondered if I'd be able to make stuff up. Because all those years as a reporter, I only say what I see, the, the facts are researched, the dialogue is an interview, the setting is what's real. And as I sat here, right here at this desk in Boston, looking out the window, a window at the sugar maple tree, I thought, wow, I, I have to make up whole new worlds. Can I, will my imagination do that? But you know, I've wired myself with hidden cameras and confronted corrupt politicians and chased down criminals and gone undercover and in disguise. So I just sort of channel um, what it would, what it felt like to do that. And sort of as, as Karen was talking about what David Morrell said, just make it be real. So when people say to me, oh, I, I read your book and I could just see that, I could just feel that happening that's sort of the highest uh, accolade, isn't it? That you've created this cinematic new thing for people. So um, I sort of trust the storytelling process. Um, and you clearly got this, Kim. I think you have this down pat now. Your, your stories are just riveting page turners. So it seems like you managed to figure that out. Uh, that's true, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm so honored sitting with two of my favorite female authors right now which is great, Kim, you know, I love your stuff too. Hank, I mean, is it easier or harder to make stuff up when truth is crazier than fiction right now? Is that, is that complicated or make it easier for you? You know, um, it's, that's fascinating because I know, I don't wanna sound highfalutin about it, but truth is a thing that I really write about, truth and justice. I mean, we write page turners, we want, you know, we want, we don't want you to put the book down as I said, but a good book means there's something more to it than just this fast paced plot. And in every book I write, I want you to think about how we know what's true. What is justice? Is justice just the lawyer that tells the better story in the murder trial? Um, how would you write a true, my book Trust Me is about this. How do you write a book about true crime if you don't know what's true? Is there a true truth? And how do we find that? And if you're on a jury, you know, with that huge responsibility, someone's life at stake, this is the murder list. Um, how do you decide someone's fate? I mean, it sounds so highfalutin, as I said, but that's what we do as novelists. You know, we tell a story and then we allow the reader, our readers are smart, we allow the reader um, something to think about. We give them something to think about so they view their real lives in a different way. I absolutely love that. Um, when it comes to aspiring authors, because I think there's a lot of people out there watching this tonight who really dream of being a writer. Now, I love your tenacity and, and personality. <laughs> And, and I, I couldn't see anything stopping you. How, what advice do you give people about rejection? Because rejection is definitely part of this business and you have to be, you know, like resilience is, is a key, key attribute. You know, resilience, rejection is very difficult because you know, when you send your manuscript to someone to look at and you say, tell me what you think about this. You, you don't really want to hear that. You really want to hear, oh, this is the best thing I've ever read in my entire life. And anything that's less than this is the best thing I've ever read in my entire life is a disappointment, right? Because our goal, you know, our whole soul as an author is to entertain people, is to make someone say, what a good story you know, just the same as being a reporter, what a good story. And that's what we want. So I think there's a balance of rejection. There's the being open to someone whose opinion you respect, who's someone who says, 
yeah, you know, I, I, that doesn't quite work is, is, you know, you think, well, why, you know, tell me more and really have your mind open. Um, new writers, if you don't put up those defenses and just open your mind to the possibility. And I'll tell you one of the secrets that I learned and which has changed my life is I could be wrong, imagine, and someone else might have a good idea. Well, if that good idea helps me, why not just embrace that? So it's a process, the writing of a book. Um, Sue Grafton used to say, get over it. You know, you're just writing a book. It's not nuclear war. You know, it's just a story. It's not a test. You can change it. And your book becomes what it is in the revision. So every bit of rejection, every bit of criticism, every bit of someone saying no, should make you think, how can I make this better? And sort of watch me do that. And that's fun, that's the joy. Well, Hank, I'm being told right now, our next guest is coming in, you might know her, the iconic J.A. Jantz is joining Judy, us. how are you, sweetheart? Nice to see you. Long time since Connecticut. I know that's so I was trying to figure out when that was and that was a long time ago. Where are you now? Well, I'm in Bellevue, Washington, where it's raining like crazy today. I was trying to figure out if that was a window or a painting behind you. Uh, that's <laughs> a painting behind me. It's Tuscany done by our friend oh. M.L. Coleman from Sedona, Arizona. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, I, I have a painting behind me, kind of, that was done by <laughs> our friend Kim Howe. <laughs> so, <laughs> she, she did the backgrounds for us for tonight. Um, Judy, thank you so much for joining us. So, so thrilled to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Not bad for a girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have produced an amazing body of work in your career in all facets of the industry. Can you tell us what the most positive development you have seen in the publishing in industry has been over the last few years? Well, when I, when I started writing original paperback mysteries in the early 80s, I was told that they had a, I, let me shut this off. Somebody is sending me a text message is it interesting? Is it your agent? Is it a book deal? Is it a movie deal? No, it's we my love daughter. breaking news at the end. <laughs> Just a minute. Let me shut this off. Uh, I was told in the beginning that original paperback mysteries had a 90 day shelf life. Oh. Well, my first mystery, Until Proven Guilty, is still in print today, and that's that's a lot of 90 days, but I, I think the electronic publishing has made it possible for those backlist titles not to disappear. And during the pandemic, I've heard from people who started reading one book in one series and have now read all of them. And of course, the ancient sacred charge of the storyteller is to beguile the time. And we're all, we're all storytellers and this is time in need of beguiling. And so I, I'm glad electronic books are available. I, I'm glad audio books are available. I hear from people who have vision problems and the audio option is what makes our books still accessible. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that the world has changed and a lot of people are getting satisfaction out of audiobooks because you can do so much else when you're doing it, whether you're walking, working out, um, doing housework, crazy things like that. So it's, it's really nice to be able to introduce books. Now, Hank, um, we want to thank you so much for coming on tonight. Um, we'd love to have you back um, for an in-depth show. So much. And, um, and anyway, just let me know when and where. Love to do we, that. We absolutely will. We'd love to do that, Hank. Kim's mic cut out just for a second. Oh. I'm sure she'll be right back. Th uh, Hank, thanks again. 
talk with you My very pleasure. soon. Love you all. You, this is amazing. This is stellar. This is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. It's well, thank you so much for being a part of it. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Hopefully I'm back and let me know if I'm not. Um, I hear you. We don't see you yet. Uh, oh, I see you now. I apologize. For some reason, the, the internet is cutting out here and there. Um, so you have a wonderful relationship with your fans. Do you have a favorite fan story that you can share with us? Something fun? The emails that touch me the most are from people who've started reading my books while they've been caring for a spouse who was in the process of, of losing a battle. The, the one I'm thinking of right now is a woman whose husband was a Vietnam vet. He had Agent Orange brain cancer. And so he had to be, he had sort of Alzheimer's uh, problems and, and had to be watched every night. And so she picked up a free copy of one of my Beaumont books in a hospital waiting room and started reading to me, reading them. And then she started talking to me by sending me emails and I responded and we become good friends. But my, my job when I receive an email is to respond to it. I, nobody else reads my emails. Nobody else answers them. My readers are my bread and butter business and, and they deserve an answer. Now, occasionally um, I get a cranky one. Uh, my blog that will post on Friday is based on an email I received years ago from a woman who said, I don't know why you put all that scholarship stuff in the Allie Reynolds books. It has nothing to do with the plot. And so my blog this week explains that the scholarship situation is in the alley books because the scholarship situation was an important part of my life. And so those, those emails come and go, but, but they have developed into some very real friendships. That's a beautiful, well, I mean, beautiful, beautiful story there. I think there's so many readers, fans of yours are going to love to know that when they have reached out or if they want to reach out, that it's really you responding to them. I think that that is so cool, especially, you know, an author of, of your stature, quite frankly, that you're interacting with fans and all that. that that's so cool. Um, I wanted to ask you, how has your writing, well, what is your writing process like and how has it changed over the years? Well, my writing process is that I hate outlining. <laughs> I did it outlining in sixth grade geography and nothing that has happened to me in the intervening decades has changed my mind about outlining. So since I write murder mysteries, I usually start with somebody dead and then I spend the rest of the book trying to figure out who did it and how come. So that's how I write. I count the words every day. I know that a book is supposed to be at least 95,000 words. It can be up to 105. But below that, the book is double spaced. Above that, they have to um, make the print very small. And that 100,000 word secret is due to the fact that 100,000 word books fit into standard shipping boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody asked me, well, doesn't it upset you that you have to write based on the size of the shipping box. I said, look, Michelangelo didn't complain about having to paint inside the lines of the, 15, the Sistine Chapel. Why should it bother me to write inside a box? <laughs> but I, I usually start at the beginning and I write to the end. Uh, sometimes I'm surprised. I, I often have no idea who the killer is at the beginning of the book. And I find that out 
in the course of writing. It has been, writing in the face of the pandemic has been challenging. I was finishing the next Joanna Brady book in February, just when the pandemic thing was coming on. And it has taken me a number of months to write the next Elia Reynolds book. But, but both of those books are, are written now. And I did something that is almost publishing history. I have two separate publishers. Harper Collins does the Beaumonts, the Bradys and the Walkers. And Simon and Schuster does the Ally Reynolds books. But as I started writing this Ally Reynolds book, I could see that it had cold case implications. And so I got permission from my HarperCollins editor for J.P. Beaumont to make a cameo appearance in the next Alley book. And that was, that was a fun thing to do. And the, the interesting thing about Bo is his books are all written in the first person and I, the Alley books are all always written in the third person. And I assumed that when Bo showed up in an Alley book, he would be in the third person like everybody else. But you know what? I started trying to write that Beaumont passage and he was there talking to me the way he's been talking to me since 1983. And so his part of the alley book is written in the first person. That's brilliant. I mean, seriously, and it is really rare to have two publishers and to be able to get them to organize and include someone. Um, yeah. To play nice with one another. Exactly. I mean, Jenny, hi. Hi, how are you? Long time. I am just fine. I was trying to remember the last time we were together and it was in, remember Phoenix, like a yes. hundred years ago? And we were in that great big tent. A hundred years ago, but who's counting? <laughs> well, my default is usually five years, but we were in that great big tent, remember? Yes. And the people were just insane, about 500 people, and it was such fun. It was fun. And yeah. it's good to see you again, Catherine. Good to see you. All is good? All is good. We're, we have been um, in our home in Seattle pretty much nonstop since February. And yeah. we're, we're all right so far. But my, yeah. my husband has some underlying health issues, so traveling is not an option right now. No, I agree with you totally. Are you getting enough exercise? Uh, let me Your trainer is asking. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. You see my walking? Oh, baby. I walk five miles a day. Wow. And do you see this big red spot? The red spot in the middle of my greens? Yes. That's when the from the California forest fires came to Washington and the air quality was too too bad to walk. But I generally walk five miles a day, which That's is excellent. Not, not That's bad amazing. My and, and during COVID, by the way, during shutdown, I think I walk negative five miles a day right now during COVID. <laughs> I don't go anywhere or do anything. That's Ryan, incredible. that's not good. That's no, well, not good. No, we're gonna chew on you for that. In the house when it's raining or out on the pool deck when it's not raining. Mm -hmm. Well, Judy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Deeply appreciate it. I hope your husband health improves and, and we'd love to have you back on for a longer session on the show. Well, I'm, I'm yours whenever you would like. Thank you. Bye-bye. So Bye. And then Catherine, I'm so tempted to ask you what shoes you're wearing tonight. Remember our talk about shoes? I know, honey, but I'm at home, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm wearing sneakers. Good, good girl. And and jogger pants. But from the from the this stop, I looked really, really hot. Okay. No doubt about it. How have you been? I've missed you. I have missed you too. You look gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. How's the writing going? Excellent. You know, really busy and, and just actually just finished a, a new book, but we're here to talk about you tonight. So why don't you tell us what you're working on? Well, I'm finishing up. And this is incredible. The 25th FBI thriller. The 25th? Wow. Ah! wow. And it's called Vortex. 
and it will be out August the 15th of next year. And I'm just now finishing it up now. So keep the toes crossed because tying up loose ends, you know, when you have the two plots like I normally have, getting all the pesky loose ends, they go everywhere. They, they like hide in closets and you have to keep rounding them up. So uh, just keep your toes crossed that I can find them and, and get them all taken care of. But the book is, the book is interesting. It's very interesting. So thank you for asking. Deadlock has been doing very well. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We appreciate that. I like where you're sitting, uh, Ryan. This is very pretty. Thank you, Kim. Kim made it. But it doesn't it seem to move at all. I mean, um, it, it, no. I, it was, so, the, so the key is one of our co-hosts, Sean Cameron, can fade into his somehow. I, I can't do that. Um, but uh, <laughs> but if you the trick is don't move a lot. Um, I didn't I didn't do anything. Kim Kim had these made. And she sent it to me, and then she had to literally walk me through how to put it on for my background. So um, I, really, I can't I, take any credit. It's beautiful. But yeah, Kim, Kim is, that, I mean, look up. at that blonde hair. Oh, my heavens, does she look hot or what? I'm suddenly you feeling under threat sharing the, the stage with the both of you, I have to say. Um, I don't even have shoes. I don't even have, I kicked my socks. I started with shoes, and I thought, no, forget this. Uh, we're here for seven <laughs> hours. I, I've, I've bailed on my socks and everything. We're just as long to as you hang have on to the end, Ryan. That's okay. Uh, I do, but I'm going to say right now the top half is dressed a little nicer than the bottom half. And I'm Same trying to here. Think, when is the last? I can't remember. This is like seven hours, seven eight hours in a dress shirt. I can't, I can't remember the last time I had to wear a dress shirt for this long. Like funerals aren't this long, weddings aren't this long. Mm -hmm. um, I can't even remember. But here we are. We are so thrilled to have you as our last official guest. Um, You've already, you know, kind of teased the next book. I want to ask you, God, you do everything you write is so amazing. Um, what I love about your books, especially, is you have like the best dialogue. What is your secret for writing dialogue? Dialogue. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, and I other I, I'm sure a lot of authors will say this, but sometimes when the characters start talking. I, can, I type 95 words a minute. I cannot keep up with them. They're talking so fast and I can't keep up with them. But it's just, I'm dialogue driven. You know, other people are plot driven uh, or, or the ambiance driven, but I, I've just always been dialogue driven, you know, because people won't shut up. I mean, they get in there and they just. Ah. Well, I but think. I, I, I like that. Everybody... Oh, here's Miss Beauty again. I think everybody, uh, you know, watching can see your whip smart dialogue in action right now. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> you guys are easy and you're tired. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only one of those things is mostly true. <laughs> I'm ready for another eight hours. Let's do it. <laughs> um, but, but Catherine, you know, what, what has life been like uh, for you during COVID? Have things changed a lot? A lot of authors are spending the same amount of time writing. Are you, it, has your schedule changed? No, no, that, that I probably, I think as writers, our well, lives have changed the least because my office is in my house. So it's the very same schedule all the way through. What we have added uh, is hikes every single day. Uh, and I know, you know, I live in Marin right across from the Golden Gate from San Francisco and the hikes, there are many, many hikes and they're, they're just gorgeous. If, and I put up a different photo every day on Instagram and Facebook, just if people want just an instant or a moment of distraction. So if you wanna see some, just go to Instagram and take a look and you can see the beautiful views in San Francisco. So the only thing we've had again is, is the hikes and I haven't worn high heels since last February. I haven't worn a dress since last February. I have all these beautiful clothes and they're just kind of, eh, so what, mom? You know, it's uh, the cat's lives hasn't changed that much. Yeah, the cats still do the same things. They, you know, they, they, they hurl on your bed. It's, it's fine. <laughs> all is good. I actually saw a wonderful, I, I follow you on Facebook and um, I really enjoyed the pictures that you mentioned. Um, also, I had a really good time watching you and Brenda Novak having a great time together. That made me really happy. Well, I'm glad you saw it. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. I'm very fond of her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried to hire her daughter away from her, but that didn't work. <laughs> Pretty special, Alexa. She's amazing. Yes, she is. 
and she works like a dog. And I kept telling her, I'll pay you more than your mother does. Okay. Come to mama. <laughs> but no, no. Maybe offer some shoes might, might, might be a deal breaker. <laughs> Anyways, Catherine, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. We would love to have you back on for an in-depth interview soon. And anything we can do to help, we're always there. And it's, it's such a joy to see your smile. Yes. Well, it's, it's great to see you, baby. It's been, what, two years, three years? Way too long. I mean, it's... Way, uh, way too, yeah. We're going yeah, to have to... Well, J.A. Jance, I had seen her. You know, my default now that I'm old is usually five years, you know, or, or 15 but it was probably about eight years ago we were in Phoenix and that was, that was so much fun. Yeah, it certainly was right. Like, yeah. It's and, and keep me posted on your work and when I, your book's coming out. I deeply appreciate that. A very and kind when of, are you, who are you with now? Um, we're actually taking it out on submission. This one It's called the perfect hostage. So I'll keep you posted on that. note. Okay. And who is your, who's your agent? Victoria Sanders. Um, I connected with her because I was very fortunate. I studied with Karen Slaughter um, mm -hmm. at, in Hawaii and Karen was kind enough to say, I think my agent might like your work. And, and, and I did sign with her. Well, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Do you know that I've been with Robert now since 1981? Wow. wow. I've been through all of his divorces and marriages. I give the best presents for marriage. I'm, I, I'm great. Yeah, anyway. Well, you've sold but, how many millions of books? I think it worked out by the way, you made the right decision. Um, I did. It as I it did. Is. Yeah. Yeah. So he's doing all right, but there's a there's huge flight from New York. And of course the agency is closed and everybody's working from home, but uh, they did a great job on deadlock. But I fear that what happened, uh, did you guys hear about this? The, 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 the lesser, I hate to say lesser authors, but the B-list authors in terms of sales and so forth, the houses, didn't have time or didn't have the means to, to get them out like they should. And they just threw 600 books on the market in like early September. Did you hear about that? Yes. Um, I covered it. I covered it a lot on the book spy. Oh, that, uh, but uh, that's very tough, you know, very, mm -hmm. very tough. If you're one of those people. So true. Wow. So true. Where do you live, Ryan? I am in Michigan and it just started to get cold. So whereabouts in Michigan? Uh, Kalamazoo area, Southwest Michigan. Gotcha. Okay. And how, where are you, Kim? Toronto. Can't you tell by my accent? No, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> All right, Dons, I will let you go. It's great yeah. to see you, Kim. And uh, just keep in touch and Ryan, take care. Thank you so and, much uh, for coming the, on, Catherine. The, uh, the vaccine should be along any, any time now. I'll get it before you guys because you're too young and healthy. <laughs> we want you safe, Catherine. We love your books. You take okay, care. Okay, baby. Bye-bye. Bye. That was super fun. So now we're going to bring everybody on for the Let's get everybody back in here. In fact, I want to intro someone. Very important. People I haven't seen yet tonight. Let me do the recap. 50 authors, some minor tech glitches, one light bulb change, lots of laughs, some breaking news from Steve Barry and Grant Blackwood and Meg Gardner. Some yeah. almost big broken news from Alex Agora and Al Fairberg. One author mix up. And Jeff, because of you, it all went as smoothly and we are at the finish line. Jeff Ayers, everybody. He's our hey, producer hey. for tonight. And this was amazing. Yeah. I, it was a lot Jeff, of fun. Jeff, you are the, uh, for everybody that, first of all, I want to say that I'm exhausted. Uh, that was rough on me. Uh, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it was real hard. By the way, Jeff, you're I'm watching. You How rough now. is that? <laughs> How rough is watching? Come on. I am. I am in awe of you, the five. It was one, two, three, four. The five of you uh, for the uh, job that you did. You looked as fresh at the beginning as you did at the end. You couldn't tell that you were on for six plus hours. But Jeff, but I, I just want the audience to know behind the scenes, you in the cockpit. Bring, bringing in and out authors uh, one at a time and directing traffic and authors are late, authors are early, dealing with any tech issues. You're amazing. And you did it all without going to the bathroom. Well, that we know of. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, we're not we're not done yet, David. We're not done. We're we're not done, done yet. Yet. Let, let, let me bring in a post game guest, yep. Jeff. You're Here she put comes. In one more. Yep. Right, uh, comes this our, is Heather Graham. So Heather uh, Graham is our post. If as if we didn't have enough authors, we have an author on the post game show. Heather Graham is connecting to audio, and she is live on the post game show. Hey, Heather. Uh, a thousand authors. Heather, you're number a thousand. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Hi. Hey, how are you? Great. It's so fantastic. We started the show with John Sanford and we couldn't think of a better book in, than Heather Graham. And we're so lucky to have you tonight. Thank you. Oh, oh gosh. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's I love your background, by the way. Very pretty. <laughs> it's really funny. The guys are like, oh, really? Hmm. And, hmm. and I guess Sean designed it, actually. <laughs> I'm just going to take credit for it. The whole thing was my idea. This event was my idea. I painted that background myself. Uh, no, no, no. Kim, Kim did it all. This was David Brown's idea. This has been a marathon of an event. And now we're we're closing with one of the, the biggest uh, authors in the industry. Oh, right yes, sweetheart. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So I was going to say, what, uh, my background is not very impressive. <laughs> it's a white wall, but... Okay. Neither so, is mine. It's just hidden by a digital uh, cloud. I was that gonna I say, neither, neither is mine. I, I have to get Jeff to teach me how to give me a digital wall <laughs> so that it's not quite so plain. You can send so, me one another, no problem. And happy I would to do it. What is the actual book count you're at right now? And what is the secret to you being so incredibly prolific? It's amazing. Five children. <laughs> they were, yeah no actually it's funny at first of course um you know I was was staying home with them and now they grew up and they've been really great because now that they've grown up they have friends who are U.S. Marshals and detectives and and uh and my all-time favorite one of their friends is a fabricator and she took us through the legacy studios one day Got to see the Geico pig standing next to an incredibly creepy zombie and nice. all the kinds of things. So, you know, they've just, they've given me so much. And um, I also think I'm incredibly lucky to do something I love so much for a living. So, yes, yeah, so and, and I'm not really good at too much else. <laughs> so I'm very, <laughs> very grateful. <laughs> um, I have no idea what the count is. I, I really don't because I, I do stories. I do novellas. I do books. I'm, I'm not sure. It's gonna be a thousand. It's like a night of a thousand authors, the night of a thousand stories from Heather Graham. It's got to be up there. <laughs> There's, yeah, no, I'm my, like I said, I'm very grateful. It's been a lot of years. Hopefully, it will be a lot more years. So, uh, yeah, I, I've had more time than some people. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, this is an impossible question to answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, with all those books, is there one? Is there one or that just you just has such a hold on you and you would maybe not call it your favorite, but one that maybe just is a, you consider more strongly than the others. Well, you know what the publishers tell us to say? The last Our one. next book on the market is always our favorite <laughs> book. <laughs> uh, no, I've liked them. Um, I don't think I have a favorite book. Uh, certain things, you know, uh, oddly enough, this was years and years ago. Um, my mother was born in Ireland and I happened to go, you know, go back to Ireland with her several times. And there was one time when I was there when the IR, uh, IRA had been quite busy and I was, was not comfortable with it. And I was afraid I, as years went by that I hurt my mother's feelings <laughs> by kind of being uncomfortable about the entire thing. And of course now I adore Ireland. It's one of my favorite places in the world, but I was always very happy. And of course, uh, Night of the Blackbird was the name of the book. And uh, she got to read it right before she died, and it kind of gave homage to, you know, that heritage. So that meant a lot to me. And I mean, they've meant, you know, different books I mean uh, different things depending on um, places. I absolutely love places. I love interesting people that you get to meet. Love New Orleans. That's kind of obvious. I, I do a lot in New Orleans. I love Key West, love St. Augustine, Salem, Massachusetts, um, all kinds of places in the country. And I think books give way to that. And then of course, one that was really, really fun is, is when I used my experience getting to see zombies and Geico pigs in you know, one room at the same time. So um, the people we meet, you know, give us so very much. 
So you kind of dodged the question about your favorite book. So what about your favorite yes, child of, of the five? <laughs> <laughs> well, when they were little, I probably could have told you which the favorite child was at the moment. <laughs> but, <laughs> but now they're all my favorite child. Oh, well, you know, and now they have, um, uh, I'm trying to count, three out of the five have children. And so, of course, their children are now their favorites. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, hopefully, they can make friends. They, hopefully they can make friends, too, that become contacts for you. For there you me. go. There you go. So, yep. Yep. It all, it's, uh, it's a little confusing at the beginning, but it all pays off in the end. <laughs> so. so, Heather, before we close the show, tell us what you're working on now. And we'd love to look forward to. Oh, right now, I'm actually working on two things a couple years ago. I did a young adult sci-fi with John Lannan, and I am working on going through the second in that series, which is called Blood Moon. And then I'm working on, it's a new uh, hardcover. I've just turned it on my crew for crew of Hunter series for 2021. And I am working on a sequel to a new hardcover series that will begin. The first one will come out in March and it's called Danger in Numbers. And it follows, four book series, follows the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh, fantastic. Wow. wow. That sounds fantastic. Well, I hope. <laughs> 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 Always hope. Start out with a lot of hope and excitement and, you know, hope it, hope it goes through. Yep. Well, Heather, I want to thank you for being our post-game show guest. Uh, <laughs> An amazing uh, evening. I don't know whether you caught any of that, but you were part of something that was kind of special. Uh, this was, I don't know if anyone uh, has ever brought together a bigger group of best-selling authors before on one program. No. It's great. It's been great. You guys have done a wonderful job and I'm very happy to be the wrapper up type post game person. <laughs> you are the wrapper up. You know, uh, before, during the pregame show, I said, we're either going to wrap it up or clean it up, depending on how it went. <laughs> and we're totally, we are totally wrapping it up because this was fantastic. There is nothing, nothing to clean up at all. This was uh, smoother than I could have ever uh, uh, imagined, especially, especially we did. Uh, and we're going to uh, give ourselves a, a pat on the back a little bit and a, uh, uh, victory lap because I just want to say that we had several uh, rehearsals and run throughs uh, and the first time that it ever worked was today. <laughs> yeah, hey. yeah. That's, so that's true. true. The, best part, by the, way, the best part is anyone who only watches the beginning and the very end, they're going to think David was here for the whole time. Uh, he's, in the, he's in the first five minutes and the last five minutes. So they're going to just, just fast forward like you've been here the whole night, David. I know. I'm only gonna. I'm only gonna share uh, the beginning and the end with my mom. She'll think I'm a big star. Yeah, <laughs> of the evening. <laughs> well, I want to. Hey, quickly go mom matters. Oh, <laughs> of course, mom and mom. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Heather. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go around thank the room really quickly. I know people have people to thank. Uh, I also want to hear people's impressions, and we'll do it quickly because you guys are seem kind of tired. Although I'm, I'm guessing you're tired. Uh, you don't seem tired, but I'm guessing you're tired. I'm going to start with the crew reviews, guys. Mike, uh, one, how do you feel? And what do you think about what you just went through? Well, this was tremendous. And I think we launched a program here that uh, really uh, brought a lot of new names, uh, new authors to, to readers who might have one or two or three or four favorites. Now they're going to have 50 favorites. I mean, it's impossible to not be affected by some of the fantastic authors that we had today. And I'm, I'm hoping that... Uh, that the readership for our authors is going to grow quite a bit. You're absolutely right. I've seen, I've seen several tweets saying that. And uh, my aunt, uh, if she's still watching, she was watching the entire program. She said that she found so many new authors to read from watching right. this. Listen, David's aunt, tell his mom that he was only here for about 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, <she> <laughs> Don't, tell Don't tell her. Don't tell her. Uh, Sean, uh, the other uh, uh, crew reviews podcast host that uh, stepped in here, uh, and, and, and participated throughout the entire day. Uh, your thoughts? My thoughts, first of all, are I'm glad I can finally have this drink, which is disappearing into the mode. Your invisible um, drink. I bet you've been dying for that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I feel like I've been on the red carpet for like the Grammys or the Oscars of, of literature tonight um, or of thrillers and crime fiction. But what, what came home to me again tonight, and it, the first time I really understood this was at Thriller Fest, Kim, 
was that not only is this one of the most talented group of people that you can be around, it's one of the best group of people you can be around. I mean, just wonderful human beings. And some I knew, some I didn't, some I can't wait to know more of. Um, and that, again, this is just an extraordinary community and I'm just happy to be a part of it. But you, you guys were terrific, uh, terrific throughout the show. And the way you, uh, the way the four of you juggled in and out and sometimes it was two of you on the screen, one of you, three of you. I don't know how you did it. And I know Jeff was a big part of that, but so bravo, bravo. Uh, KJ Howe, Kimberly Howe, uh, what, what, how do you feel? Are you exhausted? Are you hungry? When did you eat? <laughs> well, I, first of all, I feel great. Um, very grateful because I feel like everyone came together in the community tonight. You know, we usually hold Thriller Fest every July. And of course this year, you know, we couldn't because of COVID. So I felt like having people overlap and we, you know, we tried to plan it out carefully to surprise people who they might see on the screen, someone they maybe haven't talked to in a long time. And you saw a lot of happy faces. And to me, really about that. It's about a sense of community coming together, supporting each other. And, you know, it, it reminded me of the halls of Thriller Fest. So, you know, um, I did manage to run down in a couple breaks and have, you know, some water and a bagel. And I'm, but I, I definitely would, you know, enjoy a sumptuous dinner. And I'm sure there's one made. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I also want to say that you did have some microphone problems and internet problems. Something is going up in Toronto. Uh, but I did not sense one ounce of panic from you. Calm. Well, you know, I mean, like I study kidnapping for a living. So it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not a hostage. I'm happy. Um, yeah. But I do wonder what's happening because Jennifer Hillier um, was on. She's in Toronto too, and she was really struggling worse than me. Um, and I think maybe there's, you know, something. I don't know. We're, we're invading Canada. I guess you didn't. Solar flares. Yeah. So this is all <laughs> total power. It could be anything. It could be anything. Ooh, could be anything. That's right. Uh, uh, and 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 finally, Ryan Steck, the real book spy. Uh, Ryan, the rapologist. Uh, you also don't seem to really be tiring, though I, I feel like once this is, I, I think tonight you are going to close your eyes and see authors and, and, and hear questions, and you'll be doing these interviews, perhaps with the same authors that you just did all night long. If you saw the amount of empty Snicker and Milky Way wrappers next to me, you'd understand. <laughs> I've got a good sugar buzz going from that. It's all Linwood Barkley's fault. But it's so, it is so defeated the purpose. My wife ran me up a protein shake. My oldest daughter to change a light bulb. You know, we all just battled through it. I want to thank the people who, who um, you don't see on the screen. All the people who watched us, um, who tuned in, who tweeted about it. Uh, my wife, Melissa, she honestly had the hard job tonight. She's downstairs with a dog and... A whole bunch of kids trying to keep everyone quiet. I'm just up here talking to famous authors all night. It's not that hard. Um, so, you know, there's so many people that uh, I'm thankful for. And, and again, it's all team effort from everybody. David, you had the idea. And this was a lot of fun. Uh, it went well enough. I would say we should do it again sometime. Same time next week. <laughs> not next week. I was going to say it. Same time, maybe next year, maybe every other year. But yes. Yeah, that, that was a lot of work and a, a lot of stress. Uh, but I think once we did it, now that we did it, we know how to do it. And I, but I, but I, any stress that we were feeling, uh, Jeff Ayers in the background, the producer, uh, like I said at the beginning of the post I'll hop in again. Yeah, well, we could wrap this up real soon. I, I just want to reiterate how uh, you uh, personified Grace Under Fire mm -hmm. from, the, from trying to figure out how to do this technology in the first place to navigating it so uh, wonderfully for six plus hours. I think uh, well, what people thank you. don't know is David had this idea. It started with a phone call, David, and we talked about it. We looped people in one by one, but we had production meetings that we just were like, hey, let's do this, let's do that. Jeff, figure out how to do that for us. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much how it worked. And he, <laughs> he had to do it. Um, all of us, people act like it was so stressful to, you know, do this. It's not. Jeff, you had the hard job, man. Thank you so much for everything. Yep. Thank you, Jeff. It was my pleasure. Um, do I tell them now, David, it didn't stream and we have to start over? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This is a I'm kidding. I'm totally uh, kidding. <laughs> hey, th thanks to stores and libraries and everybody that took part tonight and, and streamed us. That's, that's absolutely huge. Thank you to all of you people. 
Yep. Yeah, uh, about 25 bookstores and libraries. Uh, Kim read them out earlier. Uh, the rest of you guys read them out throughout the show. Simon and Schuster uh, played it on their Facebook page. Atria Books on on the, our Facebook page. It was on Novel Suspects fa Facebook page. Uh, it, it, we gave access to so many uh, readers uh, and uh, introducing them to new authors or uh, having them uh, revisit uh, some of their favorites. So this was a, a wonder. I'm going to be think. I think I really think we'll be talking about this event, uh, all of us, for years to come. So yeah, uh, I think that's a good way to wrap it up. We could probably go on forever, and we probably yeah. will once the once we stop streaming. We'll probably continue <laughs> to be talking. Uh, so uh, tweet me tomorrow. I'll fill you in what you missed. But guy, oh, speaking of Twitter, uh, Adrian Mystery Bus, follow me. That's why. I do everything just to get followers. That's really all the, the reason. The other, that's the only reason this show started, by the way. And <laughs> David said that our first production meeting was like, oh, I'm just doing this to get Twitter followers. We're like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so we're not getting paid. Authors, uh, we're going to get you a lot of Twitter followers. Uh, this was fun. David, thank you for having all of us. Thank you all. Subscribe, subscribe to Thriller Talk and subscribe to the crew reviews. That's right. Do you, all, this all of us on Twitter. Right. This event was free. So the only uh, price you have to pay is to follow all of us and subscribe to all of us. That's a very small price to pay. All right, everybody, <laughs> have a great night. Thank you all. Uh, it will, this will live on forever on the Thriller Talks Facebook so you can, or on the Thriller Talks uh, YouTube so you can watch it over and over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>